this that we Let's see how far we're ready, we get. Ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the Durham County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an agenda item tonight, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those of you who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. Please speak clearly and into the microphone. Each side, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking in opposition to an item, will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative. So if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Also, and for your information, this is being broadcast on Spectrum AT&T, um, U-verse on Spectrum, okay, I said Spectrum, Frontier, Google Fiber, and it is also streamed on the city's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and additional ones are being added. So needless to say, we are live. Thank you. May we have the roll call, please. Commissioner Williams is excused. Commissioner Morgan. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Bryan. Present. Commissioner Durkin is also excused. Commissioner Al Turk. Here. Uh, Vice Chair Busby. Here. Chair Hyman. Present. Commissioner Miller. Here. Commissioner Ketchen. Here. Commissioner Santiago. Here. Commissioner Baker. Here. Commissioner Lowe. Present. And Commissioner. Commissioner McIver. Here. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. I'd like to move and excuse the absence for Commissioners Darkin and Williams. Second. It has been moved and properly second that Commissioners Durkin and Williams receive an excused absence. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. Opposed. Get a clarification on who seconded the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Now, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Staff has no adjustments to the agenda, um, Madam Chair. Um, we do have, before we, I do have a question about the minutes. So approval of minutes and consistency statements. Are there any issues with the minutes? The chair recognizes Commissioner Bryan. Um, Madam Chair, uh, on the minutes for under adjustments to the agenda, staff wanted to adjust the meeting schedule and we took care of that right when it was presented. I believe it was Commissioner Miller who made the motion. I don't remember who seconded it, but it passed unanimously. Uh, we can make that correction. Thank you for catching And then on page three of the minutes, uh, about a third of the way down the page, when the motion failed, the vote was actually zero to 13. And that's all I have. Thank you. Now, can I get a motion 
for the approval of the minutes and the consistency statement with corrections that have been identified. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Al Turk and second by Commissioner Bryan or Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Commissioner Morgan, that we approve the minutes uh, and consistency statement with corrections all in favor of this motion. Let it be known by raising your right hand. Thank you. Madam Chair, if it's appropriate, I have a comment concerning consistency statements. Yes, the chair recognizes Commissioner Miller. It's actually a question for staff, if I may. Yes. Are we satisfied that we are actually complying with the requirements of North Carolina law and consistency statements? I just reread the two cases uh, that have come out since the 2017 law change, and it really does want us to say, even if it's minimal, why? And just referring back to the staff report, I mean, that was the issue in the second uh, case, uh, and that seems to be kind of what we do. Uh, I think we're running a little thin on consistency statements and that we're exposed because of that. At some point in the, I'd like to fix that if we could um, and get a something that has a one sentence why that doesn't refer back. Uh, and it may mean that, uh, it may mean that we we may wind up debating a little bit about the sentence. Uh, I have no trouble with the staff taking the sense of what has been said here and crafting it. I realize that we each have our different reasons, perhaps for voting one way or another, but the sense of it from the majority, a, a sentence or two on each case, I think would make a, our consistency statement sounder under the expectation of law. And I don't know I don't know if you've had a chance to look at 160D. I'm signed up for the course on that in January, uh, but whether or not they, the General Assembly has, has said even more about consistency statements than they did in 2017, it just worries me a little bit, and so I throw that out there. Um, th thank you for your comments. Uh, staff will certainly revisit that and check with our attorney's office and be sure that we are operating according with state law. Uh, we do, if you've noticed, uh, a lot of the times we will go back and reference um, the reasons why you vote against something, because that seems to get more attention than when you vote for something. So we can revisit. Yeah, nobody's going to sue us over yeah. consistency right. statement if they got so what they wanted. If you've noticed, though, we do go back um, sometimes and put those other reasons in there, like concerns about the environment, traffic, congestion, things like that. So we do add those in addition most of the time. Um, by the time it gets to city council, the consistency statement is beefed up quite a bit for the um, actual action at city council. So we'll, we'll report back to you on that and, and let you right. know. And, and that may, may be all the difference that in the world. Uh, right. I, like I said, I just was in a CLE and it made me go, ugh. It's, no, it's fine. Thank you for your question. We'll let you know what we find out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, while I'm here, can I state for the record that all the um, notice requirements were um, carried out in accordance with state and local law and those affidavits are on file in the planning department. Thank you so much. We have a full agenda tonight and we're ready for our first mm -hmm. public Madam Chair, could I? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Could I move to adopt the agenda as written? Yes. Second. Okay. It has been moved by Commissioner Bryant, uh, Commissioner Busby, and second by Commissioner Bryant that we adopt the agenda as presented. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed? Okay. Thank you. Now we're ready for the first public hearing and the staff report. Uh, guest road, if someone would bring me the list of individuals who wish to speak. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will first be presenting case A18-00012 and Z18-00036 for 3871 Guest Road. The applicant is Tim Sivers with Horvath Associates. This 10.14 acre site is a portion of two parcels totaling 43.09 acres. The site is located at, at 3871 Guest Road. The site is located within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from Planned Density Residential 2.0, PDR 
and res sorry, and residential suburban multifamily with a development plan, RSMD, to industrial light with a development plan, ILD. The applicant also proposes to change the future land use map designation from low density residential and recreation open space to industrial and recreation open space. The applicant proposes increasing the area of recreation open space designation. The proposal commits to self-service storage and permitted accessory uses and a maximum of 150,000 square feet of building area. The 10.14 acre site is shown in red on this aerial map. The site comprised of two parcels is located off of Guest Road and located in the suburban development here. The site is primarily undeveloped with a mixture of pine and hardwood forests. The site contains streams and wetlands as well as a portion of floodway fringe. The site is primarily undeveloped with a mixture of pine and hardwood forests. Sorry, I got confused. Okay, site photos. Um, Let's see, the site is primarily undeveloped with a mixture of pine and hardwood forest. The site contains stream and wetlands as well as a portion of floodway fringe. Uh, area photos here, the site is located in the Eno River Watershed Protection Overlay District B. The site fronts on Guest Road across from Prison Camp Road. The area includes a wide mix of uses including single family residential, office, industrial, multifamily residential and undeveloped land. The zoning context map here shows the site is presently zoned PDR 2.0. Uh, this area was part of a previously approved Crowsdale Farm Development Plan, which sp spans 973 acres in total. The area of the request was previously identified as garden apartments and condominiums on the approved development plan. The applicant seeks to change the zoning to industrial light with a development plan to allow for self-service storage. The property is designated low density residential and recreation open space on the future land use map as shown by this map uh, above. The applicant proposes to change this designation to industrial and expand the area of recreation open space as shown along the stream buffer. Development plan provides site access points, tree coverage areas, the location of building and parking envelopes, riparian buffers and project boundary buffers. The building renderings uh, commit to the specific architectural design Additionally, uh, in lieu of a minor special use permit, the applicant is seeking approval of a fence greater than four feet in height in the street yard of Guest Road. Key commitments include self-service storage and permitted accessory uses, maximum of 150,000 square feet of building area, a maximum height of two stories, individual storage, unit access doors shall not face Guest Road, uh, tree safe areas, uh, maximum illumination, additional street trees, and 30 acres placed into a permanent conservation easement. The proposed ILD zoning designation does not comply with the current low density residential designation on the future land use map. The applicant has requested a change to the future land use map in this area to industrial and recreation open space, which would be consistent with the proposed zoning. The proposal is consistent with comprehensive plan policies, including those shown above. Further details provided in the staff report. Uh, staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a number of people who have signed up to speak both for and against that exceed the 10 minutes um, that we normally allow. So I'm going to ask for a motion to extend the time um, to three minutes each uh, for each side, so if I can get a motion for each speaker, I mean for each speaker, but um, the total number of time for each side. So that would be seven individuals have signed up. So that would be three minutes each, and then seven individuals have signed up again. So an additional three minutes each. So moved. Second. second. Is moved by Commissioner Miller and second by. Low. Commissioner Lowe, that we extend the time by three minutes for each speaker, both sides. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand. All opposed? Okay, we shall proceed. The first individual, I'm gonna call the first three, um, Amy Bartus, Peggy Wright, and Wesley McKinney. Yep, we don't want to let the developer go first. What? Where Before is he? Where is he? So, Amy. 
Chair Meeker. Okay, um, I'm going to at least allow the developer to go first. Uh, so there's Jamie. Uh, Jamie, could you pronounce your last name? It's Schwedler, but anything starting with an S, I'll take. Thank you. If you'll just give me a minute to uh, queue up our presentation. I'll get this one here. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the commission. I'm Jamie Schwedler with Parker Poe at 301 Fayetteville Street uh, here on behalf of the applicant and developer. Uh, this request for zoning and future land use amendment is for a 10 acre portion of a 40 acre parcel that's about a mile south of the Eno River in North Durham. Uh, the site is shown in green with the project area, the 10 acre portion shown in yellow on your screen. Um, Emily did a great job of summarizing the request, and I would just note that the uh, flume amendment is to um, industrial, but with a portion for residential uh, recreation open space, so that the portion that's originally designated on the property uh, can remain. The site was zoned as PDR, residential, in 1987 as part of a large uh, master plan for the area known as Crowsdale Farm. And at that time, residential was thought to be appropriate. But since that time, uh, the NCDOT storage area has been used for industrial use, um, and you can see that this view across um, the site from Guest Road looking south shows the building that residential um, uses would be looking at. This is another site showing the prison camp building, um, another view of the prison camp building, and the SCCU credit union building that would be directly across from our entrance on Guest Road. Uh, we got asked through the process, why self-storage? Well, there's some, some very key issues there. One, it meets the demand of the needs of citizens of Durham. Uh, we looked at a three mile radius, which is typical in terms of demand and what, what people will travel from their home um, in terms of uh, looking for self storage. And what we found was that with this particular site, there's only one self storage within that three mile radius. It's an older version, it's not climate controlled, like the, the version that we would be proposing here. Um, and those other sites are just around the perimeter. So there's no climate controlled self storage within the three mile radius to serve the residents within this area. And what is self storage? Well, ultimately it's a service use. It's a use that people need within proximity of their homes so they can run and grab a family keepsake or a bicycle on the weekends. Um, and they're not going to drive 15, 20 miles to do that. They like service and demand in their area. It's a low impact industrial use, which means it's not crushing, it's not vehicle um, operations. Uh, it's a low impact restricted to self storage use and it also causes low traffic. This type of use only generates about 32 trips per day, which is significantly less than the 250 multifamily apartments that could be built on this site by right and the associated traffic that would come with that <coughs> in the PDR designation. I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about our neighborhood engagement because it's significant in this, in this site. Um, the concerns are listed on the left side of your screen and the adjustments we made after those meetings are listed on the right. We had three neighborhood meetings for this project and one focus group. We changed the plan after each meeting to directly meet a need that was expressed by the citizens and each of those meetings were well attended. They were very well attended by the citizens that are directly adjacent to our property and will be most directly um, impacted. The concern at the neighborhood, second neighborhood meeting uh, is listed on your left, traffic concerns and loss of trees, lack of neighborhood benefit. And we went through the key text commitments. I'll mention them here and then I'll leave the screen open uh, for Mr. David Beischer who will address the remaining comments. Okay, thank you. Or, or he can let you continue because it, you know, if the... I'll let her, I'll yield <laughs> uh, some of my time. <laughs> All three minutes? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the key text commitments are listed there on your screen. They mainly go to the appearance um, of the self storage unit on Guest Road, having the doors facing away from Guest Road, limiting the lights of the property line, committing to an architectural rendering of what the building would look like in direct response to concerns of orange and white, um, and a 30 acre donation of a tree conservation. This is in direct response of concerns we heard about what the future of the 40 acres would be, the loss of trees in this area, and the environmental impact on the Eno River. You can see that area there, and essentially the area in green would be subject to the uh, conservation easement that has been accepted by the Triangle Land Conservancy and will be a committed element. 
as well as these committed elevations. And for these reasons, the Flume Amendment satisfies a 3.4.7 criteria in that it extends uh, the industrial uh, designation adjacent to what is an institutional use, but is essentially used as an industrial use across Prison Camp Road in an area that's no longer uh, 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 ideal for residential use and would be compatible with the existing land uses with those development plan commitments I described earlier. Uh, the staff report adequately shows the shape and size and the lack of um, adverse impacts. And so the rezoning also meets the 3.5.10 requirements. It's consistent with the comprehensive plan if the Flume Amendment is changed. It's compatible with the zoning of the nearby property and its site is limited to uh, limited industrial uses only for self-storage. Um, you can see the comparison of the existing proposed there. And so with these commitments in place, which are significant, which respond to direct comments we got through the four neighborhood engagements that we went through, I don't think you'll see another zoning with this level of participation for over a year uh, with numerous meetings with interested groups and the response um, to that with a, with a conservation easement um, is precedential. I'd be happy to answer questions or to let uh, Dave finish up on the three minutes I didn't use. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, David Beischer. I live at 2904 Trailwood Drive. I'm the master developer of Crowsdale Farm and also the manager of Lakefield Farm LLC, who's a landowner in this uh, rezoning. I just wanted to say that we've worked with Triangle Land Conservancy before on uh, a conservation easement, uh, which borders uh, Valley Spring uh, Park, and uh, it worked very well. So that was the impetus to work with them again on this possibility, listening. I went to all three neighborhood meetings uh, listening to the neighbors that are most directly affected, bordering the property, and I kept hearing about uh, the wanting to save trees and also uh, the neighborhood receiving something for a rezoning of a, of a storage uh, area. So that was the reason for this uh, conservation easement. It's uh, the endowment portion of that has already been fully funded. It's been approved and accepted by the Triangle Land Conservancy Board, and also a letter of support is in the staff report uh, from the Eno River Association. Uh, so I uh, available for any questions and just to ask for you to support this uh, rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll go to the next three individuals, Amy Bartus, Peggy Wright, and Wesley McKinney. Okay. Good evening. My name is Amy Bartus. I live at 10 Debonair Circle, Durham 27705. My neighborhood is Rosebriar. We are across the street from Riverside High School and about the acres being discussed tonight. As it is now, sorry, I left them on the floor. Everyone's opinion of beauty is different. Everyone's opinion of a good cup of coffee is different. Everyone's opinion of appropriating millions of tax dollars to multi-unit affordable housing is different. Everyone's opinion of progress is different, and so it goes. Everyone's idea of what a storage business across from an old prison facility should look like and act like. Increased traffic has been discussed at past zoning meetings and on the next door listserv. Some stated the numbers of cars on Guest Road was manipulated and staged. I don't know about that. But what I do know is traffic on Guest Road and Rose of Sharon will definitely increase if multi-unit affordable housing is built next to my neighborhood. I can see and hear the lodge at Crowsdale, the new apartments on Hillendale from my kitchen window. It is certain my neighborhood will be impacted by the decisions of the Durham City Council Planning Commission. Of that commission, it appears only one member resides in 27705, Thomas Miller. I don't particularly oppose storage units being built. Guest Road is obviously already a hodgepodge of buildings and dwellings and fried chicken. What concerns me is the vague threat of construction of multi-unit affordable housing on the acreage if the storage units aren't built. I grew up within a reasonable walking distance of five multi-unit affordable housing villages. Have any of you had the same experience? I worked for the County Welfare Department in Ohio for 25 years. My clients lived in multi-unit affordable housing villages. We called those places the projects. Frankly, I have, if I have to choose between a multi-unit affordable housing project or a storage unit with 31 acres of protected in perpetuity by the likes of the Triangle Conservancy Association, I choose the latter. Thank you. 
Thank you. Peggy Wright. And then Wesley McKenna. Good evening. My name is Peggy Wright. I live on Rosebriar Drive, 3036. My reasons for voting for or for speaking for the rezoning is because the storage unit itself, the storage project, is low impact. I am impressed that the numbers of, of cars would not increase significantly. I am moved, however, most significant, significantly by the offer of the conservation of the 31 acres that would preserve the quality of life in a very quiet, established neighborhood in which I've lived for uh, since 1998. And um, it's very quiet. Uh, the neighbors are very um, kind and concerned and helpful. And that's why I am um, in favor of the, re uh, of the rezoning to allow the storage project to go ahead because of the conservation uh, offer that is on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Wesley McKinney. Wesley McKinney, 3025 Rosewood uh, Circle. I am in favor of the storage units. Um, I live right behind the apartments that have been built. Um, at first, I didn't know what to think, didn't know what to uh, expect. They're very nice, it's not loud. You don't have a lot of traffic coming over <coughs> the trees to my house or nothing like that. I mean, it's, it's not a bad situation. A lot of people look at it as it is, but it's not. Um, I am impressed with the uh, details that they've put into this for the storage units. I am impressed with uh, how they've tried to save the 31 acres, obviously I'm fond of that because I do go back there with my kids and we like to explore. So that would uh, keep it where we can continue doing that and doing our family things and uh, being able to um, enjoy life. Um, but I am for it and um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, John Tushia. And if I have mangled your name, please pronounce that uh, for me. Hello, I'm John Tusich, 3105 Rosebriar. Uh, I'm in support of the rezoning. I think the traffic and the road can support that type of a building. Uh, the setting aside of the land for forest uh, is a great addition. Um, and as I live on that street, it would be nice to keep that the way it is. So I support it, thank you. Thank you. Um, Christian Orguera. Okay. You did an excellent job on my name, so thank you. Oh, um, voila. I am also for the rezoning, just to support all of the same statements that have come, mainly because we our neighborhood's been greatly impacted by the housing that was built behind it on Hillendale Road and over the 11 years I've lived there, um, I've seen that really change the, the light pollution, the noise pollution. I would rather not have any more of that. So I'd love to have the buffer um, and I think it would be a much better decision for our neighborhood. So I support it. Thank you. Thank you. I think I have all of the individuals who signed up for, I'm going to start the next list. Ken Ray. Good evening, my name is Ken Ray and I live at 1416 Miramont Drive, about a stone's throw away from where this development is being planned. If you take your thing down there, there's that one. You should have I looked up the definition of non-conforming use and there was a picture of this development in it. Just kidding a little bit there. Um, as you can see, the uh, neighborhood around us, uh, around this place is not just a prison camp, it is the Landis Road neighborhood. There are 100, about 100 houses in there. 
And I've been there, knocked on doors, and not a single person who lives there supports this kind of rezoning. Um, as you look at that picture, you'll see the black line that goes down the middle of that uh, is approximately where an eight foot tall metal fence would be. The plans that they put forth don't just call for greater than four feet, they call for an eight foot tall metal fence. That's just so far out of left field. Um, <clears throat> when the maps were up earlier, you saw that there are other storage units available in our area. There is a five story public storage unit being built across from Trosa on Roxborough Street that is 3.8 miles away from Rose of Sharon and Giss. Um, I've been to the meetings that the developers have had, uh, and at the closing of each one I've asked, can you tell us please one positive benefit this project would bring to these neighbors? And there's never an answer, because there isn't an answer to that question. There is no positive benefit to those neighbors. Um, the conservation land uh, that's been brought up over and over again, you'll notice as part of the riparian buffer, it was never going to be developed for anything. It's protected streamland. So it doesn't matter who holds the title on that land, it was never gonna be built on. Uh, so that's kind of a moot point. I would also note that some of the people who have spoken uh, for this development already did not state their addresses. Uh, if you did look at their addresses, as I did, you'd find that many of them live much farther than 3.8 miles away from this proposed development. Um, if you are here to speak ag against this development, would you raise your hand? Keep them up if you live within five miles of the development. There you have it. Um, I ask you guys, please just say no to this because every time we've met with these folks, and I'm sadly, we've heard it in a re really kind of ugly way earlier, um, when they say to us, well, you know, if we don't get to build the storage building, we'll put up affordable housing, woo, like that's a bad thing. The, zone, the land is zoned for residential. The people of this city have put forth a mandate to the city council that what's important to us is housing. Keep the land zoned for what it is zoned for. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, William Osteg. Osteg. Mr. Okay. And then followed by Nikki um, Cagle. Thank you, William Osteg. I live at 1400 Meadston Drive. Uh, I am against the rezoning at uh, uh, Goodwin Crossing for the following reasons. First, a little bit of background. Uh, I'm a registered architect. Uh, I spent 25 years on active duty as a Navy Civil Engineer Corps officer, Seabees. Uh, I've done construction and environmental projects in, in five continents. I spent the last 20 years since I retired as a, work, as a construction project manager. I say this only to let you know that I, I know a little bit about dirt and site development and the resulting environmental issues that, that, that stem from that. I also know the site pretty well since I run my dog through there. And what I can tell you is that, that doing a site plan on a piece of paper, a flat piece of paper is very different than actually laying out uh, that site plan uh, on, the, on the site itself. The site is very, very hilly, and it will require a tremendous amount of cutting and filling if the, if the riparian areas uh, and adjacent site, adjacent properties are to be maintained. On a secondary note, the, uh, the, count, the, uh, the planning department's report talks about traffic on Goodwin Road and Infinity Road, but I can tell you that the shortest distance between two points will, will uh, be, be, to get to those, I'm sorry, to get to Infinity Road, uh, traffic will, as a practical matter, go through Bardeck Court and uh, Venturia Street, and then through Briardale, uh, Meadston Road, Shady Lane, uh, before they reach Infinity Road. Those are, it, there's a residential streets, they are not roads. Um, and, that, and that increase in traffic will pose a problem. Uh, finally, as a, emotional thing, um, that's a residential, rural residential area. Um, if you're really gonna build 
houses on the, on the lots that they, at least on a flat site plan are projected to be as small as they are, it's gonna be a relatively high density area. If you look at the site plan, and I've only had the opportunity to look at, at the site plan, the side yards, the front yard setbacks, by the time you take all of that into consideration, you've got a tremendous amount of impervious area, roof area, and a lot of houses bunched closely together. It is definitely not in keeping with the character of that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nikki Cagle. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Nikki Cagle. I live at 4112 Trevor Circle, which is the neighborhood directly across the street from this proposed development. Um, and I'm speaking against this proposed rezoning. One of the things I wanna point out is that this development was already proposed as a commercial rezoning and it was rejected because there is a commercial node already within 0.25 miles of this area. And so this is just the same plan, but under, under a, different, a different name. Um, we also, at that commercial node, which is a little bit south, have a number of empty buildings, which would be perfect for a project like this, um, but doesn't mean that we want to have a self-storage center in an area that should have been residential. The other thing that I want to point out is that I am an ecologist at Duke University. I really appreciate the instinct to conserve this property, but at the same time, so much of this land can't be developed anyway because it is in that riparian habitat. Um, in addition, in my conversation, so I'm on the board of the Triangle Land Conservancy. I am also in close contact with the Eno River Association, and when I talked with my colleagues there, they said they didn't realize that there was going to be a land use change designation as a part of, of this deal. I also feel that this isn't in the public interest. As local residents, we know that there are already a lot of empty buildings just south of our neighborhood. You know, CVSs that have come and gone, an old bank that's just sitting there empty. It doesn't make sense for a new development to, to be in this spot when there could be houses in this area. And instead, we have the opportunity to follow through with a comprehensive plan and ensure that, that this sort of commercial enterprise goes where it's supposed to go, which is at the corner of Guest Road in Horton. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Marion Horn followed by William Richards. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marion Horn. I live at 544 Hallmark Road. I'm about 2.5 miles from uh, where they want to put this storage unit. I am a native Durham person. I have lived here most of, well, most of the majority of my life. I've seen a lot of changes in Durham, and I think some of them are really, really good. But one thing we love about Northern Durham County is the, are the trees and the wonderful things that we have near the Eno, and uh, it's just been a really nice place to live for a long time. Um, I am, I live in the Gray Mall subdivision, which is about two more, 2.5 miles. I'm speaking to voice my opposition to the proposed zoning change along Guest Road from residential to light commercial. This proposal was submitted in order to build a storage facility on the corner of Rosenshire and, and Guess across from the church. The city and county have a strong <coughs> planning department to protect residents against unwanted development. I oppose this kind of growth. Roxborough Road has turned into a commercial light industrial roadway it is a good example of this kind of growth. These two parallel corridors going north in Durham County will change North Durham. Roxborough Road already has. Please protect us from this fate and help maintain the semi-rural living enjoyed in Northern Durham County. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, William Richards.
Uh, good evening, my name is William Richards. I live at 5116 Green Oak Drive. I'm here today to speak on behalf of myself and the North Durham Quality Development Association against the rezoning and construction of the self-storage facility. Uh, the argument, short and simple, uh, we don't need another self-storage facility in our area. There are already two within about three miles of the proposed site and at least seven within 10 minute drive, uh, including one that is currently under construction on the corner of um, Hillsborough Road and Christian Ave, which hasn't appeared on their map, and the five-story behemoth across from Trosa, which didn't appear on their map either. Um, additionally, the request for the land to be rezoned industrial is not due to the nature of the business, but rather to what they think they can get approved because of the proximity of other commercial nodes, as their previous commercial rezoning application will attest to. Our group's meeting with the developers uh, they attempted to flatter us, steamroll us, deceive us, and scare us, but at no point have they given us good arguments for the rezoning and construction of a stealth storage facility. They've consistently told us that the site would not crowd the road, but in the artist's renderings, uh, they go right up against the road. Um, and it has to be like that due to the nature of that lot. Uh, they've refused to consider any other options and are insisting on a self-storage facility, almost certainly because self-storage businesses have one of the highest profit margins of around 11%, which means you only need about 60% occupancy to turn a profit. This is mostly due to the small number of employees that are needed to run and maintain the building and grounds. The average self-storage facility hires four people, so there's no economic incentive uh, for the area either. As part of their attempted scare tactics, they've trotted out the old malicious line of, well, if we don't get this, we're gonna be forced to put in affordable housing, and you don't want that. And I think that the city of Durham needs affordable housing. Uh, we would much rather the land be used for its proposed zoning uh, than another ugly, unneeded self-storage facility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bill Corey. Respected members of the uh, commission, respected members of the audience, respected staff members, my name is Bill Corey, and I live at 314 Ladder Road now for about nine years, and. Um, my spouse has lived in North Durham uh, and his family before him since the early 1800s. Um, and we're very concerned about the um, overdevelopment in the area. Do we want North Durham to be like South Durham? Who likes to go to South Durham in, at traffic, you know? It's, traffic isn't too bad here, uh, you know, at, at rush hour. Um, um, I call it the, the, the ravishing of the Shire. If you know Tolkien, you know how bad that was. Um, um, I'm, I'm not very a uh, good public speaker, so I apologize for my inarticulateness, but um, the, the, the one thing I wanna say is, the two things I wanna say is when you add hard surface to a wetland, that's bad news, and we're right near the, Reno, the Eno, and I know it's downhill from the Eno, so, but still, um, and the other thing I know, I believe um, that the uh, conservation regulations uh, uh, in this state, it doesn't mean that that, that land won't be, won't be developed in perpetuity. It could be developed later. Um, they'll figure out a way to build on that stuff, you know, in 100 years. Is it, is it gonna be forced in perpetuity? That's a question I have for you, Mr. Weischer. I'm really concerned about what's, what Crowsdale Farms has become in the last year, that's what these that's what these storage units are for. It's for those those people in those renting those people renting their units, and and where to, where where they can put their stuff. Um, it will be very handy for them, won't it? Um, then the second thing I want to say is, I, by the time me, me and my spouse die, we're, we've always rented. We're going to have spent nearly a million dollars in rent. Now, the quickest way for someone to get out of poverty or to enter the middle class, to claw themselves out of the lower class, is to own property. Why do we want to change this zoning? It's, it's, a, it's part of a, a, a grand plan. It's a master plan. Um, we want there to be residences. We want people to be riding their little, having their kids ride their bikes around in the cul-de-sacs and, and like what we have in our neighborhood. We have small houses modest houses, affordable houses, and um, okay, so, and then this is my big point, and it was just made. Um, a, a landlord makes a lot of a profit. The second biggest, a hotelier, that means a hotel owner. The third biggest per square foot, 
storage unit owners. Thank you. Uh, Gary Lipscomb. My name is Gary Lipscomb, I live at 314 on Ladder Road. That was my partner. Um, part of the reason that we wanna get, um, keep this affordable housing possibility is the amount of people that already live in North Durham. Um, we live on three acres, and right now, we have more deer coming through our yard every time there's a new development. I mean, houses, yes, I mean, the deer will come through your houses, but if there is like concrete, like a storage unit and more, there's gonna be no place else for life, for wildlife to go. I mean, and yes, we do have West Point of the Eno and Eno Park, but that's a limited amount of space. Can we please try to keep the living of our planet alive and not paved over? Thank you. Thank you. I do not have other people who have signed up to speak, but I'm going to ask at this time if there's anybody who would like to speak uh, for or against uh, this particular. Yes. I wanted to just take a opportunity. There were several uh, questions and, and statements raised about affordable housing on this tract. That, that has never been uh, a opportunity. We have certainly worked with other developers about uh, housing, but it always comes down to being across from the, the old prison camp, but there, there are no affordable housing uh, plans coming. I've, I've never worked on that on this tract, and we certainly have not used that as a scare tactic. Uh, I'd also like to just correct that while there are uh, stream delineation areas and riparian buffers on the track, there's certainly a, a stream in the middle. The entire 31 acres that would be under the conservation easement, there are uh, uh, several pods that are developable and the entire tract is not in the riparian buffer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, once again, uh, are there other individuals who would like to speak? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. I do have one individual, do, um, have you signed up to speak? Um, we'll get you, if you can come forward, we'll get your name and address on the sheet. My name is Dale Strauss and I live at um, 10 Debonair and it's in Rosebriar neighborhood. And I just wanna say that the three people that did speak first that were for the rezoning, we all live within two blocks of that. The rest of the people I saw that came up here that are against it, they live a long ways away from this. Um, and I see uh, the storage unit as being a good thing instead of having housing in there uh, for, for one reason, you put houses in there, you're gonna have a lot more traffic. And the person was saying about the deer, when you put all those houses in there, the deer are gonna move. And uh, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, if there are no other individuals who've signed up to speak or who wish to speak, I see one hand. Um, if you will come forward. Please state your name and address, please. Uh, uh, Adam Roberts, 3058 Rosewood Circle. I you're also speaking, live. You're speaking for or against? I am for the rezoning. Okay. I'd like to keep that area you know, impacted the minimal as possible. And I like to keep the neighborhood closed in. We already have the uh, apartment developments on the other side of the, of the side. I would not like to be closed in in that neighborhood if at all possible, so I'm for the rezoning. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, could you state your last name? We were, we're trying to get it on our roster. Adam Roberts. R-O-B-E-R-T-S, 3058 you. Rosewood Circle. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, at this time, I see no other individuals who are interested. I see another hand. Um, could you come forward, please? Good evening, my name is Tamu Graves Coleman and I reside at 1622 Glasgow Street. 
in Durham, and that's about two miles from this development. Okay. And I am in for, I'm for the rezoning. Okay. Um, I travel through that area to take my children to school every day, and traffic is horrific. I can't imagine what it would be if we decide to put more housing. So I'm, in, I'm for it. Could, could you say your name again for me, please, so that we can record it? Tamu, it's T-A-M-U, Graves Coleman. Coleman, okay, thank you so much. Thank Got you. It. Okay, I see no other individuals who are, are uh, being recognized to speak, so I am going to close the public hearing at this time, which is the comment period for the public and open uh, the session for our commissioners to give them an opportunity to ask questions. So I'm going to start to my right. Are there any commissioners who would like to speak or ask questions? Okay, Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, a question for the staff and I'll, I'll probably have additional questions, but just to help me understand because we've already heard it in the public comment period. When we talk about this conservation easement and that appears to be a benefit to this proposal, but we've heard others talk about how a lot of that would be undevelopable in, in a, a different kind of development. Can you walk us through how much of this in terms of the actual size of this property would be undevelopable undevelopable land if it remained in a residential program as currently zoned compared to what the proffer is? Just so we're dealing with an understanding of what, what are we talking about here? Sure, so I'm not sure that I'll be able to give you specific numbers, but I can refer you to uh, the development plan sheet. Uh, that shows a large portion of that area under the conservation subdivision, uh, sorry, I misspoke, uh, under the conservation easement. Um, and you'll see in that western portion of the site, the riparian uh, buffer and the 10-foot uh, no-build zone has been hatched. That area would be considered um, outside of the developable area. Um, I can't speak to any grading uh, or those um, site constraints that they might have uh, with regard to buildable area, but specifically the riparian buffers and um, steep slopes or, or wetland areas as identified on the development plan or the existing condition sheet um, would be considered uh, outside of their development area. Great, thank you. And I don't, I don't know if the proponent has more specific numbers, but if, if you do have specific numbers available, it'd be great to hear them. If you don't, if, if your understanding is the same as the staff, that's fine. Schrader with the uh, applicant. We don't have an exact number, but we think it's about 12 to 15 acres would have been buffers. And so that would be leave you a balance of 15 to 18 acres that would otherwise be developable. Um, some plans have been done in the past by a landscape architect here um, in town, Mr. Jewell, who appears before you uh, quite routinely, um, that showed those development pods in the locations north and south of the buffer that Emily was, was illustrating. Great, thank you. Okay. That's all for now. Uh, Commissioner Bryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question for staff. Uh, on attachment six, under contiguous development, the staff analysis, uh, you point out that urban services such as existing sidewalks and an existing commercial node located less than a half a mile to the south which includes urban services such as grocery and pharmacy businesses would better serve a residential use. And when I read that, this is why I'm asking the question, it sounded to me like you were waffling a little bit on uh, whether you really like this as industrial. It's not always black and white as far as um what, which is best suited. So I did want to call out both aspects of the adjacent um, industrial uses, but also those services. Okay. Uh, it might help people to know that I spent a little time out at the Willowdale Shopping Center and there is some vacant space out there available for lease. Just how much, I don't know. Uh, another thing I've been trying to pin down 
are some numbers with respect to acreage. Uh, on attachment four, the plan amendment justification statement, it talks about two parcels which add up to 42.693 acres. And I actually went to the Durham County tax uh, records and confirmed that that was correct. And then if 10.14 acres is being used in the actual rezoning, to me it leaves 32.553 acres left that I assume is going to be what's in the conservation easement if this goes through. Is that correct? Uh, they've only committed to a minimum of 30 total acres in the conservation easement. Only a minimum of 30. So there's some acreage unaccounted for. Correct. Okay. Uh, and with respect to conservation easements, uh, I'm assuming that the people who live away from Guest Road, some of whom have spoken tonight, uh, will have access to this piece of property if it's placed in conservation. But what about other people? Uh, it seems to me that access to this property from Guest Road is blocked. Is that a fair assessment? I can't speak to the proposed conservation easement um, accessibility, but I can uh, note the, um, the stream buffers and floodplain that would um, make access across that area from um, Guest Road uh, not feasible, especially as it, a crossing hasn't been identified on this development plan. This development plan being a portion that runs uh, largely along that uh, frontage. So somebody like me who belongs to TLC who wanted to go out there and explore the property is gonna have to intrude on somebody else's neighborhood to be able to go look at it. I don't know if, uh, what the uh, details of the conservation easement would include as far as access. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, a question for the applicant. Uh, mention has been made of this eight foot fence. It's gonna be along Guest Road. Is it only gonna be along Guest Road or is it going to surround your developable property? I'd like to have Tim Sybers answer that question. Um, and he's, he's our um, site planner and engineer. I would like to answer the question you raised earlier that while, while I'm up here, mm. in that there is direct frontage on Guest Road for the conservation easement. And the reason that there's a difference in balance is that um, the easement will be recorded. It will be a publicly recorded document with a um, legal description. And that exact acreage has to be figured out and then recorded in connection with the easement. So we're just leaving some wiggle room in terms of um, TLC coming out there and, and yeah, it, it it just looked to me from the map that where there was it was touching Guest Road was also right in your floodplain, et cetera, and I didn't see that that was a good point there of exit. A, there is a portion that does touch Guest Road. There's also an existing trail um, through that area, and so all of those details will have to be worked out um, when we're at the site plan stage. Okay. Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates. So the uh, showing the fence uh, for the uh, eight foot maximum height is uh, is included in this plan to sh um, to one make sure we're showing the entire picture, but also to provide that ordinance request to make that change. Uh, the fence will be will be uh, throughout the entire project. Um, the be <coughs> excuse me along the back along the stream buffers. Um, those details will be worked out at site plan, mm -hmm. but uh, the maximum height is. Uh, requested within 50 feet of the right-of-way, which is the ordinance requirement. So that's why we're showing it along the right-of-way only because that's okay. the change, that's the request of the change. Okay, so based on what you just told me, is it a fair assumption that part of this storage area will be devoted to vehicle storage? That is, that's not in the plans for right now. Um, again, that'll be worked out at the, at the site plan stage, but the, uh, the, the, the goal is to be able to have this as uh, um, internal storage uh, for climate control. 
Yeah, I understand that, but I also am aware of the facility off of Hobson Road. That's correct. Uh, which is a, another Cube Smart, and this looks very much like a Cube Smart building, uh, which also has vehicle storage and it's got an eight foot fence around it. So that's. Okay, we'll look into that, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also want to just take a moment to thank everybody who came out tonight to speak and everybody who's sent me emails. Your input is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner L. Turk. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for coming out and emailing and calling. Um, and I agree with Commissioner Bryan, it's very important. Um, I do have a couple of questions for staff. Um, so a number of my questions are about the text commitments. Um, so this is the first on page D000. Um, so if the minimum of, this is number five. So there's a minimum of 35% tree save area. So is that, um, from what I can tell here, the requirement under the EDO is just 10% and the, the applicant is committing to 35%, is that correct? Yes, their text commitment is above me on the ordinance uh, standards. I would uh, have to do a little digging to get the exact one. I'm not sure if that uh, tree save number has increased with the latest text changes. I see, okay. But in so general, it is uh, above and beyond ordinance standards. Okay, great. So that's 35% of the 10 acres, which would be, again, so they're committing to tree save of 3.5 acres rather than the one acre that they were required to. Correct. Right. Um, no, number eight, about the illumination. Um, I don't know anything about foot candles, uh, 0.25 foot candles, is that good? Uh, is that above and re the required? Yes, uh, okay. any text commitments would be above and beyond right. ordinance requirements. I can you know pull up the, the specific foot candles okay. if you'd like, it'll take me a minute. Okay, but, all right. Um, you, know, you don't have to, Give me the exact number, but it is above and beyond the UDO requirement, right? Yes. Of the illumination. Okay. And then there's 150% 150, 150 of the required street tree quantity. Um, that's just, yeah, so 150% of what's required in the UDO, they're going to, that's, they're going to provide that, right? Yes. On Guest Road. Yes. Correct. Okay. So, okay. Uh, the, I mean, I guess the other question that has been batted around a lot is about the, the conservation easement. Um, for the, and, and can you say more about that? So I don't understand, you know, if accepted by the Triangle Land Conservancy, Conservancy it will be conserved for how long? What, what, what will they do? What's the process look like? Because uh, I think there's some ambiguity about this. So the language that we would have to hold them to that um, is that it would be a permanent conservation easement. That language is included in the text commitment. Um, so that's what we as staff would have to work with as far as in, it meeting the, uh, the development plan. Um, so if they were to remove that conservation easement, they would have to rezone. Okay, so if they, so it is permanent, but if, if they decided at some point, no, we, wanna, we want to build on here, they would have to come back to the Planning Commission and the City Council? That is my understanding. Okay. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Okay, great. And it does look like to me that, I mean, just from the development plan, it looks like that number that the applicant gave is about right, about 15 to 18 acres. It looks like about half of the 30 acres is already under the riparian buffer, or protected by riparian buffer, but then there's the other part that would be part of this conservancy. Um, I mean, I, you know, this is a tough case, I think, because I, I'm hearing a lot of different things from neighbors. Uh, people want, don't want traffic, but also some people want housing, some people want, uh, you know, more environmental protections and it, so it, it's a difficult, there's some trade-offs here. Um, I do think, I mean, it is true that something like this will generate less traffic than housing. Uh, if it was up to me, I, I, I would actually prefer multifamily affordable housing in this, in this area and on this piece of land, but I, that's not what's before us today. Uh, and, and I guess we could keep it at two units an acre or less um, if we don't rezone it, but at least from what I can tell, it seems like this is a, a compromise development uh, uh, application. So it's not whatever it's not everything that the neighbors want, uh, but I do think that the applicant has committed to some things that are above and beyond what we sometimes get with applications like this. Uh, you know, the, this question of 
you know, do we need another self-storage? And I, I don't have a good answer to that, and I'm not sure that any of us up here know the, the market well enough to make that, to, to, you know, vote based on that. What I do think we need to consider is, you know, is this an appropriate piece of land for industrial light? Um, it seems to me, again, because it, it is across from some industrial zoning that it is, you know, congruent in that sense, uh, but it, then it does, there's this other added piece of it, which is conserving this 30 acres of land that would be a, a benefit to the community. It's, you know, maybe it's not a benefit to everyone, but I, you know, again, I, you know, I think Mr. McKinney mentioned the, the community benefits of that. I, I think that's, that's a nice added uh, commitment. Um, so again, I'm, I'm torn about this, but you know, someone else, uh, just another compromise, or some a commitment that I thought is helpful to think about is the the maximum building height of two stories. You know, someone mentioned a five-story self-storage unit. You know, this is not that. So I, I don't think this will be completely just you know out of character from the with, with the area. Uh, so at least as of right now, I'm kind of leaning to support it. Uh, but I'm I'm interested to hear what other commissioners have to say. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miller. So thank you. I have a, a couple of points of clarification I'd like for you to address. Uh, if, the, if the developer had asked for this to be uh, general commercial D, it would violate the comprehensive plan, would it not? Yes. Because it would run two nodes too close together. Yes, that's, uh, the application initially came in as that, and it's been revised to industrial light. And, and we want to have our commercial nodes, um, especially on these arterials, to have a certain amount of separation. What is that separation currently in the comprehensive plan? Oh, I don't have that one memorized. Quarter of a mile? 600 feet? Yeah. Well, whatever it is, this would make it too close. Yes. <laughs> so that's why we're industrial. But there is industrial across the street. Um, that's okay. Because it seems like we're overzoning the property and then we're using the development plan to cut the use way back into something that's not industrial at all. And we're doing that because our comprehensive plan, which is incorporated into our UDO by reference, requires that there be separation with commercial nodes. And to me, this is the crux of what this is about, is I believe that we should have separation of commercial nodes. And I believe that our comprehensive plan doesn't have a big enough interval. Um, so when we talked about Publix, and some of you were on the commission when we had the, the, the Publix case, what worries me about Guess Road, we have a terrible example in land use planning on Roxborough Road, Hillsborough Road, near where I live, and even Guess Road south of this, of uh, where we have allowed, I usually don't blow the sirens when I speak. Uh, <laughs> I'll try not to set the house on fire. The, um, but we don't need to do that anymore. Um, and there's no reason why Guess Road beyond this point could be one parcel of non-residential and another parcel of non-residential and another parcel of non-residential uh, that gets all mixed up. I called it slash and burn zoning because we already have a commercial thing that I don't think of Willowdale as old. Uh, but I guess in the commercial, in the life of commercial buildings, it is old because it's not renting very well. And we have the, what's been built around there, some of it's been torn down and, and new things built like the Harris Teeter where the theater used to be. Um, I would like to see us reuse the uses, the commercial uses that age out in our existing commercial nodes before we cut down trees and, exp and expand non-residential uses. <laughs> non-residential uses into green space. Um, and that to me is the big issue in this case. Now that's not to say that I don't see the other side, I do. Uh, there is a prison in industrial zoning across the street from this. Uh, and the folks on Landis Drive live next to the prison and that works out. But I don't think necessarily, if I were a developer of residential housing, I wouldn't necessarily think that it's a great marketing thing to say, and there's a prison across the street. Um, so I get it. What I want out of future development in this area is a clear line of demarcation that says 
What happens north of here is a different kind of development pattern in Durham, because I hear you folks come and speak, and although some of you were for because of this and some of you were against because of that, but you're all saying the same thing, is there is a quality of life that is derived from the, the, the pattern of existing pattern of development that you wanna preserve, and it was a choice that you made. Uh, that when that when you decided to live out there, you're driving a lot farther to go to a restaurant than I am. You are driving a lot farther to go buy a pair of socks than probably I am, uh, even though I live in 27705, and my storage unit's in 27701. The, um, so I see that, and I, so when we pull back a little bit, I believe everybody who has come to speak on this is actually arguing the same thing, uh, they might be on this side or that side because of their particular location of their house. But what you're after is, is a conservation of the quality of life and the choice you made by deciding to live in this part of Durham County. That to me is the most important consideration. Now, what I would like to do, and I've told the developers land planner this, um, I get it, and sometimes we uh, are forced to compromise. I think this is a case where compromise is possible. Uh, I am looking at the whoever it is that lives in the house on Landis Drive closest to Guest Road. It's on the south side. It's two lots in. It's going to see, that house is going to see whatever happens is developed on this piece of property. And so for and if it's going to be a, a, a large storage and you say it's only two stories tall, it's 150,000 square feet of storage. That's not a small storage facility. It may not be four stories tall, but it's, this is big. Uh, you know, the Harris Teeter is about 54,000 square feet. It's three Harris Teeters. Um, so that matters. Uh, what I would like to do, and if it were up to me, what would turn my current no vote to a yes vote is if we could, uh, change this development plan a little bit, add commitments. I would like to see that no part of the actual developed part of this 10 acre parcel come up to and be opposite or across Guess Road from the, the, the in, in close proximity to the residential subdivision at Landis. Because I don't want what's built here to destabilize and make Landis Road a less attractive place for people to live. Uh, they right now are on the boundary. Uh, they are protecting everybody else, and so I want to protect them. So if we could shift what is built on this piece of property without regard to how many square feet it may ultimately be, further south on the property than is currently committed, that would tend to have me move to a yes vote. If we could make this building, and I know they've gone back and forth and they've done the extraordinary thing of actually including an elevation saying, this is what it'll look like, full marks. I love it when developers can and will do that. But we have an example of self-storage. Self-storage doesn't have to be ugly. Uh, and the, a self-storage facility has been built within walking distance of where we are right now that is remarkable in my opinion for its successful integration into what I call kind of a Durham style. Uh, so, and that's the one that's down here where the old Carver, Cozart and Curran warehouse used to, that was 40 years ago, I'm, where the McDonald's is down here uh, on the north side of town. So uh, if it looked more like that, uh, then I would be happier about it. Um, I would love to see that this height limit would be more refined. Because it's on a slope, I would, I'm assuming that these buildings are probably going to be one commercial story, which is taller than a residential story, at the north end, and they probably will be two stories with the, with the grade. If they were two stories to three stories, that's pretty tall. Uh, so I would like to see this refined a little bit. And I would like to, to ask and, and to understand a little bit about the way the street tree plantings would work. Uh, right now we have a street tree requirement. It would apply here and they will have to plant a row of, of trees that, in, that with potential could be, could be large. Uh, most of us are going to see this development driving on Guess Road. And we're gonna see it at 35 miles an hour going north or south. And so a row of trees, looking at it obliquely that way as, as drivers or passengers in vehicles, uh, we can do thoughtful planning there 
to organize the trees there, meeting the minimum requirements of the code in terms of intervals and spacing, but using extra trees, if the, since the developer is willing to plant them, in such a way that, that the overall effect of the row of trees is denser, and we can increase the size of the trees at the time of their planting. Uh, and so we could go to a larger caliper tree, a diameter of the trunk at a certain height above the ground. So, and we can provide for these trees a larger area to grow in so that they don't stay the, the wispy puny maples that I see in parking lots in suburban commercial development all over town. Some of these uh, commercial developments are now 25 years old and the trees are still puny and tiny and that's because they have no room to grow. We can fix that here uh, with better uh, commitments. And so, and I'm not speaking for you. If you're still against this, there are reasons to be against it and I'm not trying to convince you otherwise. But I'm saying for me, this could be with a little tweaking this could be a plan I could vote for. But without that tweaking and without putting it in the, in the commitments here, uh, I'm going to have to vote no tonight and I'm going to urge my friends on the commission to, to, to vote no. What I want is at the north end of this piece of property, a clear signal, a clear signal that the commercial area, the non-residential area that exists where Horton and, and guests come together stops at the north end of this. It's not an invitation to keep going. And it's true, there's a small commercial node there where uh, Rose of Sharon comes in. That's a one lot of com neighborhood commercial and one lot of office institutional. That's the kind of commercial node that should we should look at and allow and develop going north uh, so that we can have uh, the kinds of local services like the veterinary office and what have you, when, when, when the cat's throwing up on the road, you don't have to drive all the way across Durham to get to your vet. That's the kind of thing that we need to have going north, uh, but we don't need great big developments. We do not need uh, accumulations of buildings of, of more than 100,000 square feet. So that's my view on this. I'm going to vote no, but with a little tweaking, if the developer wanted to do it, I could vote yes. And that's what will appear in my uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. And before I recognize the next commissioner to speak, I have to offer a word of caution that we do not, um, will refrain from any applause or other responses to our commissioners while they're speaking. And I thank you for that. Now, I'd like to recognize the next commissioner who would like to speak. Okay, Commissioner Baker. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm. Uh, not completely decided on this. Um, I do think that uh, as we consider any sorts of developments or development proposals that come before us here on the commission, that uh, an absolutely fundamental consideration every time should be the environmental and climate impacts of those developments um, or proposals. In this case, uh, the developer is making a, a pretty extraordinary donation of land uh, to remain permanently forested. But I would ask, uh, is, this, um, is this good site planning? Um, when, we, when we think about this, we, good for I think it's good to think about whether it's good site planning and whether it's good planning in general. And I would ask, is this good site planning? I, I think in some ways, in some ways it is. Um, the site by itself and isolated uh, from the world around it uh, will likely have a climate positive impact um, given the number of protected trees and the, the positive impact um, this would have on, on stormwater. Uh, in other ways, it's not. Uh, the design and layout is certainly uh, not um, walkable. Uh, it doesn't define public space. Uh, it doesn't provide the critical elements of uh, walkability, um, like transparency along the building frontage. Uh, and, and I think that Commissioner Miller um, made a very compelling case when he talked about uh, the um, self-storage unit that is located right around the corner from here on Seminary Avenue, right across from the McDonald's, um, that self-storage can actually be, uh, can actually contribute um, to the uh, feel of Durham. Um, and there are also no commitments for green building practices or renewable energy. I think that if we had appropriate design standards with those transparency requirements, as there are standards in, in uh, downtown and other parts of Durham, uh, this proposal would be illegal. 
Um, if we had appropriate uh, connectivity and block length standards, this proposal would be uh, illegal. If we had uh, appropriate green building standards, um, this proposal would be illegal. Um, but if those standards were in place, this wouldn't be the proposal uh, that is um, before us. We would have a more sustainable uh, proposal. Uh, so on the other hand, there's good site planning, but there's also just good planning. Um, and those aren't always the same. Green space, for example, there is a, a proposed offer of green space uh, in what's before us. Uh, but I think in the grand scheme of things, green space needs to be thoughtfully and proactively identified, needs to be prominent and needs to be celebrated. Um, and um, it also needs to be highly accessible. So was this green space thoughtfully identified um, as critical for protection? Not really, it's kind of an afterthought uh, as part of this case. Um, again, different, uh, different things, um, site planning and higher level planning. Is there a market demand for self storage? Uh, clearly there is. Uh, and I would encourage us to think or try to think more, uh, if possible, more about form, character, uh, design and conservation of land in a, con in a sustainable context rather than about the uses that take place within uh, those buildings. So our decision making, uh, is, it's not about rewarding or punishing uh, the development team, never is. It's not about rewarding or punishing uh, neighbors or residents, never is. Our decision making should be based on the merits of the application that is before us every time it is before us and the contribution that that, that application makes or could make to the public health, safety, and welfare. So I think that we all need, always need to ask the question, will this make Durham a better city, a better place? Right now, I'm not convinced that this is, um, and I find Commissioner Miller's um, argument uh, very compelling, um, and I look forward to any additional arguments that are made by other members of uh, the Planning Commission. Are the other commissioners who would like to speak? Okay, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Wallman. Uh, one initial question, and whichever party, the staff or the applicant can answer it the quickest would be helpful. Uh, I'm not a historian of prisons or whatnot, but do we know when that prison uh, structure was actually built? I don't have the date. Um, I know that it's no longer a prison. But the facility just Oh, I don't have a date on that. The, uh, the old limited security uh, prison was built in the 1920s. I don't know when it was taken out of service to become a NCDOT storage area, but that's when it was built. So my next question is for the applicant, so you can say. <laughs> so that leads me to assume, and correct me if I'm, I'm inaccurate, is that when you, when your client or whoever the owner of the larger land par parcel acquired or gained control of this site and the larger site that it was aware that this prison at the time or storage facility, where, where, whichever it was at the time, was a part of the adjacent landscape in which the property was acquired. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And so when the uh, existing uh, zoning that we're being asked to change, when that was zoned residential, was, it, were you, was the owner or whoever it is at that time, if you're aware, were they con convinced or, or thinking that they would actually be able to develop that as residential? And if so, what happened over time knowing that that prison or storage facility was there at the time? What, is, what happened to lead you to recognize or acknowledge that that was not you know, the reality of what can happen on that site? Certainly when the entire tract of Crowsdale Farm was rezoned, uh, <clears throat> it was actually 1,100 acres, was rezoned in 1987 and got the development plan. Uh, there's no question the prison camp was there. In fact, it was still a prison at that time. And uh, we did get the residential zoning and looking out you know, 30, uh, 30 years, Things do change. We have gone and uh, tried to engage other developers to take a look at this. And every time they start looking at the site, they look to the GIS map and you see Prison Camp Road, which 
even if you explain to them, you have to re-explain that this is a, a, a DOT storage area. As you can see from the, uh, from the photos that are shown, it's, it's really not uh, very great aesthetically currently, even though it's not a prison camp. But we have uh, truly tried to talk to some different folks about doing uh, a development there. In fact, the developer that built the lodge apartments originally they were looking at trying to make the apartments work on that site, and there just uh, wasn't quite a, a good spot. They wanted to be a little bit closer to the interior of Crowsdale Farm, so that's why they moved to the other side of Hillendale Road. But those conditions did uh, exist. But again, that was over 30 years ago. Mm. Thank you. And so since Mr. Miller just, uh, Commissioner Miller just left the, the dais, I was gonna ask him a question, but I'll just make a, a couple comments. Uh, so first of all, secondly, thank you all uh, who came out tonight speaking for and against uh, providing your feedback and thoughts. What I think in taking and hearing everything and reading the case and knowing the, the area and the site, I think that uh, it comes down to does this actual proposed development make sense for this particular community area? I think what I wanted to make sure I didn't find myself doing was justifying or rationalizing what is essentially a good effort at something that was is not originally a part of what's supposed to go in this particular parcel. I mean, if, whether you're for or against it, I would argue that the effort that has been made to present something that has merit, is it warrants some kind of, you know, you know, acknowledgement that there has been some actually like not negative effort, but positive effort to present something that has to have for us to have a conversation around. However, I think the question becomes, is this something that should go into this community, this neighborhood? And the question that I wanted to ask to Commissioner Miller is, you noted, so again, I'm trying to summarize what I heard you say, but if I'm inaccurate, please correct me, is that you're, a, you're seeing this as an attempt to essentially put something that can be deemed as commercial use in an area that is zoned for residential, but it's being attempted under a, a light industrial designation. That's correct. Okay. Because of the way the comprehensive plan, requ right. the requirements of the comprehensive plan on node separation. Right, and so. It's it, about node separation. Right, and so, and, and then, so this is what I'm trying to reconcile, but you are willing to make an exception given some certain things happening, even though you're acknowledging that you don't believe that it's appropriate for commercial type activity, even when there's a, according to policy that, you know, we don't want close commercial nodes, but you're willing to make an exception if certain things are done under what you presented to, basically your comment says, there's something that can be done that could sway you back to the other side to a yes, even after acknowledging that this is essentially a commercial effort under the guise of light industrial. Yeah, so what I'm looking for here is adjustments to the development plan because I acknowledge what they're, I'm not suggesting that what they are proposing doesn't conform to the plan. As a matter of fact, if they came in and asked for commercial, they couldn't do it and we'd have a node separation problem and I would be just as concerned. What I'm looking for is using the device of the development plan to give us space here so that we can have some sort of node separation. I, I wouldn't say an exception, I'm looking for compromise. Uh, I acknowledge that there are other considerations I didn't list. If you'll notice when you look at the site plan, I mean at the development plan map, you'll see that a stream runs right along parallel to Guess Road and leaves a very narrow, narrow strip, this, this 10 acres we're talking about. Um, it's going to be difficult to build for anything. Uh, quite frankly, there, uh, and I am not one of those people who believes that anybody, it's reasonable for anybody to expect another landowner to hold their land empty for the benefit of the neighbor. That's, that's not reasonable. So some sort of correct development on this piece of property is appropriate. What I'm trying to do is balance interests and balance and uh, achieve to the extent possible uh, a policy goal, which because of the way the policy is written, uh, doesn't actually have to be achieved. I believe that the policy goal of node separation is node separation. But we've written the policy to make an exception 
when we stick in industrial zone between nodes. And so you wind up, and because we allow, allow commercial uses in industrial zones, we wind up with no separation of nodes. Our policy defeats itself. What I'm trying to do is overcome the defeat and wind up with some sort of separation, recognizing that compromise, I'm, I'm a compromiser. And right. so that's what I'm looking for. Okay, thank so, you. so thank you for that, that com th those comments. And so my response, in part taking that into account is, goes back to my initial question to the sponsor. So given what the existing platform is in regards to the residential zoning, nothing has changed in regards to what was in place when the initial PDR zoning was. So it's not a, re it's not a reaction, it's not a re reaction, it's, a re it's not a response, it's a reaction to something that, they, that the, the project sponsor realized that, that can't happen. For me, I think a compromise would be, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a storage, you know, a self-storage, or again, we're acknowledging that we're, we're pursuing a commercial-oriented development under the guise of light industrial. A comp uh, one could argue, in my estimation that a compromise could be something that's not under the requested zoning or are under the, the residential zoning. We don't know. I, I met with the, the sponsor and I asked, you know, if this request does not go through, then what's the plan? And the response I, that I received, if my recollection, I don't have my notes with me, is that he, he doesn't know yet. So it's, it's, have we really thought through you know, the conservation issue is we know right now from the conversation tonight that at the minimum between 12 and 15 acres will still be there because that's what's required with the repairing feature that's on the site. So it's not like we, we go to zero in regards to that conversation based on not getting this approved tonight. So again, it just leads me to ask the question, you know, rhetorically or feel free to provide responses is that are we creating a framework in which we're saying that if we don't look for something to happen under this, what's being presented to us, that we put ourselves in a position where there are no other alternatives. Have we really, ex has the developer or have we in our thought process really explored what could be a compromise or somewhere in the middle, it doesn't have to be directly in the middle, in which these neighbors and community members can get something that they can live with. Negotiation is that if, if one side of the part of, of, of the negotiating tables leave feeling great about the situation, then it wasn't a good negotiation. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to feel a little uncomfortable, but you get to a place where you say this can work. And I don't think that necessarily this is something where, I think it's a, I'm sorry, I think it's a win for the project sponsor because Based off the information that I've given, I don't think we've explored what all could potentially happen, given what we've stated are some of the goals here in Durham. We know that affordable housing is a something. So with affordable housing comes the trade-off of possibly more traffic. But at the same time, we understand that there's a prison across the road. So maybe you're not gonna get the housing product or type that you necessarily want, but that is that guided by what Durham says that we're trying to achieve. And so I, I say that to get to the point of, I'm not in support of this because I don't think that this particular development and the product should go in this community, in this area, but I don't think that that leads us to saying this property, this, this site can't be developed, but I think that more exploration is, is something that should be the next step, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. I need to recognize Commissioner Morgan. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for the applicant. It's really more of a technical question. Um, I did notice that on the actual site itself, there's like a 50 foot elevation change from the north to the south. Uh, do you anticipate any kind of grading or what is your, as you have started to kind of kick around a site plan, what's your, do you have any thoughts on that? Just so I have a better understanding. Tim Sivers with Horvath Associates. Yeah, so we've we've researched that, and uh, the the preliminary idea is to have multiple buildings that step down the slope because there is a, is a large slope across it to have minimal impact on, into that slope. So as I believe as Commissioner Miller mentioned earlier, uh, the the concept idea of, of limiting it to two stories right now is on the uh, north facing wall of the of the buildings mm -hmm. would potentially only be one story, kind of like 
Uh, and the south facing wall of those buildings would be a two story building, mm -hmm. almost like a walkout basement. And those multiple buildings would step down the slope as you head north to south. Do you see any kind of development plan where you're phasing this in over time? I mean, as, as Commissioner Miller has talked about as size and square footage, it's, it's rather large, but is there something where you could actually adjust your plan or tweak it to where it could be more in a phase type approach? Uh, we haven't looked into the into the phasing yet, but uh, we'll research that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner um, Santiago. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, my concern with this property is that by voting for this tonight, we might be limiting ourselves a little bit. Um, as we all know, there's been the ongoing discussion about housing where it should be. And this particular property is within city limits on a major transportation co corridor. That could mean future transit options. That could mean just higher traffic in general just because of what it's a state road already. So my concern is if we change it now, that we can't, you know, we've had this discussion about if the suburbans here should and it will absorb most of our growing population. So if we limit ourselves now, what do we do five, 10, 15 years from now? when well, we've done a poor job of deciding what development looks like on major transportation corridors. Then that brings with it the, the cost environmentally and the cost monetarily of, ex, of extending infrastructure further and further out into the suburbs to gain, get more housing. This is already in the future land use map. I'm just concerned that changing it now just limiting ourselves. Thank you. Other commissioners who would like to speak? Yes, hi. Commissioner Lowe. Thank you. Uh, the question is for the applicant, I believe. Yes. Uh, the question that came up earlier, if I heard correctly, uh, will you be storing vehicles at this particular storage unit? And I thought the applicant said, that they do not know. And I was running, wondering at this point why we would not know what type of vehicles, even what size, from a mini scoop to a tractor trailer, what have you. I was just curious to hear that answer that you did not know. So if you could address that for me, I would appreciate that. Sure. Um, part of the reason we don't know is that this case um, is unlike any other in that it involves a significant amount of compromise to where we are today. And every time that we add conditions or change the plan that impacts um, lots of things, circulation, access, um, details that will be figured out at the site plan stage. And so until we know kind of the limits of what that is um, and what our final approved project is, uh, that will determine the exact layout and where exactly the buildings will be, which type of uses will have the, the double story on the, the lower side and the, um, and, and the single story on the north side. So there's a lot about the program that can't be decided until we get to a final vote. Um, but each time, you know, Mr. Miller mentioned the shrinking of the building envelope. We've already done that. We've already brought it down. We've already lost several buildings. And so each time you do that, you have to recombinate, re, re look at your um, ultimate plan for the project, what will go there. And um, we, we've we continued to tweak that uh, the last year and, and two months. And it, we're at this point, we're just not prepared to say exactly what will, will be stored there in terms of vehicles because um, the height condition, for example, impacts that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? If not, I think we're ready for a motion. Chair, I'd like to move that we send case, uh, should we start with the amendment? Yes. A1800012 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion by Commissioner Al Turk, second by Commissioner Busby that we send, um, and we, we have two, we'll do them separately. Uh, that we send item Z1800036 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Um, question? You should always um, move the A case first. We did. Okay, we did. I just was making sure. All right. Didn't we? Oh, the we A. Did. 
we did in the motion. Thank you. And that would be item A180012 forward with a favorable recommendation. Um, may we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Morgan? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Busby? No. Chair Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchen? No. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? No. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. Motion uh, fails two to 10. Now the second part. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. If I may, I uh, move case Z18. 0036 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. I heard Busby with the second, Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. Uh, motion by Commissioner Busby and second by Commissioner Bryan that we send item Z18000036 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Um, may we have a roll call vote for this item, please? Commissioner Morgan? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Busby? No. Chair Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchen? No. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Nope. Commissioner Lowe? No. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. Motion fails two to 10. Thank you. Let's move to the next item, um, staff report, uh, Fox Crossing. Okay. We're gonna wait just a few minutes as the audience um, clears out. You might want to take that. Been here quite two hours yet. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. You mean in the back? Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will now be presenting case A180008 and Z180029 Fox Crossing. The applicant is Tim Cyrus with Horvath Associates. The area of the rezoning request is 12.02 acres and the area of the future land use map amendment request is 0.7 acres. The site comprises six parcels and is located along US 70 between Lynn Road and Pleasant Drive. This site is seeking annexation to become located within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning to commercial general with a development plan, CGD, from commercial center with a development plan, CCD, residential suburban-20, RS-20, and residential urban-5, RE-5. The applicant also proposes to change the future land use map designation to commercial from medium density residential and commercial. The medium density residential portion is a small portion um, in the northwest portion of the site. The proposal commits to a maximum of 170 apartment residential units and permitted accessory units. As shown on this aerial map, the site is, is shown in red uh, and located in the urban development tier. The site is adjacent to US 70, where NCDOT plans conversion to a freeway. The site is primarily undeveloped with a mixture of pine and hardwood forests. The site contains streams and wetlands and electric towers and easement. 
These area photos show that the site, uh, the site is located in the Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay District B, and a large portion of the site is adjacent to US 70. Otherwise, the site is primarily located along a narrow unopened right of way to the rear of single family houses that front along Pleasant Drive and Lynn Road. There are also commercial development and places of worship located in the vicinity. The site is presently zoned commercial center with a development plan, CCD, residential suburban, suburban 20, and residential urban five. A large portion of the site falls under a development plan which committed to a commercial shopping center with access onto US Highway 70. The applicant seeks to change the zoning to commercial general with a development plan to allow for 170 apartment residential units. The property is designated medium density residential and commercial on the future land use map as shown here on the map. Uh, the applicant proposes to change this designation in that uh, northwestern portion to commercial. The development plan provides site access points, tree coverage area, the location of building and parking envelopes, stream crossings, riparian buffers, and project, project boundary buffers. Additional commitments include maximum building heights. Key commitments include apartment, residential, and accessory uses, closure of an unopened right of way within the project limits, transportation improvements, and transit improvements. The proposed CGD zoning designation does not comply with the current medium density residential designation on the future land use map. The applicant has requested to change the future land use map in this area to commercial, which would be consistent with the proposed zoning. The proposal is consistent with comprehensive plan policies, including the policies outlined on the PowerPoint. Uh, further detail is provided in the staff report. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances, and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have three individuals who have signed up to, um, to speak, and we'll start with the applicant, Tim Cybers. Thank you, Chair Hyman. Uh, Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates. Uh, thank you to Emily, where she sneak off to, uh, for her work on this project. Um, you guys get uh, get to hear me from, from me uh, one more time tonight, and then I, uh, I'm done for the night, I promise, until next month. Uh, <laughs> okay. the, uh, the request in front of you tonight is for zoning, <clears throat> excuse me, change in the zoning, land use, as well as the annexation. Uh, the zoning is RS20, RU5, and CCD, with a request to change to CGD. The land use is a change of uh, just under three quarters an acre of the site to change to commercial. And 17.62 acres of this land is being proposed in the annexation, uh, which includes right away adjacent to the site. So you notice the project area is actually just 12 acres, but it's a little over 17 acres in the annexation application. <clears throat> the majority of the site is currently zoned commercial center based on the development plan from 1996. That development plan includes just over 96,500 square feet of commercial development, which would entail, potentially could entail, grocery store, drug store, shops, and future out parcel development. It also included access points to Lynn Road, Pleasant Drive, and Miami Boulevard, also known as US 70. It did not accommodate for the current stream buffers, which are shown on our plan today. Uh, this project's located directly adjacent to US 70, Miami Boulevard, the widening project well known as the East End Connector. The widening project, that, sorry, the East End Connector widening project has previously taken land from this project area and will also eliminate the access onto US 70, on the, which is shown on the previous development plan. In addition, the stream buffers and utility easements has eliminated the potential for a commercial center on this property. Furthermore, NCDOT project number U5720 is proposing to convert US 70 from Lynn Road to south, or I'm sorry, to west of TW Alexander and Raleigh to a controlled access freeway. Even though NCDOT currently has this project on hold, there are two development options for that project. The northern option has no impact on this project, on our, our project in front of you tonight, while the southern option does provide us an impact to the development area. We've reviewed both options with NCDOT, and they have re reviewed the development plan that's in front of you tonight, and have agreed to allow this project to move forward with further reviews at site plan. Uh, it's our team's opinion that that northern project will be chosen. However, that decision has not been made by NCDOT yet. The proposed development plan includes rezoning this uh, of this project area to CGD to allow up to 170 residential unit apartments. Apartments will vary in size uh, to provide a mix of units within the apartment development. 
they will average in size, and the average size will exceed 1,000 square foot and include one, two, and three bedroom rental options. Rent forecast in this area uh, will also de will depend on the final market analysis, uh, likely averaging around $1.25 a square foot. So therefore, a 1,000 square foot apartment will cost approximately $1,250 in rent. The site's location and proposed apartment development provide a great transition and is more compatible between the highly used freeway of US 70 directly to the east and the adjacent single family residential homes to the west and southwest. In addition, the earlier mentioned stream buffers and power line easements make this site ideal for apartment development. Develop, the development plan illustrates commitments to right of way dedication, landscape buffers, tree preservation area, 70% maximum impervious area, maximum of 170 units, as well as access points on Lynn Road and Pleasant Drive. Road improvements will be constructed on Pleasant Drive to provide a left turn lane into the development and construct a three lane section towards US 70, as well as providing bike lanes. The developer will also construct a bus stop along Lynn Road um, or Pleasant Drive adjacent to the site if required by Go Durham at the time of site plan. In addition to the development plan comments, uh, excuse me, in addition to the development plan text commitments that are on the, on the development plan, I have a few additional comments, uh, few additional text commitments that planning has already reviewed and, uh, and, and reviewed uh, previous prior to this meeting. Uh, prior to the issuance, uh, number one, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the developer will provide a one-time $18,000 contribution to Durham Public Schools. Number two, Prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, provide a one-time $17,000 contribution to the City of Durham Affordable Housing Fund. There was one other additional text commitment that we worked through with the city, and unfortunately uh, were directed by transportation that we could not include. We did attempt to include an internal bus stop, as I know uh, Commissioner Baker has requested on multiple projects. However, this being a private parking lot, a public bus stop and public access into the private parking lot, transportation told us we were not allowed to do that, which I understand the reasons behind. Uh, the future, la future land use map associated with this development plan is for uh, 0.71 acre portion of the land that connects to Lynn Road. That portion of the development will not, will not contain any apartment units. Uh, we'll have a maximum building height of 20 feet as shown on the development plan as requested by the neighbors at the time of the neighborhood meeting. The neighborhood meeting was held prior to submittal on September 25th, 2018 at Bethesda Baptist Church. Uh, approximately 15 neighbors were in attendance. Uh, there were two primary concerns at that meeting. One, neighbors did not want affordable housing uh, at the back of their houses. Uh, the neighbors felt strong against, the, against this, so we've made a commitment to a donation to help, help fund affordable housing developments in Durham. The second item was an increase in traffic to the area. In comparison to what exists today, this development will increase the traffic area and I've discussed the associated road improvements that will be constructed with this de proposed development. However, when, com when compared to the commercial center that could be constructed without input of the neighbors, without input of this board, without input of the city council, the traffic will be greatly reduced. To certify this, Josh Ranke with Ramey, with Ramey Kempson Associates completed a trip comparison letter that's been reviewed by the city, including transportation department as well as NCDOT. They compared a reasonable 50,000 square foot retail center to the 170 unit complex. They found that the proposed apartment complex anticipates to generate 29 fewer daily trips, excuse me, 2,900, big difference, 2,900 fewer daily trips uh, during a typical 24 hour weekday. Uh, Josh is here tonight if you have additional questions on that specific item. Um, I did, uh, did have the ability to meet with some of you and I appreciate you taking the time uh, to come and meet with me. Uh, um, in closing, I ask that you vote in favor of this rezoning to allow a proposed development of 170 apartment units on a site that is no longer achievable as the current zoned commercial retail center. It will provide a great transition between the surrounding neighborhoods to US 70 and allow an underutilized portion of Durham to be developed as a gateway to our city. I'm available for any questions, and if there is any remaining time, I don't know if that was working, I'd like to uh, reserve that for answers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Josh Ranke. Uh, staff would like to note one item if possible. Yes. Um, the applicant referred to no building being proposed to the west of the, um, the line. Right now the development plan just specifies a maximum building height of 20 feet uh, west of that line. 
So what, um, for clarification, no apartment unit buildings will be north of that line. And if we need to include that on the development plan, I'm willing to do that. But, um, but it's, it's clar clarifying is no apartment building units. We can add that as a text commitment um, in order to, to commit to that. As a, at this time, that's not a commitment made. Uh, we can, I'm willing to make that commitment. That's not a problem if that's okay with staff that we can review that, uh, but I'm, I'm willing to make that commitment. That, that was the intent. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Josh Ranke. Joshua Ranke with Ramey Kemp and Associates, 5808 Farringdon Place, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, Tim kind of stole my thunder. Uh, we did a trip generation letter for this one. It has significantly less trips associated with it than the previously approved development plan and is well under the threshold typically requiring a traffic impact analysis. Um, 2,900 less daily trips was the correct number. I nearly had a heart attack when I heard 29, but um, also far less peak hour trips. I'd love to answer any questions, but I won't take up any of your time. You don't have any questions. Thank you. I do have another individual who has signed up, uh, Wanda Waiters. Good evening, and I thank all of you and the commission for allowing me this opportunity to speak. My name is Wanda Waiters, and I own a property on 518 Pleasant Drive. Um, I did attend the meeting uh, that was held at Bethesda um, Baptist Church last year, and some of those concerns have been included in tonight's presentation the first presentation. Um, I do not want to say that I'm here against, I'm here on a strong request for a pause. There's been a great amount of due diligence in the report and Emily Struthers, I thank you for sending the report for review because the first zoning sign that was placed on Pleasant Drive was for North Carolina Central. I look up all the zoning signs when I see them, I was very, concerned about that and they came and put the appropriate zoning sign there. So it gave me an opportunity to, to review, I think, a 96-page document very quickly for tonight. <clears throat> My first concern is there was one meeting at Bethesda Baptist Church regarding this uh, request. However, the whole area, which is not inclusive in this uh, <coughs> presentation, as far as the um, overlay zoning is the Little Lick Creek. Now, Paul, I can't pronounce his name correctly, Whitkey here with the planning department, and uh, I spoke with the Upper Noose River Association, which said that they had not received any information on that, and again, to request some pause on this particular project this whole area is, is within the Little Lick Creek watershed protection. So I would like to have that more clearly. It states that there are two streams, but it does not state that that is part of the Little Lick Creek watershed plan, and it is, to my understanding. So I think that there needs to be some more extensive review of that uh, and what impact that would have. I did ask that uh, when I sent the email to you, Emily, mm -hmm. it says the Lick Creek, and, and they speak on that, but I want to know the overall impact on the Little Lick Creek watershed. Also, they talked about transportation, and if that transportation um, assessment, Josh, was done uh, within the last two years, then it would not be an accurate representation of Pleasant Drive, because as you know, East End was closed in order to work on the East End connector. What does that mean? It means that you still have some additional time because you. we we have divided the time up for at least I three minutes. I appreciate that. Four, and you were signed up against, so you have all of the time. Okay. Well, the the street, the East End street, has been closed off for traffic. So any traffic. Pleasant Drive has been extremely busy uh, as a result of that street closing for the East End Connector. 
So an assessment of what the appropriate transportation would be in that area is not available now because that is the street that is used in lieu of the fact that the street for normal traffic has been closed for some time. So I'm just asking for some further clarification of what impact um, it would have. Yes, I do have extra time. Um, however, this is a 96 page document. Uh, the meeting at the Bethesda Church, at that time, it was not clear that they would have to have the street coming through Pleasant Drive. Uh, what was stated to me at that time is whatever you'd like to see happen or some type of protective fence in that area uh, was casually acknowledged. Uh, I do not see that on here. Okay. Um, it also states that there are three parcels on Pleasant Drive. However, on the parcel listing, it only states two parcels. So I'd like to know uh, what the clarification in a, is on that because that is 510, 512, um, and 514, 518 is the parcel that I own. And that is prior to the issuance of certificate of occupancy, construct an exclusive eastbound left lane turn lane on Pleasant Drive at site access point number one with adequate storage and appropriate tapers. Um, I'm seeking further clarification on that. Thank you. As far as the transport issue of a bus site, there is currently one on um, Pleasant Drive. And there's also one currently um, at Lynn Road at the corner. So I want to, you to know that those already exist. On the annexing, the policy 2.3b, the efficient provision of services through annexation, um, I'd like the Planning Commission to also take into consideration what is under county jurisdiction and what is under city's jurisdiction at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay. I do not have anyone else who has signed up to speak on this um, issue. If there are other individuals who would like to speak, um, please do so at this time because this is the public comment period and the public hearing. Seeing no other. Yes, you can. Even though I have a feeling you're going to be asked quite a few questions okay. as the applicant for clarification. Thank All you. Right. To, thanks to Mrs. Wade. Um, Josh Ranke again, Raymond Kemp and Associates. So what we did is a trip generation and that is essentially saying here's what the expected site would generate in terms of trips. We then provided a comparison to what was previously approved. It was significantly lower and that's what Tim was referencing where it was 2,900 daily trips lower, um, over 100 peak hour AM trips lower and um, about 140 PM peak hour trips lower. These, this is far below a typical threshold for what NCDOT or the city's development ordinance would require a traffic impact analysis. And that I think is more what was being referenced there where we'd go out and collect data of what's going on out there, project the volumes into the future, run analysis and provide a big overall report. So our trip generation doesn't take into consideration in, like what's going on on the roadway there. This was more for comparing it to what was previously approved and also seeing is this below the threshold for essentially further research, which would be a traffic impact analysis. And since it was well below what was previously approved and well below the typical threshold, we didn't go out and collect the data, which would be impacted with road closures, closures and such. Thank you. Any other thing, questions I can clarify while I'm up here? 
At this particular time, this is the comment period from the audience. Are there any other individuals who would like to comment? Okay, during the comment period, yes. Yes, yeah, a few clarification items, if I may. Okay. Okay. Um, the uh, the site is is in the Little Lick Creek, and uh, further um, further uh, exploration of that will be at site plan stage. Okay. Uh, during the development plan, we simply state that the site is in the uh, Falls Jordan Basin and the impervious areas that are associated with that. Um, so there's more detail at the time of site plan with those items come in play. Um, the concern about um, traffic and what will be connected in the future. The East End connector will have connections um, at Lynn Road and Pleasant Drive. So those connections will, will remain with the, with the development of the East End connector. Um, and to clarify on the bus stop, there are existing bus stops. Um, at the time of site plan, when we go and work with uh, Go Triangle and Go Durham, if there's an existing bus stop that is, for example, maybe it's just a sign and I don't know what's out there today, we may be required to put up a bus shelter or a bench. Um, so we would improve that bus stop if there's a bus stop already there today. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Um, at this time, seeing no other individuals desiring to speak, I'm gonna close the public hearing and um, give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to start to my left. Are there any commissioners who would like to speak at this time? Mm. Yes, you. Uh, Commissioner Baker and then Commissioner Miller. Yeah, <clears throat> I have one question for the applicant, Mr. Sivers. Uh, my question is, uh, is, there a, is there a buffer between um, 70 and any of the development um, envelope between between what, sir? Between where development can occur and uh, seventy. Go seventy. Um, there is a landscape buffer. There are no landscape buffers required because of the uh, width of the right of way. Um, there is the uh, required building setbacks. I'll be through site plans. Okay, that's that was my only question. I think what we're seeing is, of course, um, the outcomes of an automobile-oriented society where everything is broken and we just build for cars and we have to take people's land so that we can... Uh, if you ask NCDOT how many lanes do you need to build, they'll always say one more. Um, and so we're seeing the consequences of that. Um, I think uh, if we want to go in a new direction, uh, we need to start thinking more about how do we create the type of living environment based on form and based on character and focus more on a mix of uses um, and less on separating uses. Uh, the caveat to that is that we should always separate incompatible uses um, whenever that may occur. And I think the best example of two incompatible uses is residential uses and heavy industrial uses where you have a lot of toxins. This site um, is directly adjacent to an industrial use uh, with a lot of uh, toxins emitted. It's, that is US 70. Um, and it also does not include a um, mix of uses. Uh, clearly, uh, it's a challenging site for uh, the developer based on um, the events uh, around US 70. Um, I do have a major concern with putting, uh, with putting um, a large number of people living directly next to uh, a high-speed, high-traffic road like US 70. Um, there is a lot of research about um, breathing in toxins for uh, people who live close to that, to those types of places. Um, we can probably imagine the kinds of people. Uh, who are the people that live? Uh, along busy corridors, high traffic corridors that are allowed. Um, and um, so I, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to bring up a little bit of information. According to the American Lung Association, quote, in January 2010, the Health Effects Institute published a major review of the evidence put together by a panel of expert scientists. The panel looked at over 700 studies from around the world examining the health effects of traffic pollution, they concluded that traffic pollution causes asthma attacks in children and may cause a wide range of other effects, including the onset of childhood asthma, 
impaired lung function, premature death, and death from cardiovascular diseases. Uh, the area most affected, they concluded, was roughly the band within 0.2 to 0.3 miles of highway. Children and teenagers are among the most vulnerable. Keene's College revealed uh, that living within 164 feet of a busy road may increase the risk of lung cancer by 10%, stunt lung growth in children by 3 to 14%. According to the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, uh, University of California, uh, printed environmental research journal in 2019, compared to children living more than a half mile from a major roadway, children living from roughly uh, 164 feet to 0.3 miles from a major roadway were twice as likely to score lower on tests of communication skills compared to those who live farther away from a major roadway. You could go on and on. There are a lot of studies about that. And I think that that's something that we should be thinking about and something that we should be concerned about when we're considering whether to change this from commercial uh, to residential. Um, it's just one thing that I think is important and one thing that I'm certainly thinking about. Uh, there are a variety of other policies in the comprehensive plan that I uh, do not think uh, this is consistent with, but um, the, my main concern is with health, welfare, and safety. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Miller? So I have a question. This is another instance where we're building residential in a non-residential zone. It's certainly allowed, but it's, it's one of those things that's, that you have to jump over a, a counterintuitive hurdle to get to where we're, we're going. But I do want to know, when we build multifamily in uh, GC, what's the height limit? One moment while I look that up. Take your time. So for residential development uh, and non-residential districts, um, and we are in the urban tier here. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, height of Just the Just inside. Yes. Um, let's see. For single family, it's specified as 35, but for all other housing types, it is consistent um, with the RUM district, um, which I can pull up as well to get an actual number for you. Uh, that height would be 55 feet. 55 feet. So, Tim, I have some questions for you. I wish if I had been, had my materials when we met, I would have asked you them. So, overall, our density here is about 14 units an acre, right? 170 against 12 acres. But when I look at the site plan, just guessing, it looks to me like about four, about a third of the acreage is, is not going to be buildable for one reason or another. Uh, so we're down to about eight acres, which runs our practical density up to about 21 units an acre. How are you going to fit 170 apartment units with a 55 foot height limit on such a small area? How is the parking going to be organized? And are these buildings going to be, how tall are the buildings going to have to be in order to get 170 units in there? Uh, Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates. So one clarity, I would urge, urge Emily, and she's shaking her head, yes. the maximum building height, um, I'll let Emily actually answer the question because that's incorrect, the number before. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I need to dig a little bit deeper into the ordinance. Um, so the development plan- You always have to. <laughs> that is true. Uh, the development plan specifies 70, and I'm sure that is taking into account some um, Adjacency that I can't find right now, but Tim may know off the top of his head. Well, it's nice to know that you and I look at the code the same way. <laughs> is it a, what is the height limit, Tim? 70 feet, yes, sir. 70 feet. Okay, with 70 feet, what are these buildings going to look like? So they'll uh, most likely be uh, in 70 feet and get five stories. 
So, so some of them could potentially be a four or five story split, but majority may be a five story building. Um, there'll be buildings and, and, and parking lots uh, developed throughout um, on both sides of the stream buffer. We're showing the stream crossing um, as well as our access point up to Lynn. Of course, the area um, along those residential parcels are, are not gonna have apartment buildings as I mentioned earlier. Right. So they'll, they'll be- uh, But we'll go there. Um, when so you say we'll, that, we'll I'm have, assuming you're talking about some sort of amenity structure. Uh, there could be an amenity structure, right? There could be, uh, most apartment complexes may have a shed, just like these residential units have a shed in their backyard. Um, there'll also be the access point, so there could be the, the, we, the re access point's required, so we need our second point of access, so there'll be a road, the private driveway, if you will, mm -hmm. potentially some additional parking spaces in that area, closer to the apartment complexes. Because my uh, next question was about parking. Is it uh, structured or? With a five-story building, or is it going to be? Uh, no, it'll be it'll be surface parking. So we've done some preliminary layouts, and that's where that uh, maximum number comes in. So, uh, and and uh, staff, please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here. But through the since we are in the urban tier, we're automatically automatically provided a 10% reduction in parking. Uh, that is an ordinance allowance. So that helps with the, the amount of parking. Um, and you know, studies have shown that the two units per acre aren't excuse me, the two parking spaces per unit um, uh, is a little high for what uh, apartments really need. Um, so that 10% reduction allows us to get down the surface parking, but it is designed to be surface parking. Um, the amount of uh, buildings, surface parking, still allows for the tree coverage, uh, which obviously was, is within the stream buffers, uh, but also stormwater controls, um, et cetera, that are required through the site plan stage. So. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, I hope very well, thank you. Okay. Those are just the things that I wanted to know. Uh, and this is for whoever can answer it. Well, Tim, you've looked at it, I, you said you did. So in the new plans for Highway 70 that would be controlled access, uh, if I lived in one of the apartments that's built on this piece of property after this rezoning is approved, and I, and I wanna get out and go, uh, under the the two versions of the Highway 70 plan, will I be have access at Lynn or Pleasant? So, let me pull it up. Or will I have to drive all around to find a way out? Or drive over to Anger? Because this piece of property is a little difficult to, to find in a way so you can look into it. It's, it's behind everything. So um, now, granted, uh, I will put a qualifier on this answer, if I will. I'm looking at a I'm 11 by 17 map this. of the entire East End connector. So my this is my best guess. I will put that. Um, it 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 appears um, that there is there going to be a bridge at Pleasant um, once one of those decisions are made. And again, this could change. DOT could change this in the future. It appears that there's a bridge going to be a bridge crossing Pleasant and connect over to Lynn. Uh, Lynn Road will still have an access, um, and the current plan is that the current US 70, the current design where the pavement is now, will be a service road. So there's still service access to that. Um, th does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. In other and, words, you won't be complete, even though it's right next to 70, you, you won't be cut off. That is correct. 70. And that's all. The only benefit of 70 won't be the, it's the view of it. That's correct. Uh, so, so that also plays into the, the role of why it's, uh, why it has been commercial since 19, uh, 20 years and why, why it hasn't been developed. Um, that previous development plan did have an access point on, onto US 70, which is now uh, not allowed. Not allowed, so right. Not having, not having access to US 70, not having that direct access to a highway quote unquote, eliminates the possibility for a commercial development. Right, thank you. So, uh, my concern here, one, I appreciate Mr. Baker's question, which was my first question is, is where's the buffering uh, against the, the highway? Um, I had not checked uh, to see what the health impacts were going to be. I would just think that I wouldn't want to live right on top of a uh, controlled access freeway. Um, but my concern is here, I drove out there and I looked and I saw essentially uh, residential development that had uh, slowly developed between, gosh, it looked like 19, uh, late 1920s right up through 1980, uh, all around it uh, on kind of standard, uh, kind of country suburban 
uh, lots, and then all of a sudden, in in a on a piece of property which, although it's right on 70, it doesn't access 70. It's going to be behind everything. You're going to have five-story buildings, and to me, that's a compatibility issue, and I don't see that as being consistent uh, with the policies in our comprehensive plan. Now, I also acknowledge that it's currently zoned for a shopping center. Um, and I know that what's being proposed recognizes that it can't be a shopping center and it shouldn't be a shopping center. It shouldn't have been a shopping center a long time ago because uh, Highway 70 was becoming another one of those corridors where it was just an endless driveway connections with um, uses kind of, again, slash and burn commercial development. Uh, so this is a hard one for me. I think 170 apartment units is too many for the site, for so constricted a site. Uh, and given what the neighborhood is like, um, but I acknowledge freely that it is better than what is currently planned and allowed for there. And, and since that's never going to be built, uh, uh, referencing back uh, to what Mr. Johnson was saying in connection with the last case, Maybe we need to step back and say, instead of looking at what's there on the ground and what's proposed, what is actually best mm -hmm. uh, without regard to either of those two things. So I think that's a, it's nice to be reminded that that actually is the question always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, other commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Busby and Commissioner Al Turk, and then I'm that way down. Great. I don't, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to share my thinking and you know, my highest level thinking is I don't think there's an easy item on tonight's agenda. <laughs> just reading through this packet, it came pretty late and every single one of these has tough questions and challenges. So uh, I'm struggling with some of these. I will say on this particular proposal, what I like about this are a lot of the things Commissioner Miller just raised. I voted against the previous proposal for, for a number of reasons, but one big reason is the thing our community needs is additional residential housing. So if we have zoned property for residential housing and we're looking to change it, even with a number of good proffers that we had, we really need to see the benefits and I would like to see more universal agreement from the residents of that area that this is this is a net positive. This is the, the opposite. So we're going from commercial, which I agree with Commissioner Baker's concerns on health, but what's interesting here is that I take a different outcome from your proposition, which is we will have less traffic in this area by moving to residential. And there already are neighbors right there. So I see that as a potential positive. Uh, I don't think this property otherwise, it, it's definitely never gonna be a commercial property given what's gonna happen along that road. But I think providing apartments, while I have concerns about the height and the number of units and can you actually make it all work, I think that's, that's a net positive. That's a net positive for air quality, that's gonna be a net positive for our community to actually provide residential property. Apartments in particular, I think is, is a, a good use. So um, I'm still listening and I appreciate the additional text commitments uh, and, and I hear the concerns of uh, Ms. Waiters as well, but I think this moves us in a better direction and recognizes that what we need in our community is more residential and to have commercial there would just create more traffic and really isn't feasible at this point. So that, that's where I stand. Thank you, Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question for staff. Uh, this relates to the first thing that Commissioner Miller mentioned in his comments, which is that we are, um, the, the, the proposal is to go from, to basically to rezone the future land use map to commercial and this zoning designation to commercial general with a development plan. Uh, but we're talking about apartments, right? And so, yes, in the commercial uh, future land use uh, designation, we are allowed to build apartments. Um, but why, I mean, why not suggest to the applicant or is that up to the applicant to, to uh, propose to move this to medium density residential, like much of what is to the west of this property? It's up to the applicant to make uh, their decision on what they would like to request. Um, staff then reviews it for consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, 
Okay. I don't like those, I think. I have a follow-up question. The, the, can you tell us what the public notice uh, <laughs> looks like? So when someone gets a, a notice in the mail <laughs> that lives nearby, what, what information is on there? Um, do they have, can you just say, yeah, what's, what's the information they get? Sure, so um, two parts to that. The first one would be um, any required uh, by the applicant prior to submitting uh, neighborhood meetings are required um, if there's a change to the future land use map as there was in this case. So prior to submitting the application, the neighbor, um, neighbors would have been invited to a meeting uh, held by the applicant. Um, as far as staff's notification for public hearings such as planning commission and city council, um, it's in, in accordance with state uh, law and statutes. Um, as far as what our process actually looks like, we mail a letter um, to neighbor, um, to property owners within 600 feet that uh, identifies the uh, general information of the request as far as the zoning designation, the date of the meeting, um, who to contact for more information. Um, additionally, planning has a notification tool, uh, an email option um, to, that can be sent to anyone who subscribes to it. Uh, that includes a little bit more information um, and okay. the agenda. So let me ask a more specific question. Is there anything in that zoning notice in this case that would say that there will be, the proposal is for 170 apartments? No, it does not specify the uh, details of the so if I live there, I, I get this notice that it's, it says it's the proposal is to go from medium density residential and commercial to commercial, correct? Yes, uh, for the plum. For the plum. And then it would include the rezoning request uh, as well. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've said this before. I, I don't. I, th I think this is this is a lack of clarity that I I I think kind of muddles the process and kind of um, you know. I, I think residents should be, it should be very clear to them what is being proposed here. And of course they can look it up, but if, if, I, if I'm getting a notice and it says from commercial to commercial with, and the designation is proposed general commercial with a development plan, I'm thinking, oh, there's gonna be a commercial development here. And I'm okay with that, I, I may not go to the meeting. I, I think to me, it's, I understand that it is allowed for you to put apartment units in a commercial designation, but I think we should be encouraging and pushing developers to be more clear in the process from you know the first step up until city council or, or county commissioners. And I, I think that to me is a, is a big mistake. Um, yeah, I, so that's, that's one, one comment. Um, the other, um, I mean, I guess just to follow up on Commissioner Baker's point about the, the buffer, so there is this 150 foot right of way. So could the developer have street trees in this area or any kind of other uh, buffering that would that would help with some of this the noise? And is that allowed? Would that be Which allowed? Which buffer are you referring to? I guess I'm, I'm referring to right on Highway 70. Is that? There is no buffer. Um, I don't know that there's a buffer there, but there is area uh, reserved for. Um, it's loading. Yeah, it's not <laughs> uh, right of way reservation. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So within that, they could they could commit to trees or, or something that would that would provide a buffer. Is that or could they not do that? I would have to um, discuss that one further with uh, someone. <laughs> I guess. I haven't seen that uh, come up before, so I would have to do a little okay. bit more digging to answer that. All right, okay. Um, okay, thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Commissioner mm -hmm. Bryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Al Turk's uh, comments about clarity. I yeah. do not really appreciate putting residential in a commercial general zone. However, uh, I have some questions about the uh, US 70 improvements. And I believe, sir, Mr. Sieber, you mentioned that there were two alternatives being discussed, a northern one and a southern one. Is that correct? For the US 70? For the US 70? The, um, not the East End Connector, but... No, I, I know the US 70. That's correct. And... That, that's what DOT refers them to as the two options. No, I know. I have their maps okay. here. And uh, 
I also believe you indicated that you thought it would might be the northern one that's as correct. the choice. That's that's my opinion. That's not from DOT. That is strictly my opinion. Okay. Uh, there's reasons behind that, but it's. An but I, I, that's fine. That particular option, based on my playing around with these maps for a few hours to where I could finally blow them up and see what was on them, uh, puts a uh, service road right in front of this property. That is correct. Yeah. And that doesn't impact the decision to put apartments there as opposed to commercial. No, the, the plan for that is to take the existing asphalt of US 70 yeah. or the East End Connector, minimize that down to a two lane to a service road. That's correct. Okay. But no, that has, we, we are aware of that. Okay. And I agree with what you say about Pleasant Drive will cross US 70 one way or another. I couldn't tell whether it went under or over. Uh, <laughs> I believe over. I, I, I agree with you on one of them. I wasn't sure about the other. <laughs> uh, but on Lynn Road, as best I could make out, Lynn Road will no longer have any connection to 70. It will have a connection to the service road. To the service road, yes, correct. but not correct. to 70. And I just wanted to be clear about that. That is, that is correct. That's for the ultimate design if that project takes place in the next X number of years. The East End connector development, which is under construction right, now, right. will have the connection directly to US 70. Right, right. Uh, I believe that's all I have. Thank you uh, very much. I, can I answer your other question? Sure. That actually was brought up by a few ones. So um, while we were speaking, we we're actually able to pull up the email that the uh, we sent out to the neighborhood um, for our meeting back in September. And we did clarify that it was actually for a residential development. We didn't necessarily clarify apartments, but it was for uh, residential. So um, that was for our meeting back in September um, of 2018, prior to anything that was submitted. Um, that was so that yes, those are not requirements. We didn't have to say that, but we did clarify that in the letter in the neighborhood meeting letter that we we uh, pro that we provided to the neighbors. Does that answer that question? I think clarifies that. It okay. answers the question. It, it helps. Yes. Um, part part of the other item was um, that I believe um, uh, Commissioner Miller mentioned about the the height. Uh, one thing I wanted to clarify about the adjacent residential development, um, single family developments to the. Let's see, to the east, those uh, those homes, those existing older homes that you mentioned are set up a lot higher in elevation than our site. Uh, so it's, um, you know, when you first when you first think of it, of apartment buildings right next to a single family residential home, you're thinking this. Well, it's not necessarily this. Those apartments um, will be set well below in elevation of those single family homes. So I just wanted to clarify that item. They will, there's still some buffering and they'll still be visible because of the height, but they're not looking straight up at those buildings. Yeah, you're building down, not up. That's correct. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Is it possible for me to respond to the question that was raised? Um, I believe I have an answer. Yes. Thank you. Um, so with regard to the area reserved for right of way, um, while staff's preference would be that nothing that's required be placed in there, um, anything but the building can be placed in that area. Um, our reason for concern would be if there was a casing, uh, taking that uh, anything within that area could be removed, um, but we would allow it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Jones. Thank you again. And thanks again to the project sponsor and the individual who spoke. So I, one, I would just want to make one point based off of uh, comments made by Commissioner Baker, and maybe I'm supporting your argument or I don't know, but when you, you made the uh, point about the environmental and health impacts of the people who live in these high corridor areas where there's residential, I think it's, it's, it was interesting you made that point because when we look at what's being presented, I think it's showing the impact of development and how we're doing it in that we've been informed that the price point for these apartments are gonna be starting around 1250 a month, right? And when we look at the, the median household income in, in Durham, it's just under around $50,000. So when we look at the middle household in Durham, we're saying that this product is gonna take 30% of your pre-tax income. So we're creeping up the socioeconomic ladder in regards to issues that we've always thought about was greatly impacting, you know, people at the bottom 
the lower ends of the socioeconomic ladder. So I just want to make that point in the sense that the decisions we do, we do make is having impacts that are going to metastasize more than just stay concentrated. My, my question to the project sponsor is, I'm curious just to know, like, what was, what was the process that you took to get to the 170 units in regards to the density and your, what make the program or the site works versus say 100 units or 125 units? What, how did you arrive at okay. the 170? Um, uh, and prior to answering that, I want to clarify, the 1,250 is an average across the board. So that's the average price. Some of the single family, um, sorry, some of the single one bedroom units would be a smaller would be a, a smaller rate, where maybe the three bedroom unit is a is a higher cost for rent. But that 1,250 is an average across those three bedrooms. So there will be a, a range of that. Um, and to to answer your question, so when when a, a developer comes to us and looks at a project, we do a research analysis and sketch plans. So there, there's some general design layouts um, based off of GIS information uh, with topo, with property lines. And what we did is actually this developer has worked on projects um, in the area, is doing a project in Raleigh right now. So they have their building footprint. So we took those numbers and actually laid them out on the site, laid out the parking, did a, did a sketch plan design, trash paper, if you will, quick layouts that um, come up with where the buildings are, how much open space, how much tree coverage, how much area we need for stormwater controls, um, and how much parking we need. That is um, on this site, of course, going around the streams, as well as going around that uh, Duke Power um, easement. That Duke Power easement, you can park under it, but you can't place buildings next to it. So we worked through that design and came up, and that's with the building footprint numbers with the building footprints that the developer is currently constructing, we're able to lay those on the site, and that's the number. That's where our number came up from. With, I'm assuming the goal is to get to the maximum amount of units you could get, taking all those other assumptions into. That is that is correct. Most most apartment developers, um, apartment developments are at least really 225 to 250 is typically the low end of an apartment development to really make the numbers work. Mm -hmm. um, this one is below that, primarily because of the constraints on the site that we couldn't, we just couldn't get that much to fit. So we wanted to have, bring a realistic number to you today. All right, thank you. So that's helpful. Uh, and, and the prior comments you made address one of the other issues that I had regarding, I think Commissioner Miller or someone raised regarding just the fact that there's residential on the other side and then we have this so it's kind of like, we don't know what it would look like, but given the topography I'm, I'm hearing, that it necessarily won't be a, a mold, but it, you know. So, so that's in part, part of the reason why I was curious how the 170 comes, just to make sure that it more conforms with the neighborhood versus bring something that makes it look different. You know, there's a tall building when you drive into Durham, you can see it before you even get here, on your rope or something. But you know, I, you know we don't want to keep creating those type of you know, features where it's a landmark, but a landmark probably for the wrong reason in particular neighborhoods. But uh, those are my only comments in regards to thinking through. Uh, I, I'll, I'll finish by saying, again, this is like the last case again. It's like we know what the existing zoning is for. It's not gonna happen. So the question I think for us as a body is, what's the best alternative? And is this it? And if not, you know, how can we get to something that's a compromise that works for what the developer would like to do, but for what Durham is trying to do on, on multiple levels, but in particular with meeting some of the goals and the opportunities and challenges. So I'll keep, I'll plug that. Thank you. Other commissioners would like to speak? If not, well, Commissioner Alto. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick uh, comment on what Commissioner Johnson said about the price point, and I appreciate uh, the applicant kind of giving us a sense of how expensive these will be or how, what the cost uh, will be per month. Um, you also mentioned affordable housing and I, I appreciate the, the commitment to the, the housing fund, but I, I would, you know, I, I think this is uh, an area and where affordable housing units on site would be, in my opinion, preferable to just, you know, committing to the, the, tr the trust fund because you know, first of all, uh, there's public transportation nearby, and I, and I think we should, and I know that the neighbors maybe said something about that. I respectfully disagree with that point of view, but I, you know, I, I think providing some affordable units here would, you know, be a, a positive for the city. Um, 
and even if it's uh, you know a, a few units here and there. So that's uh, and I, and that's notwithstanding some of the comments that Commissioner Baker mentioned about you know the the health impacts of of, of uh, living close to a major corridor like this. Um, but that's just just something I think we should consider when we we think about where affordable housing is going in the city. Um, I think somewhere like this would be you know a good place for that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Um, thank you, Chairwoman. Minute. Just so one comment to that, and, and that's a question that I failed to ask, is that when we say affordable housing, it, it, it's such a broad term. Yeah. There's low-income housing, there's unaffordable housing for workforce, so that's an affordable housing issue. And so when we're talking about affordable housing, I think we get caught up in this larger box in, which, in that we really don't understand who are we actually trying to create affordable housing for. You know, the housing bond will focus on, and, and this is to hopefully pair on to what uh, Commissioner Eric Turk is saying. And so when I heard that the neighbors didn't want affordable housing, what came to my mind was not low income housing, it's there are teachers and firefighters and other people in the city of, in the county of Durham who can't go to the bank and get a $300,000 loan or $250,000 loan for a house or who can't pay $1,250 a month for rent but they need a housing product that works for them. <laughs> They're like caught in the catch net, uh, uh, you know, in, in this little, in that, that area where we're not directly focusing on bringing a product that works for them and their budget. And so th that's why, you know, I make the comments that I'm, when I always ask about price points, because when, we're, when I'm saying affordable housing, I'm not only focusing on the low income, you know, population here in Durham that is critically needed, but there are people, who go to work and earn a, a paycheck, but they can't pay $1,300 a month for an apartment, or they can't pay $300,000 for a house that everyone I meet with, I'm asking, and that's where we're looking to, that's the entry point now for building housing here in Durham. And so I just wanna make that point. So when we hear these, these comments about the need for affordable housing and this distaste for affordable housing in, in particular communities, it's, what are we really saying when we say affordable housing? And so um, I'll put that plug in and with that I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? If not, I'd like to entertain a motion. Chair, I move that we send case A18000008 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Al Turk and second by Commissioner Busby that we send <coughs> item A1800008 Fox Crossing forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. May we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Al Turk? No. Vice Chair Busby? Yes. Chair Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? Yes. Commissioner Baker? No. Nope. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner MacGyver? Yes. Motion passes nine to three. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes. I would like to move that we send case Z1800029 with the three additional committed commitments forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Great. Motion by Commissioner Bryan, second by Commissioner Al Turk that we send item Z1800029 Fox Crossing uh, with uh, appropriate three appropriate proffers forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. May we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner uh, Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? No. Vice Chair Busby? Yes. Chair Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? Yes. Commissioner Baker? No. Nope. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner MacGyver? Yes. Motion passes nine to three. Thank you. 
Uh, moving right along to our next public hearing, Barrington Towns, our staff report, please. Good evening, uh, Emily Struthers again with the planning department. I will now be presenting case A19-00008 and Z19-00023, Farrington Towns. The applicant is Jim Anderson and Jared Edens. Uh, the area of the rezoning request is 3.87 acres. The site comprises two parcels and is located at 419 Old Chapel Hill Road and 4115 Farrington Road. Uh, the site is within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the residential suburban multifam. Let me slow down. Um, the applicant That's proposes fine. to change the zoning to residential urban multifamily with a development plan, RSMD from residential suburban-20, RS-20. The applicant also proposes to change the future land use map designation to low medium density residential from low density residential. The proposal commits to a maximum of 25 multifamily residential units. The site is shown in red and located in the suburban development tier. The site is at the corner of Old Chapel Hill Road and Farrington Road. The site is primarily undeveloped with a mixture of pine and hardwood forest and contains areas of wetlands. The site is located in the Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay District B. The site is adjacent to the Patterson Place Compact Neighborhood Tier, which has recently been adopted into the Compact Suburban Design District. The surrounding area includes a mix of residential uses, including multifamily apartments, condos, townhouses, and single-family houses. A place of worship and school are also located in the vicinity. The site is presently commercial center with a development plan. Is that true? No. Uh, the site is currently RS20, uh, and they propose changing it to RSM. Sorry, I've done a lot of these PowerPoints today. Uh, the applicant seeks to change the zoning to commercial general. Nope. Sorry. Uh, the property is designated low density residential on the future land use map, and the applicant proposes to change this designation to low medium density residential. The development plan provides site access points, tree coverage areas, uh, the location of building and parking envelopes, and project boundary buffers. Key commitments uh, include multifamily residential and accessory uses, a maximum of 25 units, and transportation improvements. The proposed RSMD zoning designation does not comply with the current low density residential designation on the future land use map. For that reason, the applicant has requested a change to the future land use map in this area to low medium density residential, which would be consistent with the proposed zoning. The proposal is consistent with comprehensive plan policies outlined in the PowerPoint and further in the staff report. Uh, staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances and is available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I do have one individual who has signed up to speak. I do want to um, just get clarification. I have a name that has been marked through. So is there a James Evans? Okay, if not, then um, our first Jared Edens, who has um, four, the applicant. And so we'll just start you with 10 minutes. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Appreciate your time this evening. Jared Edens with Edens Land. Uh, I won't take anywhere near 10 minutes. I've uh, okay. been here a while already, I know. Uh, I feel we've got a simple request before you this evening. Uh, as Emily mentioned, we're uh, proposing only 25 units over about four acres. I think it's a fairly straightforward project. Uh, the road widening, roadway improvements are in place at the intersection already, which is convenient. Um, we have one driveway proposed to Old Chapel Hill Road uh, that's been vetted by DOT. They're okay with that location. Um, there's a pond on the side, on the southern part of the site, that will remain uh, untouched. So really, most of your development's gonna be concentrated on, on the northern portion of the property. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting in June of this year, had no attendees, um, no opposition that I'm aware of. And again, I said I'd be quick. I'll be glad to answer questions that you have. Thank you. 
Okay. I do not have any individuals who have signed up to speak, so I'm going to close the public hearing at this time and um, give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'll start with Commissioner Brine and then Commissioner Busby. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one question for the applicant. Uh, what would be the price point for these multifamily residences? And so the short answer would be that I, I don't know for certain. Um, we're proposing townhomes, but you know, often when, when we stand here as developers and, and real estate people, we often don't know the end user when we're here. It's uh, more often than not, we don't know the end user. We don't know the builder. We don't know the architectural specs and things like that. And that's no different with this case tonight. Obviously this area is a, a you know, nice, nicer area and, and uh, I'm sure they'll be priced appropriately, but I don't know the numbers tonight. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Eden, sorry to bring you right back up. So you mentioned in, in our meeting, and you said it here as well, I believe, that the, the bigger pond on the southern, I guess, is that the southwest portion of the site, would be left intact. Yeah. And so on the existing conditions map, it says that it will be removed and so I assume that that should be changed. And then it's not shown on the proposed site improvement plan. So should that also then be shown on that plan as well? I think that's an appropriate change to make before we go to city council, because the intention is definitely to keep that pond there. Great. Uh, that's just a, a typo and I'll have to fire that person tomorrow. <laughs> just kidding, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to say it wasn't me. Right? And then the, the smaller the smaller pond though is also shown that it will be removed and that is the plan. Yeah, that's a small pocket of wetlands that um, it's fairly easy to remove with a nationwide permit from the Corps of Engineers. So that, that pocket will, will be removed but the larger pond will remain. And is the larger pond, will that be the stormwater feature or th there'll be an additional stormwater feature on the site? Correct, yeah, there'll be a district. We're not allowed to use uh, inline jurisdictional features and ponds like that for stormwater treatment. Uh, so we'll have a separate pond outside of this one. So it would be totally just native, untouched. Great, thank you. Okay, are there other commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Baker. A uh, quick question for staff. Um, sorry, come all the way up here just for one question. Um, if they wanted to, uh, if the applicant wanted to uh, rezone to the design district, would they be able to do that? We would have to evaluate that request uh, to determine if we were comfortable expanding uh, the design district um, future land use map uh, compatibility there. Um, I don't know that we have an answer off the bat on that one. Okay, thanks. A uh, quick question for the applicant. Uh, are there any green building elements um, like solar panels, green roofs, recycled materials, anything like that? No, I, I can't make any of those commitments tonight. Okay, that's all. I would, um, I would support uh, a rezoning to uh, the design district and I would uh, encourage and support development that promotes green building. That's all. Thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? If not, I would like to entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I move that <coughs> with regard to case 819-00008, we send it forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. I'll second, but we do with the additional property. Well, that's in the zoning case. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, motion by Commissioner Miller and second by Commissioner Busby that we send item A1900008 Farrington Towns forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Uh, may we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Brine? Yes. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Busby? Yes. Chair Hyman? Yes. 
Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? Yes. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner MacGyver? Yes. Motion passes 11 to one. Thank you. Um, may we have the staff report for- No, no we've got another vote. Oh, that's right. Madam I'm Chair, sorry. I move in connection with case Z1900023 concerning Farrington Towns that we send that forward to the city council with a favorable report, including the additional proffer made tonight. Okay, Commissioner Mello. Second. Second by Commissioner Busby. Sounds like I'm in a real hurry. Um, <laughs> A motion by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Busby, um, that we send item Z1900023 Farrington Towns with the additional three proffers, with the additional one proffer forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Uh, may we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Alturk? Yes. Vice Chair Busby? Yes. Chair Hyman? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Ketchen? Yes. Mr. Santiago? Yes. Mr. Baker? No. Nope. Mr. Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner MacGyver? Yes. Motion passes 11 to 1. Thank you. Now we are ready for the next public hearing Godwin Crossing. Staff report, please. And any sign-ups to speak? Thank you. I'm getting my steps in today. I'm Emily Struthers with the Durham Planning Department. I will be presenting case Z19-00010, Goodwin Crossing. The applicant is Anderson Marlowe and Jared Edens. Uh, the site, uh, let's see, the area of the rezoning request is 75.43 acres. The site comprises two parcels and is located at 1301 and 1312 Goodwin Road. The site is located within the city limits. The applicant proposes to change the zoning to uh, Plan Development Residential 2.167, PDR 2.167, uh, from previous Plan Development Residential 2.310, PDR 2.310. Um, the future land use map designation is low density residential and the proposed rezoning is consistent with this designation. Uh, the proposal commits to a maximum of 149 single family lots. <coughs> The site is shown in red and located in the suburban development tier. The site is located on both sides of Goodwin Road. The site is undeveloped with a mixture of pine and hardwood forests. The site contains streams, wetlands, floodway, floodway fringe, and steep slopes. The site includes Cabin Branch Creek Wildlife Habitat per the Little River Corridor Open Space Plan and Natural Heritage Inventory Program. The site is located in the Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay District B. Single family residences are located in the vicinity as well as a water treatment plant and Duke Energy parcel. The previously approved development plan Z0531 committed to a maximum of 155 single family lots. The legacy development plan included a number of commitments uh, more fully outlined in the staff report and attachments. If the proposed PDR 2.167 rezoning is approved, commitments on the legacy zoning case would no longer be in effect. Properties designated low density residential on the future land use map. The proposed zoning is consistent with this designation. Proposed conditions include that the development plan provides site access points, stream crossings, uh, tree coverage area, and project boundary buffers. A summary of key commitments. Uh, key commitments include single family residential and accessory uses up to 149, a maximum of 90 units without a second access point. 300 foot wildlife protection buffer along Cabin Creek, 50 foot perimeter boundary buffer in some areas, a greenway easement and transportation improvements. Again, more fully outlined in the staff report. Um, let's see, with regard to comprehensive plan policies, the proposed RSMD zoning designation does comply with the current low density residential de designation on the future land use map. Uh, the proposal is consistent with comprehensive plan policies, uh, those outlined on the PowerPoint further in the staff report. 
Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances, and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. I have, I do have one individual who has signed up to speak for and two against. So I'm going to call on the applicant first, Jared Edens. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, good evening. Uh, Jared Edens again with Edens Land. Uh, Thanks, Emily, for your time worked on this project. We worked a little bit longer on this project than the previous case. Um, but the main purpose of the rezoning is really to, what I would say, modernize an existing application. Because we have an application that was approved in 05 that has several conditions on it that maybe in 05 we were talking about those things and that made a little bit of sense. But in 2019 and 20, with current building practices, they don't. So the goal here was to basically make the project better. You know, the, the density we're seeking is there. The use we're seeking is there. You know, those are the main things, you know, density and use. So we have the things we're looking for. It's the other things we're trying to modify to make a better overall project for both us and the neighbors. So I'm just gonna highlight maybe two or three. I know staff did the chart where they compared the, which I thought was very helpful. Um, I'm just gonna talk two or three of those, speak to two or three of those for a moment if I can. Um, Mass grading, there's two commitments on the existing zoning that basically restrict uh, mass grading. And in the early, in late 90s, early 2000s, mass grading was a topic of conversation here. I mean, we were designing multiple projects. I'd say 50-50 projects in the early 2000s were mass graded versus not mass graded. And by not mass graded, it doesn't mean that the lots themselves won't be mass graded also. It just means that the grading has to occur in phases. So per the current plan, we would have to, in the current conditions, we have to go build the road, put all the roads, balance the earthwork for all those roads in those, just in those corridors and make all that work. And then when that's done, then we can go and clear and build houses. But the end result between those conditions and what we're proposing today are the same. It's gonna look exactly the same. The houses are gonna be in exactly the same location. The same number of trees and street trees are gonna be on the property with that proposal versus ours, except when you eliminate the no mass grading restriction and you allow everything to be graded at once, where you can balance all your dirt, earthwork at once and everything. I mean, we're talking about affordable housing. There's, I can't think of anything that would add to cost of housing more than requiring separate construction for roads and homes when you've got homes on parcels that are six and 7,000 square feet in size. You know, no mass grading makes sense for 70 and 80 foot wide lots that are half acres where you can grade the roads and then you can go and selectively clear on each lot and say, well, I, want, I want to keep this tree and that tree and whatnot. Homes that are, you know, this size home on these size of lots, that's just not typically how it's done. So if we eliminate the mass grading provision, it will definitely lower the prices of these homes. I mean, I feel, 100% confident in saying that, uh, that it will definitely lower the price of these, of these houses. Um, another thing I wanna to talk to is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there's some mention about uh, being additional BMPs and impervious yeah. restrictions and things. I did notice in the, the existing condition says that additional BMPs will be added, quote, where space allows, mm -hmm. unquote, which is a commitment to zero additional BMPs because the space doesn't allow it, there's no extra BMP and that condition goes away. So that condition in itself doesn't have a lot of teeth to me as, as far as, it, as I can tell. Uh, the 24% maximum impervious, that's just, again, not consistent with present day practices. You know, modern day BMPs have been you know, modified over the years and, and made better and they can easily handle much higher percent imperviouses. The end result is the same as far as stormwater goes. Durham has the same stormwater goals, whether I have 70% impervious, 50% impervious, or 30% impervious. I've gotta look at my quantity and my quality, and I've gotta meet their thresholds. And whatever it takes for me to get there, that's what I have to do. But arbitrarily maxing the impervious to 24%, again, I don't think that has a net effect change between existing and proposed. And also I wanna talk about neighborhood protections. We had a couple of neighborhood meetings. Um, uh, first one, you know, general presentation, talked about some concerns. I came back with a second one and proposed some additional protections. But you know, as you see, we looked, we looked at all of the perimeter properties and every adjacent parcel that has a home on it that's occupied, we applied a 50 foot undisturbed buffer adjacent to that parcel. 
that's all around the perimeter. So you'll see on the develop on a D2 sheet, you see those little 50 foot undisturbed buffers all around. Everywhere we found an existing home, we tried to add prote protection. That is definitely better than what's existing now. Easily better than what's existing now. Um, so again, those are just three things I wanted to point to. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions. I'd be glad to answer them, but uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. For reasons of the time. I have uh, two individuals who have signed up to speak against um, Ashley Dale and Nancy McMurray. We'll start with Ashley Dale. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. This is my first meeting of this sort. Um, We're happy to my have name you. Is, <laughs> I'm really tired now. Uh, my name is Ashley Dale. I live at 1303 Goodwin Road. Um, I moved to Durham two years ago uh, from Raleigh. I lived in the same house for 20 years in the Mordecai area. Um, I loved it, except when all the development started, it just got way out of control. And it was, I realized it was just the time to leave and I wanted to get someplace where there was more breathing room and that ended up being Northeast Durham. And so far in the last two years, I have absolutely loved it. It's dark. Um, I can hear the coyotes in, in the woods, uh, the deer. Uh, I have probably hundreds and hundreds of frogs that live in the yard and that's just fantastic coming from downtown Raleigh. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that there are no lots at all on Goodwin Road at all that are under 0.43 acres, none. Um, the, uh, the, the, the legacy plan that was proposed, I, I'm not exactly sure a year ago, um, but there are 16 light items in the presentation that was, or the document that was put online, and there were 16 light I line items, and of those 16 light items, the current proposal, 11 of those proposals are less strict than the legacy, 11. Um, one is equal, and so there are only four that are considered uh, improvements. So out of the 16, 11 are the legacy, the legacy proposal had more stringent uh, regulations. So that's one of the things I wanted to point out. Um, my lot is 1.8 acres. The uh, other lot that's adjacent is two acres. The other lot that's adjacent is 12 acres, 14 acres. 1.6 acres, 1.6 acres. Um, when we're talking about a development, especially in some place that's more rural in nature, like Northeast Durham, um, I think we have to be really considerate of how many houses we decide to put in what lot and in what conditions. Um, like I said, I came from Raleigh where the development is just astronomical. Traffic is horrible. Um, I came to get away from that, not to have 150 houses right beside me. Um, even with the 50 foot buffer, I, that's a great idea and it's nothing against um, any development. We need development, but we don't need this kind of um, like mass housing in this one particular area. Uh, nothing else on Goodwin Road supports that kind of development. Um, and I have some really bad dry mouth, I apologize. The other one thing I wanted to mention that uh, doesn't seem to be mentioned much of any place is the cabin that's on the land in question. There's a cabin that was built in the 1800s. Um, and originally this land was a part of the Paul Cameron land and Paul Cameron of course owned uh, the Stagville plantation and uh, owned the Snow Hill land, which he had sold uh, before the Snow Hill plantation took off. And there's a cabin on this land that was a part of the Snow Hill plantation. And it, it's actually called the Snow Hill 
Snow Hill Tenants House, and uh, nobody seems to mention that the house is there, and that at some point, some overseers lived in that house. In um, 36 seconds, back in, I want to say, 2007, maybe, 2006, the Durham Historical Preservation said that the, that house was listed, but it was not protected, and that they thought that it held some extremely valuable archaeological information. And uh, I don't think that we should just plow that over. I think that somebody needs to take a look at that before we make any kind of arrangements on mm. building 150 houses on this land. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Dale. I'm Nancy McMurray. Hi, I'm Nancy McMurray. I live at 1313 Meadston Drive. That's in um, Briardale. That's the adjacent neighborhood. My 90-year-old mother also lives there. She lives at 1316 Briardale Lane, and she did receive a notice. It was only one week ahead of time in the mail. So if you would like to see what's, what's sent to the residents, I can offer that to you. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Groundhog Day, but this is Groundhog's Day to me because I stood here in 2006 before the Planning Commission and asked that this property not be rezoned from rural residential and rural res residential 20 because all the reasons that uh, a neighbor mentioned, this is a rural area. There's no public transportation. There's, uh, it's solid hardwood trees. It just doesn't support this kind of neighborhood. Unfortunately, your predecessors agreed with the developer and did allow this high, high density um, zoning to go in, but the concessions that we're calling legacy were in deference to the individuals that own property there. Um, we have committed great resources to purchase homes in this area, this neighborhood. I've been there since 1994. I still have the original file from 2006. I have the petition signed by all my neighbors, and most of these people are still in this area. There's very low turnover in homes. Um, it just doesn't go with the neighborhood. So as somebody who backs up to it and they have a half acre lot or somebody that has a larger property, they really don't deserve to have the rules changed over and over again. How many times do you set up uh, ordinances and zoning laws and then somebody comes in and wants to change them? I don't hear anybody from the planning department saying it doesn't fit, it's not consistent. We had um, people from Guest Road worrying about a storage facility. Well, a storage facility is necessary because people are putting these tiny little places and people have no place to put their stuff. People on Guest Road, where the storage facility could be going, it should, you know, they're asking for a storage facility, that's zoned residential. That property would be more appropriate for something like this to go in. So I ask you please to not um, negate the legacy because I am part of the legacy and it's very important that we have some rules and that we keep them or we have a little bit of chaos in our society. So thank you for your consideration. And um, a neighbor, Bill Ostag, is still, had signed up, I guess, on a different suit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, William Ostag, I live at 1400 Meadston Drive, and uh, I did sign on the wrong sheet, and I apologize for that. The error was entirely mine. Um, it's going to sound redundant, but um, I've had a great deal of experience in the construction business. I spent 25 years on active duty as a civil engineer corps officer, CB, uh, was responsible for construction and environmental projects, both planning and restoration. Uh, in, in Asia, Europe, and uh, throughout the continental United States. Um, I'm a registered architect. Um, I understand the 
I've had the opportunity to look at a site plan just briefly and in very small scale, so I can't comment in particular on what was uh, discussed earlier and what the proposal is exactly, except to say that yes, mass grading will be required to, to make that site uh, buildable. Um, and when it, after all is, is said and done and the roads are, are put in, you're gonna have lots that are two tenths of an acre, maybe less. And given the nature of the site and the grading that's gonna have to be done and the grades that are gonna have to be maintained, not all of that site will be, not all of those lots will be buildable. So only a, a relatively small or a, a portion of that of each lot will be buildable. And in order to maintain the riparian areas, there's gonna to have to be an awful lot of environmental action taken. It's not as simple as is being portrayed, in my opinion. I don't pretend to be a civil engineer, but I've moved around a lot of dirt. And I think I know what I'm talking about. I'm familiar with the site. As I mentioned before, I run my dog through there on, on occasion. Um, second thing is traffic. And this, this, uh, this also affects the, uh, this is gonna affect, I'm sorry, forgive me. Um, the way that the traffic is portrayed in the report that I read, uh, it, it talks about traffic on Goodwin Road and traffic on Infinity Road. What it doesn't say is that uh, access to the site will also be through the Briardale area, both through Bardak Court and coming up uh, from, from Goodwin Road to uh, uh, via uh, Venturia Road and uh, then onto Shady Lane, and I don't have to go through it, but it, 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 it access is, is via city street uh, or residential streets, not roads, streets. In order to get to uh, in order to get to Infinity Road, that's the shortest way to get to Roxborough Road uh, from that area. Um, because it goes through Briardale, and because the traffic in, along uh, Meadston Drive is very likely to be increased, that poses a problem for me. Right? There are a lot of kids that live in that area, a lot of kids that play in that area. The last thing we need is for the traffic that is gonna, the folks are gonna take that shortcut um, through those residential areas, uh, Briardale and, and Vantage Point in order to get to Infinity Road. Finally, I have to agree with what, uh, with what Nancy said. Um, that's a, it's a rural area. There's a lot of, a lot of land, it's quiet, there's, there's a lot of wildlife. Uh, the last thing we really need in that area is uh, is a, a very high, in, in my opinion, high density uh, housing. They're gonna be small houses on small lots. And I don't think that's consistent with the uh, nature mm -hmm. of that area. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Edens, if, would you like some additional time to respond to, because I, I went over a bit on the, again, so. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, and I appreciate the neighbor's concerns and um, I understand them, honestly. I, I just wanna say, just because a commitment exists doesn't mean it's a good commitment. You know, some commitments that are on here now are, are really not good, I don't think. They're not, they're not in line with what we're trying to do here. Um, another thing I did mention before was, you know, we're dedicating a, a 300 foot wide wildlife corridor along Crab and Creek, undisturbed, that's not on the current plan. 300 feet, I mean, it's, it's like five to 10 acres of my client's area that we've voluntarily said, here, let's preserve this. And it just makes us compact things even more, but that's the goal, see? When you've got seven, like a minimum lot size of 7,000 square feet, that might've made sense in 05 when the homes were 55 feet wide or 60 foot wide or whatever. Homes now are, they're, people are wanting smaller homes and smaller lots, that's the market. I think that's what we want in the city, I think we would like that. Uh, smaller homes and smaller lots don't require 7,000 square foot lots. It just, it's just not sensible. So to me, the more things are compacted in the middle of the site, like which they are, the more we can preserve on the perimeter of the site, which we have. So in, in my opinion, I mean, traffic and things like that, someone can go build 155 homes on here tomorrow. And in this residential market, I don't think it's gonna take a long time for somebody to come along and say, okay, I'll, I'll do the phase construction I'll just make the homes more expensive and do it that way. I mean, 
the ability to develop 155 homes is here now. So we're just, we're actually lowering that by six homes and adding more restrictions to it, in my opinion. So I think it's a better project. Uh, again, I'll answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do not have any other individuals who have signed up to speak. Um, Emily, do you have something for us? Uh, staff would like to clarify about the um, Goodwin Road Log House. Uh, looking at the maps, that's located on uh, lot 17 referenced in the development plan. Um, it's outside of the development plan request. It's uh, one of those lots that's kind of um, surrounded by, but not part of the Goodwin uh, request. So it's not on the subject property? Correct. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sir, um, I'm going to call him to the. Okay. He'll get a chance. We'll give you an opportunity to come to the mic to speak, but speaking off camera, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're being recorded and you really cannot hear. So thank staff, you, Emily. Sure, staff can clarify that uh, we pulled up the, the maps and that's not identified um, on them. What was the map we were referring to? Thank you. State Historic the State Historic Preservation Office maps. Thank you. Uh, that, those maps only identified the one which is located off-site. Thank you. Um, I do not have other individuals to speak during the public hearing. At this time, I'm going to close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to start with Commissioner Brine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one thing I just want to emphasize to the people who spoke in opposition, and I appreciate your point of view, the damage has already been done. This has been rezoned. You can put 155 houses out there now. Mm -hmm. The question is, how will this property be developed? Uh, if we deny this rezoning, you're still going to get houses out there, whether you, you know you like it or not. That's the damage has been done. Uh, would it be possible to get a uh, the slide with the development plan on it put up? I can pull up a. A screen clip of it, but it won't be the entire uh, area. Um, That's that, this is, I think, good enough. Uh, I have a lot of questions for the applicant. Uh, uh, you talked about 7,000 square foot minimum lot size. Is there a minimum lot size that you could commit to? Um, yeah, I think we, we could probably do 5,000 as a minimum. Um, so, I wouldn't want to go lower much more than, I mean, 5,000, I think, is a good number. It's consistent with sort of what we're doing now. Okay, so 5,000 uh, square foot lot size. Another question that was raised in the staff report was the question of an off-site sidewalk, and I would like staff, if they could point out exactly where this sidewalk was supposed to be, the off-site sidewalk. Uh, the, the area that it has, um, let's see, looking at the map that's, that's up there right now, it's the area that's outside of the request, but located in between the request mm -hmm. along that frontage. Oh, and I think you're hitting your, your mute button. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question for you, Mr. Edens. Uh, would you be willing, assuming right away was available, to construct this sidewalk offsite? Yeah. I think that would be... That would make sense. I think we could do that. Again, subject to available right away with the standard language that we use. Okay. And another question, another comparison between the legacy plan and this one is some open space, but I know that the ordinance does require a certain amount of usable open space, which I'm assuming you'll have to provide. Uh, a question also came up about... Uh, disturbing steep slopes, but with the 
uh, 50 foot undisturbed perimeter buffers and the 300 foot uh, wildlife corridor buffer, it looks to me like most of your steep slopes are now in the buffer areas. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's, that's correct. I appreciate you pointing that out because some of the conditions may be more, you know, legacy may be more restrictive, technically speaking. But if you look at, if you look at the overall, overall application, we're protecting the steep slopes more than the existing application because we're undisturbed in those areas. Okay. We have, I think, slightly better transportation improvements. We've got the, the, the buffers. We're getting the trail dedication. Uh, the one thing that, you know, I go back and forth on is the mass grading uh, because I've, I've never been a big fan of mass grading. But I think in this particular instance, whether it's mass graded as Mr. Edens wants to do or not, is going to make a difference in the price of the ultimate product. I think with mass grading, it will be less expensive. I agree with his point on that. Uh, and since we like to talk about affordability of housing up here, I think here's a chance to uh, give in or for me to give in and allow mass grading the swap off being that the final product will be less expensive thank you madam chair thank you are there other commissioners who would like to speak staff would like to uh, make one comment uh, with regards to the off-site sidewalk um, okay. we wouldn't be able to accept that commitment at this time with the um, the subject to part we would like to see the applicant uh, do that due diligence due diligence um, before committing to it so that we know that it is an actual commitment. Okay, thank you. So we can't accept that tonight, but we could uh, work with them. Um. Okay, so sooner or later it can be worked in. Is that what you're saying? Y yes, we can't accept it now, but they, we can revisit it once they've done that due, due diligence. So we don't know if um, having completed that due, due diligence, if they would be able to commit to it or not. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Miller. So this gentleman, I'm sorry, sir, I don't remember your name. Would you come to the mic so Ray. we can get your picture? <laughs> so, I do not have a mugshot. Please state your name again. Please. If you would show the site plan so that he can see it, we can see it, but I would like for him to be able to see it. Okay. Thank you. So looking at that map and realizing that... I was having him state his name again, please. Oh, all right. Ashley Dale, 1303 Goodwin Road. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mr. Dale. Yes. Looking at the map that's now displayed behind us uh, or, and behind you, can you show me where the structure is that you're referring to, the cabin that you talked about that you think is on the subject site? Yeah, so uh, how can I point? The mouse. The, oh, the mouse? So for, yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'll put my glasses. Okay. Can you see the mouse? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Oh, excellent. This is my house right here. Okay. The structure is right here. And. And so, say again what that structure is. That structure is a. What's it called? Snow Hill Tenants House. The Snow Hill Tenants. And tell me what you. How old is that house, do you think? And, and tell me where you've gotten your information. It was estimated uh, sometime 1800s. Um, I, finding information on it was extremely difficult. Um, the only map that I saw that had the correct drawing location was a night, it was from the, the original plat book when the land was owned by Clyde Goodwin, and they did a survey of his land, and uh, my house was not there yet, but that little, you little read cabin some, was there. You read some sort of historical assessment of that somewhere. I have done so much research on this land, it would make your head spin. Yeah, but just, um, just this house? Just this one cabin, yes, sir. So what have you read? Um, I'm trying to discover the, the source of your information. 
So I read the original request for the rezoning, and I'm not sure exactly what year that was, when pictures of the cabin were taken by Nancy. Um, and I actually have those on my phone, but I don't know how to get them to you. It's um, all right. I, what I'm trying to, and, and that's the end of my question for okay. you. What I'm trying to understand is whether or not this is a structure which it falls in the category of resources, which are comprehensive, historical resources, which our comprehensive plan favors protecting. Is this in the county historical inventory? I mean, I know it's probably not a national register site, so it's not showing up on the SHPO site, but I'm talking about the county inventory. So Sarah Young with the planning department, we have, we rely on SHPO um, to have displayed all of our mapped county inventory sites, national register, local, all historic resources are mapped on the SHPO website. That's why we use it because it's our most comprehensive resource. I'm on there now and I've searched for Snow Hill Farm Tenant House. That is mapped, but it is mapped on Snow Hill Road. It is not, according to SHPO, located um, on Goodwin Road. On Goodwin. And of course, the only historic Snow yeah. Hill Road, Snow Hill Farm being eight square miles, probably had a number of tenant houses. <laughs> Since it's, we now call that Trayburn. Uh, <laughs> So we can certainly look into that further. I'm sorry, my device just died literally right now. So, the, um, so I'm really concerned. I don't, if we have a site which is covered by the comprehensive plan that we have neglected to include in our analysis of this rezoning, I'd like to know about it. Smith Planning Department. We will certainly look into that, but we're going to use the same resource that we just pulled up during the meeting, and it does not show another resource that's protected other than the other one that's off-site. So we can certainly look into that. Did you want the case to be continued and we come back to visit you about that, or would you like that looked into between now and council, or what is your... I'm not plan? sure. So let's go at this from, from what we do know. Mm -hmm. Remind me what the comprehensive plan says about Sorry. our policy with regard to historical resources. So normally, um, I can't say it verbatim, but normally in a situation like this, the applicant would provide the resource to be available to be moved or relocated or someone else could take the resource. Um, like Fendel Bevers? Well, I mean, we say something well, and then we knock yeah, it I don't know if you remember the Cornwallis case years ago, there was a house on that property that they had made a text commitment to provide it to be moved and they were even gonna, I think, pay part of the moving fee to, if someone would take it. Right. Um, but that that's the extent that I'm aware of that we can, th that's the extent of our policy. And we would have to verify that it's actually a protected resource before that would even apply. So, yeah. And according to what we just saw, it it, it, is, it does not look like it is, but we could certainly dig a little deeper just to make sure if every, that would make people feel better. Here comes Sarah Young. Yeah from the planning department. <laughs> My device may not have battery, but I still got a little left. Yeah, um, the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> so just to clarify that um, historic resources that are not, uh, they may be inventoried, but are not designated to be protected. Um, essentially, we're in a mode of trying to be proactive with applicants about what they might do with that, with those resources. Um, so that's certainly something that we, you know, can uh, do a little more field investigation and verify, um, and then um, discuss with the applicant what what uh, options they may have. But there's nothing that requires that. Uh, I realize there's nothing that, that requires. I just it's want to a, make sure it's that it's a everyone... policy question. Exactly. In other words, I would be because this is this is something that really matters to me. Uh, I would be more inclined to vote in favor of a rezoning that protected historic resource. Uh, at the developer's option than one that, that doesn't. I realize that, that we don't have a rule that requires them to protect everything, but we do have a policy in favor of, of that. Uh, my problem is, is I, I failed to notice this house when I went out there, so. And of course, I can't always tell where the property lines are, and this is, this is <coughs> like several of our cases this time, odd-shaped pieces of property. Uh, thank you.
for coming to, for drawing it to our attention. I'm not sure what my response is yet, but I'll be thinking about it. Um, I can see the house on, on the, uh, the GIS pictures, the 2000, about the 2007, um, back in 2007, you can actually see that there's a little road right there. And you can, you can see the house, it's got a tin roof, but you can't see it, it's, it's covered after 2007, the pictures, you can't really see it. Can't see it in the aerial that's provided to me, and, and uh, anyway, um, thank you, thank you for, for that. Thank you. Um, Jared, we got an old house on this piece of property. Yes, we uh, What can we do to protect? Maybe we haven't, I mean, I mean, I'm, I I'm not sure I agree that we have. But if we do, an old what house can we on do the to property? Yeah, because um, historic by whose measure? I mean, I, I, we're just sort of assuming it's historic just because. Uh, we're right? just assuming that. Uh, assuming I mean, my understanding, my, my client bought the property in about 10 years ago, and he's aware of it. But my understanding is that the roof is basically the thing is dilapidated, collapsed. I mean, I don't know what there is to move. Well, and I don't know either. Uh, I mean, honestly, you're, you're, at this point, you're not proffering, uh, you're not coming up and saying, oh, yeah, I know what house that is. We can shift this over here and make it the community center. I don't think that would be a wise, I just don't think there's much to move. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank That's you. all I have, ma'am. Okay, Thank you. are there other commissioners who would like to speak? Okay, Commissioner Baker and then... I think Commissioner uh, Brian often brings up um, uh, wise statements such as the damage has already been done, and I wonder how often uh, when cases come before us, we might be doing that very damage as well. I think in general, um, this specific application is actually going in the right direction when it comes to uh, reducing lot, uh, minimum lot um, minimum lot requirements, getting rid of the setback requirements. I think that that goes in the right direction. Um, I think that uh, in particular, combined with the wildlife protection buffer, um, that's important. Uh, one policy in uh, the Durham Comprehensive Plan that I'm looking at is, um, this is in the suburban tier, right? Uh, policy 222C, suburban tier conservation subdivision, <clears throat> promote the use of conservation subdivision provisions in the suburban tier, especially where conservation by design methods would protect environmentally sensitive lands, preserve historic and archeological sites, uh, protect scenic views and conserve prime agricultural lands while encouraging more efficient use of the land and permitting up to one third increase in the density for projects that utilize these provisions. I dream of uh, following uh, many other policies in the comprehensive plan um, and I look forward to uh, maybe maybe with the new comp plan we will we will do that. That's all. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bryan. Uh, thank you. Um, I was looking at the development plan from the legacy case and reading as fast as I can uh, the small print with my poor eyes. I see no mention of this historic structure. Uh, in in that plan, either, and that was 2005. But if you look at the attachment to the aerial view that came with this particular case, at the piece of property the gentleman pointed to, it looks like there might be a building there, but I can't tell you anything about the condition of that building. Thank you. They're debating. I think they found something. So, um, let, let's see what Mr. Miller has to share. Is it his house? Uh, Mr. Miller, we were asking if you had something to report back to us on the structure. We okay. just, we just the old maps covered the same ground again. All right. Well, it looks like that's enough. Yes, um, Mr. Eden would like to offer. This might clarify something. I mean, it's my understanding that the whatever structure would, whatever it is, is close to the parcel line. I know it's very close to our property line. We have a 50-foot undisturbed buffer proposed 
in that area. So anything inside that 50 feet is not gonna be touched. So whatever's there now will stay there. Thank you. And that's a committed element uh, on the plan. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sarah Young. So one quick thing that I wanted to add um, is that had this been identified as a historic resource at the time originally when we reviewed the plan, and we just identified that the plan has teeny tiny little rectangle that's hidden among all the other stuff, so it's um, almost impossible to see. But had it been identified to us, we would have reviewed it against the one applicable policy from element five, the historic preservation element of the comp plan, which says, um, historic resources and compatible development. Promote new development that is compatible with significant historic resources by addressing impacts through the development review process. So the question to us would have been, is this a significant resource? Um, so that's kind of what our assessment would have been. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, are there other commissioners who would like to speak? Yes, Commissioner Alpert. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a question for transportation. Um, so uh, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission, you know, we, they often ask for offsite improvements uh, like this sidewalk. Um, and, but the, the city's transportation department, you don't always <coughs> also request that. Can you say why you did in this particular case? Because- I'm oh, sorry, can you repeat the question? So um, attachment nine, BPAC, they, they asked for a, the sidewalk, the offsite sidewalk improvement. In, in this particular case, you also requested that, right? You asked the- Correct. In other cases, so I think two cases ago, uh, I can't remember which case that we had earlier tonight, BPAC also asked for this, but you didn't also, you didn't request it. I'm, so I'm curious, why did you request from the applicant uh, the sidewalk improvement in this particular case? Is there something about it? So Erlene Thomas, Transportation. Um, we specifically requested the proffer to avoid, um, to basically fill in a gap that okay. would exist in the sidewalk system. Um, sometimes that's not the case of a gap, it's just off-site um, sidewalk that is being requested. I guess I, I think BPAC usually also asks for that when they're, they, they think there's a gap. But So is it because the gap is between two parts of the same prop of, the, of this property and not a gap between this yes. property and a intersection. Yes, is that, that is correct. that why you requested because, it? And, okay. Yes, this site will be required to construct sidewalk along their frontage, which will right. leave a gap okay. in the sidewalk. And so that's why you requested in this case and yes. not others. Okay, thank you, that's that's helpful. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad that you're, uh, Jared, that you're wanting to make this commitment, you know, subject to right away. Um, I, I was on the fence about this case, but I, I think I've been convinced by Commissioner Bryan that there are a number of things about this that are probably maybe better than the legacy uh, case. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right, are there other commissioners who would like to speak? If not, I think we're ready to entertain a motion. Chair, I move that we send case Z19000104 to the City Council with a with a favorable recommendation. Second. I'll, I'll second uh, with, the, with the provision of the one committed element that was accepted. Okay, uh, motion by Commissioner, question? Actually, I do. Uh, although the staff can't accept the sidewalk in uh, if there's right of way commitment, uh, we're not making a final decision. We're making, we're giving advice to the council. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd like to go ahead and include that in there as a condition of our favorable recommendation. I agree. I'm in my second. <laughs> okay, I can I can revise it to, to make that sub, yeah. So the maker of the motion, if you would revise it. Yeah, so I, I move that we send case Z19000010 forward to the city council with, with a favorable recommendation subject to the applicant making a commitment to sidewalk improvements. If the right if of way it, is available. If the right of way is available. Okay. Plus the one commitment that they've already, the additional commitment they made tonight uh, for the uh, minimum, minimum uh, lot size. 
a 5,000 square feet. Second. There we go. Motion by Commissioner L. Turk, a second by Commissioner Bryan, that we send item number Z19 00010 Godwin Crossing forward with a favorable recognition, uh, recommendation subject to the inclusion of sidewalk provisions, subject to the inclusion of one proper as identified. All in favor of this motion, roll call, please. Commissioner Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner L. Turk. Yes. Vice Chair Busby. Yes. Chair Hyman. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Ketchen. Yes. Commissioner Santiago. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Lowe. Yes. And Commissioner MacGyver. Yes. Motion passes 12 to zero. Thank you. Moving right along. We have arrived at Glen Road Townhomes, which was continued from November 12, 2019 meeting. Minimum lot time. Minimum lot time. Yeah, that was it. Square foot. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z190018. This is the continuation of the Glen Road uh, townhome uh, application subject to the November 11th, 2019 Planning Commission hearing. The applicant has offered um, the following text commitments which are listed on the slide. Uh, staff has reviewed these text commitments and found them to be legal and enforceable. I'm just gonna read them into um, the record. A minimum of 25% of the townhouse, uh, townhouses shall be alley loaded. Again, a minimum of 25% uh, of the townhouses shall be alley loaded. The development shall have a maximum block length of 800 feet. All townhouse units shall have a habitable heated square footage that will not exceed 1,700 square feet. Prior to the first certificate of occupancy, the developer shall contribute 41,850 um, to the City of Durham Affordable Housing Fund. Prior to the first certificate of occupancy, the developer shall contribute 4,500 to the Durham County Public School System. Um, in addition to these uh, text commitments, the applicant had also shifted the northern access point to the east, which was shown on um, attachment five. Uh, again, staff has determined that uh, this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all policies and ordinances, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. I have two individuals who have signed up to speak for and three against. The first one is the applicant, Fahadi Maticia. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Bahati Mutissia uh, with Parker Poe Adams and Bernstein at 301 Fable Street, here representing the applicant, um, Ashton Woods, uh, who will be the developer, and Bob Mishler um, is here with Ashton Woods, and we also have our site planner, Charlie Oakley. Um, I believe Charlie's the other person that's signed up to speak, so yes. I will 
I will speak and he, he and I will tag team and handle questions, if that's okay. Um, so yeah, as Jamie mentioned, and thank you very much for that um, great summary, um, we were here before you all on November 12th um, and continued to today's date. We took under consideration many of your comments, all of your comments, as well as comments from some of the neighbors. We evaluated those comments and, and to, to determine how we can incorporate them into the development at this time, if possible. Um, we added those additional proffers in response to some of those comments. And for some of the comments, we realized that while we would like to accompany or, or accommodate some of those requests into the development, we either realized that we were not able to or we're just not able to commit to those particular requests at this time, given this early stage. But we do think that the additional proffers um, help to provide a bit more clarity of what the development will look like for the community um, and ultimately um, for the commission as well. So I will just go through an overview and then we'll also go briefly so that we can then open it up for questions. But as you know, we're requesting to rezone from RR to a PDR with a max density of 7.046 units per acre. Um, and this is a particular development um, that is between um, residential community and the commercial node and I-85 to the south. And looking at the zoning map, we believe that placing PDR on this particular site will provide a nice transition between those homes and the commercial node and I-85 to the south. And as you know, the site itself is designated as modern density residential, moderate density residential in the flume, which um, requires a, a, a density of between six to eight units per acre. Um, and we were advised early on in this process that we should maintain um, the flume as it is and keep the density on the site as MDR. And so that's how we have arrived to a townhome development. Um, but going into the different comments and how we arrived at the different additional proffers, one of the uh, many comments that were made is that the, there was a preference for a mix of single family and townhome units in the development. As I mentioned previously, we initially wanted to do all single family and then we considered doing a mix, but we had to keep within that six to eight um, units per acre density on, on the flume. As I mentioned, staff advised us that it would be um, more appropriate for that, given that the flume um, calls for a, a higher density in this area. Um, but looking at the different ways that we played around with the site plan, we were not able to incorporate single family into the development and stay within that six to eight unit um, density on the, in the flume. So, but one of the reasons that we were asked to incorporate single family is for variety. Can we have some variety and some, some difference within the, within the development? So we decided to incorporate that by adding a proffer that a minimum of 25% of the units shall be alley loaded. And alley loaded means that the access and the garage would be located in the back of the house. And that means that the, the unit itself will be brought towards the front and so that as you're driving down the street or walking down the street, you're not gonna see the same frontage on every single unit. There will be some variety in that way. Um, so we're committing to at least a minimum of 25% of those units being alley loaded. Um, that will also provide some variety in unit sizes because um, alley loaded are typically larger than front loaded units. Um, there was a comment that it would be helpful to make the development more walkable for the residents. For that reason, we added the proffer that there will be maximum block length of 800 feet. Um, there was also comments about uh, making the development affordable or some type of concrete um, commitment to making the development an affordable development. Um, to address that, we have added the proffer that all units will have a maximum heated habitable square footage of 1,700 square feet. Um, and we spoke with, and we believe that that would yield um, units that would be around the, the, the low 200,000s, that would be the price point. And I believe I mentioned this before, but we did confirm with the city's um, um, the uh, community development department that the, that pr a price point of 230,000 would make the units affordable to those who make 80% or below of the AMI in this area. So we are place, making sure that the development itself, all of them would be at least affordable to people making that much. Um, but we do hope to have the units be um, varied in sizes, but they will not go above the 1700 square footage. So that will keep the development generally affordable for, for this community. Um, and then of course we are making the contribution to the Durham Affordable Housing Fund. And then the fourth, um, uh, one of the other comments that were raised was a concern about student capacity or the school capacity in the area, Glen Elementary being over capacity um, or at, at its maximum capacity currently. Um, so we are contributing $4,500 to, to the school system. Townhomes generally yield a smaller um, student yield than single family homes do. And in this case, our student yield is only nine students. So um, we, we, are, we are aware of that and we are making a contribution to address that. 
And so the, the next slide, I just wanna provide a summary of all the commitments so that we have them all listed out there. As a reminder, looking at this picture here, as um, Jamie noted, we did move the access, the northern access point away from the neighbor's property. So it's been moved further east, I believe it would be if it was oriented um, properly. Um, so the total that list of commitments includes 279 townhome units as a max. Maximum impervious surface area will not exceed 70%. Um, we are de dedicating additional right-of-way for the Glen School Road realignment. We will be providing an exclusive eastbound left turn lane along Glen School Road at the site access three, which will help with um, traffic that's going along Glen School Road. We are um, providing an, a minimum of five feet of additional asphalt for a bike lane along Glen School Road. And then of course the new proffers that we've added, 25% of the units will be alley loaded, maximum block length of 800 feet, maximum unit size of 1,700 square, square feet, and then the two proffers, um, the two proffers are contributing the, the donations to the Affordable Housing Fund and the school um, system. And then I also wanted to point out again, we will be meeting the 20% TCA requirement and the 17% open space requirement. So 37% of the site will be preserved and, un, and not developed. So that kind of goes into the reason why we had to consider if we're gonna be keeping within that six to eight density, um, six to eight units per acre density for the um, MDR flume designation, we have to consider what's gonna be preserved. And if you look at this picture here, that is a, there's a large pond there that will be preserved and that we will be cleaning up that area around it so it can, be, can, it can serve as somewhat of an amenity for the residents and of course the stream buffers there that we'll be pre preserving also. Um, and of course, just going into the criteria that will be measured against compatibility with, surround, with, with nearby properties. Again, I talked about the transition between the residents um, up to the north and the commercial node and I-85 to the south. Um, suitability for the project. This townhome development is suitable for this particular site. It is meeting a specific housing demand in Durham. And um, as, staff, as the staff report noted um, in attachments six and eight, the existing infrastructure um, are, do exist to support this particular development. And then of course, as staff mentioned, the particular um, comprehensive plan policies of this, that this development is consistent with. And of course, it is consistent with the flume map designation as well. Um, so I will just reserve the rest of my time for, to answer any questions. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Charlie um, Yokely, who was tag teaming with you. If you, okay, very good, thank you. Then um, we'll move to those individuals who've signed up to speak against. I have three individuals, um, jo Joey Sherrill, Rodney Porter, and Joni Brown. And um, <coughs> looks like we have three and a half minutes each, three and a half. First of all, I would like to thank the commissioners for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, my name is Joey Sherrill, and I reside at 2805 Darrow Road. That's the community just north of where th this development is gonna be. I've been there for over 20 years, and over the time I've seen the tra um, traffic um, increase tremendously out there. It's a rural road, and I think with this development being built, it's gonna put a, a lot, of, lot more traffic out there. Um, I'm more or less against this. I would rather see um, single family residential um, houses out there compatible and suitable for the area rather than townhouses. So I'm against um, this project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rodney Porter. Hello and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, not absolutely against it, but what I'm seeing more and more frequently occur, particularly in Northeast Durham, is that we're trying to cram a lot of housing up there simply because there isn't anything there. Well, that's a fairly good reason to put something there, but there's no infrastructure, there's no transportation. For instance, the subdivision I live in, there's a sidewalk that we put in because we had to, to build the subdivision, but it's not connected 
to anything on either end. So it's a bit foolish. And if you have these townhouses that are built, beautiful, you put a sidewalk in front of it, what's it connecting to? There's no bus service out there. There's no, there's no grocery stores out there. There's nothing decent to get to. And there's no uh, provision to get us into the city. So when you're considering these things, also consider the cost of what the city is going to have to do to truly make that part of the city of Durham. Because I don't see anyone that's living out there that's going to be able to do anything except drive. And that is inconsistent with Durham's uh, projection of trying to have affordable housing because everyone doesn't have a car. And if you're, if you're on the low end of the income spectrum, you have a higher chance of not owning a car. Owning a car is expensive. You have insurance, you have maintenance. Now you're going to offset the housing, the affordable housing, by building these structures, but it, something doesn't mesh. It doesn't reconcile in my mind. So um, I just ask you to bear these required city services in mind as we expand and we try to fulfill that obligation of affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Joni Brown. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Joni Brown. I live at 3822 Alameda Street, same community where um, Joey lives and a couple of houses down. So I've lived there about, I think it's been about 33 years, somewhere like that. Moved out there because um, I wanted property for my kids to grow up and be able to play. We're sports oriented. Um, didn't want houses on top of me. Uh, wanted some land. And um, I was disappointed to find out, I'm not against developing that, that area that used to be a tobacco field, um, but I'm disappointed that it's going to be townhomes. Um, it doesn't jive with the rest of the area there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, we don't even have a park out in our area. So the land was really important that my kids had a place to play baseball in the backyard and play soccer. Um, and now I, hear that they're putting townhomes up, which means pavement. And um, so I'm disappointed about that. And I, I just really wish you would reconsider. I mean, I moved to the county for the reason of not being on top of people. And um, so that's the main thing. The other thing is, is been mentioned by the others, the schools. Um, the roads, <laughs> I mean, it's a two-lane road. Glen Road is two-lane. Glen School, School Road is two-lane. I hope there are plans to, to widen those if we're going to put this many housing units in there. And I don't understand why there's a minimum, uh, what, what was it that she used, um, six to eight units I don't know where that came from. I, I'm not a, I haven't looked at the plan or anything like that, but uh, why that particular property has to have so many units per acreage or whatever. Um, I don't understand where that came from and why it's, it is that. <laughs> so anyway, that's all. Thank you. I, yes. Since you had reserved some time, so um, I think it was three minutes left. Yes, if I if I could just to address some of the comments that were made. Yes. Um, so first, I think I misspoke when I said six to 
eight, it's the MDR is six to 12 units per acre. So I wanted to make sure I corrected my statement there. And then of course, we're proposing a PDR at 7.046 units per acre, which is closer to that range, to the bottom half, the bottom part of that range. We're not going all the way up to 12, we're going much closer to the six, but we're at 7.046 and the MDR allows six to 12 units per acre. Um, I wanted to, to touch on traffic um, at, at this time, we have spoken with transportation and um, the TIA has not required for this development, so it's not as significantly large of a development that would require a TIA. Um, but also, we have complied with all of the transportation, all the recommendations or requirements from transportation at, at this time. And if transportation comes back at site plan and requires additional road improvements, we would be happy to address those at that time. So it's, it's not... Um, it's not the end of the conversation uh, regarding those with transportation department. Um, going to the, the, t the housing type, um, townhomes are generally a more affordable product than single family homes. Townhomes um, yield less traffic than single family homes. Um, I believe the, the stat is that it, townhomes yield a, a half a trip compared to a full trip um, that single family um, homes produce. Um, and of course, townhomes also yield a smaller number of, of students. So I think that um, I understand that the, the neighbors um, want something that looks like what they have on their properties. Um, but when we consider Durham's need for more housing and placing a development here that would meet that need um, without having as great of adverse impacts as we possibly could be having, I think townhomes meet um, that goal. And I think that's all of, oh, and I also wanted to touch on um, the point about bus service. Um, so there was a comment made that there's no bus service here and that there are no um, preferable commercial uses in the area. So there is a commercial note to the south with a super Walmart, a Verizon store, a GameStop, and other restaurants. I um, mean, we have heard comments from neighbors that they are not, um, they would prefer to see something better there. Um, and I think that as more development grows in an area, more commercial uses will come. Um, and as, as far as the bus service, there's no bus service in this area currently, but we did speak with staff and the city will be constantly looking and evaluating whether or not bus service should be brought to this area. And I think having more units in this area would help with that. Um, but until then, we have recognized that there is enough space along Glen Road in order for us to dedicate an easement for a bus stop. Um, but at this time, that, that would have to be evaluated at site plan, whether or not um, a bus service would be brought to that area. And if it is at that time when the city does decide that, then the, um, the owner of the property would be able to dedicate an easement to, to have that service built there. But that would be something that would be decided later. Um, and having more units in that area would help with that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do not have other individuals who have signed up to speak. So I'm going to close the public hearing and give the commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to start to my right, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairwoman. So um, I won't get into the whole design elements because I'm sure that'll come up as we go down the line. So the point I wanna raise is, is I think the challenge that we're faced with as a commission. So the future land use map has this area of Durham and this particular site as being more dense. In an area of Durham that has been known to be less dense. So the question that I find myself as I've reviewed this and re-reviewed it and trying to come to some, trying to rationalize with myself which way I could go to sleep and feel comfortable with, but it keeps I keep coming back to the question of what is the road map that Durham is trying to, to go? So we're undergoing a revision of the comp plan. I don't know if this area of Durham will continue to be envisioned as becoming more dense to this level. So to answer the question to the, 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 the individual who asked, well, where did the six to, it came from the future land use map. It's, it, the developer is creating a product with that being the road map. Your concerns are based on what's existing today and that there's existing neighborhoods that is not compatible with what the future land use map is saying that Durham will be supposedly be moving towards. And so without knowing when we get that final road map in two, three years, whenever it comes, how, do, how can we be comfortable with bringing something to this community that is 
going to look differently, even not from a height or whatnot, but it's you go from single families to you're gonna have a compact little community that's gonna be visible and noticeable and it's gonna put uh, more traffic on the roads. And the reality is, is the people who are, who are going to buy this more affordable product, they're likely gonna own a car because they're gonna choose to live in this part of Durham and you wouldn't move to this part of Durham knowing that you're gonna have to trans to travel to get to the grocery store, to go get your hair cut. To, it's gonna put more cars on the road. And, and so it's, I feel like having lived in Atlanta, it's like what we're ch challenged with doing is exactly what created the Atlanta sprawl. It's like we built houses and then we said, oh, we gotta figure out the transportation infrastructure. So my thing is, I'm struggling with this because is it, it, it's like build it and the infrastructure will come, but we don't even know how we're gonna fund the current capital improvement plans here in Durham. So the, the concerns from the existing neighbors are warranted, and at the same time, the developer is trying to request something based on what the city is saying is right now, it's a roadmap for the city. And so I, I don't have an answer right now, but I put that on the table to see what the subsequent feedback and co comments are, but I've struggled with this, so. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this may or may not help my colleague here. Uh, one of the problems I have with this area is that I think there have been a whole bunch of mistakes made on the flume. The uh, medium density residential, six to 12 dwelling units per acre, is one that can be used in the suburban tier and in the urban tier. And I question whether it was really wise to put it in the suburban tier at a point that is so far removed from the urban area. So uh, part of my answer is I think this is wrong. I don't think it should be there. I think it should be something different. Uh, there is shopping. Uh, at the Walmart Center and the surrounding stores, but they're over on the other side of I-85, you're gonna have to drive to get there. Uh, the, I think the applicant made a mistake in not recognizing that this uh, flume designation would lead to such a what I consider a really gross incompatibility between the uh, density of seven units per acre up against RR. To me, that just doesn't fly. You've got that to the north, you've got it to the west, and based on the buildings down here and what's on the flume industrial, uh, you've got it a little bit to the south. Uh, I think had you tried to get a lower density flume designation, then you could have easily done some of the things that have been suggested, which is maybe put single family homes adjacent to single family homes, and maybe put a few townhomes somewhere in the middle where they're not really up against RR development. So uh, I, I think, you know, that was an error on your part. I also think as far as transportation is concerned, uh, a mistake was made probably by NCDOT, who does occasionally make a few of them, in not requiring turn lanes on the entrances off of Glen Road. Because potentially, if you look at your three entrances uh, and assume that they all handle about the same volume of traffic, you're putting about 900 additional cars, additional trips per day on this rural road, which I don't think is designed to handle it. And without having turn lanes there, I think you are not helping the health, safety, and welfare of the people of this area. I think you're putting it in jeopardy. Uh, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Are other commissioners would like to speak? Okay. Okay. Commissioner Baker and then Commissioner Miller. 
Yeah, I think um, going back to something that Commissioner Busby said at the beginning of this meeting, we have a lot of very challenging cases tonight in particular. Um, you know, this is just our, we're just reacting to two kind of suboptimal options every time something comes to us. Um, and I, and I, I, I do feel, I do feel for uh, my commissioners at the end who are trying to rationalize using the existing future land use map. You're gonna get a headache trying to do that. Uh, there's arbitrary and capricious is built into this map. So, uh, you know, uh, the need for this fu new future land use map and the new comprehensive plan is great. And I hope that coming with that will also be criteria and or a growth related map so that they're both layered on top of one another. This is something that we talked about previously so that we can have a list of criteria that says this is when you grow your future land use map or place type map or whatever it ends up being called will say this is wh what you grow as. This is what the development looks like. And so we do have a site uh, that is on the outskirts of the city. And you know, if we look at it today, should it develop today? No, no, absolutely, absolutely not. It doesn't make sense to develop this property today. But, uh, but it is uh, currently uh, under the current future land use map sort of labeled as this higher, higher, densi higher density property. One thing I wanna say about this is, um, and this is a message to the development community, is that uh, this developer did respond to a lot of really important things that have been stated by uh, the Planning Commission um, more than any other develop, more than any other development that I have seen come before us. Um, now, I also think that there are a lot of best practices that weren't necessarily followed. Uh, so I just wanna run down a list of best practices, sort of having the compact, dense, integrated variety of housing types. Um, this development proposes one housing type. Um, Having connected streets with short walkable blocks, preferably 600 feet long, and this does actually have uh, a commitment for um, 800 foot long blocks. Uh, having sidewalks and street trees, having a variety of accessible appropriate uses, this only has one use. Having a centralized public civic open space, I didn't see anything about that. Uh, protection and access to green space, connection to anticipated uh, future bus transit, which is something that we that's something where the connectivity comes in. And you know, if we look at if we look at this map, if you look, if you pick up whatever you've got on your desk and you look underneath it and you look at the map of Durham and you look at the street connectivity, you know, just south of 85, you know, in this triangle area here to the west of 70, uh, to the uh, uh, east of 15501, you can see that pattern. You can see the difference in the pattern in these pre-World War II neighborhoods versus you look further south, if you look further east, north, everything around that is uh, disconnected, low density, doesn't, will never support transit very well. It'll never get us to um, kind of the direction that we wanna get to. So some of the things, the 25% uh, alleys, the uh, 800 foot block length, these are very, very laudable. It, I'm going to emphasize that in my, uh, in my comments to uh, city council just how important that is. Um, and again, and I keep saying this, I just wanna stress it. I do think that it's important that uh, we adopt those as standards, not just because it's gonna provide um, improvements for the community at large, uh, but also because it will eventually provide a uh, less volatile and uh, uh, a less volatile and more predictable process for developers who are coming before us and are saying, why are you guys coming out uh, with all of these commitments for us? So um, the, my one issue, my the biggest issue that I have with this development is related to policy 231A, contiguous development, support orderly development patterns that take advantage of existing urban services and avoid insofar as possible. Patterns of leapfrog, non-contiguous scattered development. This is not contiguous with the city limits. So there are a lot of things to balance in this case. Again, if, if we always approve developments that are not contiguous with the city limits, you can imagine 
and gentleman sitting on the front row here uh, made a really good point. You can imagine the impacts that, that will have, the fiscal impacts and all the other types of impacts that that will have on city services. Uh, solid waste has to go out there, police, fire, they will have to cross over uh, land that is outside of our jurisdiction to go to land that is in our jurisdiction. And you can imagine that sort of death by a thousand paper cuts situation. I said a lot and I'm still undecided and I wanna, I wanna hear more from my other commissioners about what they're thinking about this project. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. So first I wanna begin with a question. Um, so in your design commitments, which are pretty good design commitments, it just says siding. Was, can you tell me what kind of siding or any kind? Does that mean any kind of siding or? So this is what it says, materials. Materials will be brick or stone masonry siding or parged concrete. What kind of siding are we talking about? Do we have anybody who's going to be able to respond? Yeah, we do, they're, but they're conferring. Okay. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, so at this time, we have not narrowed down the particular material of the siding. So at this point, it could be vinyl, it could be cement, it could be brick, stone, accents. It's, it's not determined at this time, at this early stage, we have not narrowed it down. So you have siding in there so that, because if it wasn't in there, it would have to be brick or stone masonry. I'm sorry, say that again? I said, if you did not have the word siding in there, then the houses would have to be brick or stone masonry. Okay. Uh, so I get it. Uh, I was just wondering if you had left out a descriptor uh, or if I had misunderstood. Uh, okay. Design commitments and material commitments are important to me uh, because that's an aspect of compatibility. We tend to think of compatibility in terms of dwelling units per acre, but there's lots of elements of compatibility. Uh, and I think they can, you can trade one against the other a little bit. Um, Another question I had is how many units per building and would you be willing to make a proffer about mixing those up? I mean, because if this is going to be a whole bunch of buildings that are all eight units per, per building, all of a sudden you've got a lot of pretty big buildings there. And that, in my opinion, compounds the compatibility problem. But if you mix it up, uh, then I'm more interested. If so, some, some buildings have four units and some buildings have six units and uh, that, pr that provides at least some visual variety that, that essentially, I don't want this to look like Schofield Barracks. I'm gonna let my colleague Charlie take that one. Evening, Charlie Oakley with McAdams Company here in Durham. Uh, there are three different building types. So there's a building with three units up to a building with five, and they are mixed throughout the development. So you won't see. Would you be willing to make a proffer that says that there will be a variety of, of, of a, a mix of building sizes in terms of how many units are in a building? I mean, I can't craft that, but right. somebody can. Uh, that's, that's a writable thing. Um, and then ultimately, I wanted to note this isn't a question, so um, I wanted to note that uh, the actual density here, according to at least one allowable way, and the one in the way that we most commonly do it here, is only 5.2 units an acre. And that's because we allow developers at their option to include in their density calculations um, their buffers and what have you, or they can opt them out. Here the decision has been made to opt them out. So the actual density is 5.2, and th here again, this is another dimension of compatibility, and I think we need to take it into account, but also taking this into account, I find it hard to believe, although I've heard the developer say it in, at the microphone twice now at two meetings, and to me in meetings is, is that there's no way to mix unit types, but at this density, I just find that hard to believe that you can't mix 
townhouses and some single families in here. Uh, this is a piece of property that's pretty flat. And while it does have some, uh, some stream buffer issues and things like that, and then there's the pond, there's a lot of buildable space here. Um, there's lots of access, well, there's, you know, the, the practical access points are there's uh, two or three of them. I just find it really hard to believe that we could not mix unit types and work in some small single families that would certainly come in under 1,700 square feet. Um, we uh, had another speaker tonight talk about the importance of, of, of people buying houses and what have you, but I think in order to integrate this into the larger community, I, I don't think it's, although I frequently rail at what I think are mistakes in the future land use map, uh, I, I don't think, I think we can overcome that with this. And I can understand why it might be more expensive to build some single families and it makes it certainly would complicate the organization of how this is developed, but this is a big site and um, that has got lots of buildable space. And if we really mean that variety of housing types, then we need to start really leaning into this. And to me, if 20% if of this was single family homes or perhaps a mix of single family homes, townhouses and something else even, uh, I could vote for this. Uh, because I think we could organize this in a way so that this notion of, of transition from the, from the commercial node there at I-85 uh, up to the, the less dense rural residential, I think we could make that even more effective instead of, you know, it's like a staircase. Are the stairs, are we gonna do this in two steps that are great big ones? Um, or can we more subtly uh, create a, a graduated change. And I, I, I believe that it's possible at the, at this level of density, uh, we're, you know, we're down actually below, arguably the actual density is below the minimum called for in the future land use map. I can't believe there isn't room for variety. I'm not a developer, I'm not a land planner, and maybe you can show it to me, but I, we see these other projects that come in in much higher densities, and I just can't believe there isn't room there. Maybe I'm wrong. And we have land planners on the panel and what have you, and I'll, and if I'm wrong, then tell me so, and I'll take that into account when I decide to vote. Thank you, Commissioner Mich Mitchell. Mm -hmm. no. Krista mm -hmm. Mitchell. <laughs> I'm looking over at our, uh, at Commissioner Kitchen, and mixed his name with yours, so, we're often confused. We're tired. That's what's wrong. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to first of all thank the applicant because I think yeah. you know we said to continue it, and we had some concerns and comments. And uh, I appreciate you all going back in in good faith, trying to figure out a way to make it work. So thank you for that. I do have a question with regards to traffic. I heard some uh, comments about increased traffic on that road. I think you said to us that because it's gonna be um, townhomes, there's gonna be fewer trips uh, and less traffic. Can you talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, to kind of clarify uh, those points, if you don't mind? Is that for, I'm sorry, is that for trip? I don't know who it's for. I, I don't know if, if it's for me, I was gonna then say that I should probably hand it right. over to transportation for them to address that, because they're the experts on it, so. Thank you. Earlene Thomas, transportation. So the, the way traffic, um, the number of trips are generated, um, we use the industry standard Institute of Transportation Engineers where they have trip rates that are associated with um, each type of land use and townhomes generate less trips than single family homes typically because they're larger families, multiple vehicles, um, things of that nature. Thank you. Did you have any additional? No, no, thank you. That's thank great. you. Commissioner Alter. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, part of the frustration I'm hearing is about the, the FLUM designation of, you know, six to 12 units. Mm -hmm. um, I think Ms. Brown, you know, seems like an arbitrary number or why is it so high? 
compared to the surrounding area. And I think, you know, Commissioner Johnson and Brian mentioned them, uh, mentioned it as well. And I mean, I, in some ways it doesn't make, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but I, I do think that I would like to get away from just talking about density as the only way that we can have compatible uh, development. And so, you know, Commissioner Miller meant, said that there are other ways to talk about compatibility than just units per acre. And I, and from what I understand from the, you know, upcoming comp plan, we might be going in that direction. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, you know, based on what we've discussed, um, it seems like we're going to be, in, you know, we're more interested in the form and um, of, of the development. Um, and I think that's something we should consider in this particular case. Uh, you know, it's... I, you know, I like this commitment, you know, aside from the, the two commitments that Commissioner Baker mentioned, the, the, the block lengths and the, what's the other one, number two? Um, alleys. The alleys. The, the one on square footage, I think, is a nice commitment to, it, it, I think it's a commitment to uh, a modest size home that will you know, we cannot ensure that it will be affordable. You know, it's, it is not gonna be affordable. The developer is not going to uh, check, you know, a, a, a renter or a homeowner's income, but it does ensure that it will be at a modest price. And I think that is a, that is a laudable commitment. And I think that's a, uh, it's a good commitment. And it, it's not just about affordability, but I do think that it, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of the emails that we've gotten is that this is a modest neighborhood, right? Or they, you know, they are, trailers and single family homes. And again, I think this one commitment, you know, again, it doesn't, it's not a perfect commitment to, to ensure modesty, but I think it does go a long way. And I really appreciate that one. So I, I think it addresses both affordability potentially, and you know, this, this question of modesty or this, you know, this compatibility with neighboring um, uh, neighborhoods, right? So I, I, I like that. Um, I think that the, you know, kind of to, to echo what Commissioner Kinchin said, I think that the applicant has made some, some commitments here that are above and beyond what we usually see. Um, and, you know, and I think we should, at least in my opinion, you know, we can signal to city council and others and the development community that, you know, these kind of things get rewarded and it's not maybe perfect. I, I understand that, but I, I think they can go a long way. Um, I want to just address the or maybe I have this as more of a question to both Commissioner, Commissioners Baker and Miller, because both of you have mentioned uh, housing types, right? Uh, a mix of housing types is what we prefer. So yes, there are not a mix of housing types within this development, but, it, but because there are gonna be townhomes here and there are single family homes around it. That's a good question. Would that be, I mean, to me, if you zoom out, right, that, that that's a mix of housing types. What is the benefit of housing types? Uh, why should we be focusing on this, and why would this not actually contribute to that? And, and I'll let either I'm of you start, speak. and then he's going to give you the real answer. Okay, the, uh, I want the fake answer first. Uh, to me, I think you've hit on a really good point. It's a question of scale, and you said zoom out, and that's about scale. So I believe that you can have the, a, des a desirable mixture of housing types in different projects when they are all relatively small. Uh, in other words, it doesn't have to be one development. They don't all have to vote in the same homeowner association meeting in order to get a desirable mix of housing types. Because uh, it is a question of uh, inclusivity uh, and housing types, a mixture of housing types to me can also mean mixing big houses and little houses of the same type um, but to get the variety. But when we start talking about projects that are bigger, that are 50 acres and up, then I believe you get concentrations that, that are contrary to uh, variety. In other words, big parcels each divided into, unit, into monotypes uh, uh, of all the different ways you can measure variety, in my opinion, argue against variety. If we have a whole bunch of, of five and 10 acre sites, then you can, variety can be achieved across project boundaries. 
But when you start talking about great, when we start talking about farms, then uh, then variety, I think to get what we want in variety, we have to start creating it inside the, pro the projects of, of acreages of that size. Um, and of course, there are examples uh, in Durham that we've done this and not recently. I mean, Woodcroft is a place uh, where the, it, intentional and deliberate mixing up of rental and single family and big big single family and relatively modest single family. And it, it's true, it's kind of done cul-de-sac by cul-de-sac. Uh, and and uh, we haven't seen anybody who has done, you know, four townhouses and then three single family homes and then three townhouses. That would be interesting. I would like to see a project that was done that. Well, I say we haven't. We have actually approved that very thing in the uh, Pinecrest development, all at the very high end, uh, but it's like it's like nothing we've ever seen before. So I have a lot to learn and Nate's gonna teach me. No, I think that's a really great question because I mean, there you can have a situation, you can walk down a street, it's a great street in a great neighborhood uh, that does have one housing type. But I think Commissioner Miller uh, hit on a really important point, which is the scale it's so easy to get to lose sight of what the scale is of these sites. 50 acres is so much, you could do so much with 50 acres. And if you only have one housing type in all of 50 acres, I mean, that is really truly, I mean, you, you, you should be able to have a lot more housing types in there. And I wanna hit on a, I wanna hit on a, a really important uh, planning concept, which is the concept of aging in place and the importance of creating built environments that are amenable to all ages um, so that everyone, and, and that also makes it more amenable to a variety of different income levels. Um, and so uh, you might imagine a block or two blocks or, or three blocks uh, in an urban area or in a neighborhood um, that includes a single family house where uh, you know maybe, maybe a middle-aged family lives there with their kids um, and their, uh, you know, their kids grow up and, and go to college and they can rent um, an ADU in someone's backyard. That's another example of aging in place. Um, they grow up, they wanna move into a townhome, starter home, something like that. That could be in the same neighborhood. And so uh, it's a really important concept. It's certainly falling in line with best practices. It's certainly a trend that we're seeing throughout the United States. And uh, really when I, when I talk about trend, I'm talking about going back to the old, to the way of designing uh, places before places. It's not a, it's not a risky thing. It's, it's something that's well established, um, something that benefits pedestrian uh, oriented nature of, of cities. And so I, I think it is important to think about what Commissioner Miller was saying in terms of uh, scale of development. Thank you. That, I mean, that's helpful, but I, again, I, I um, yeah, and I think we should continue to encourage that, but at the same time, yeah, think about the scale of it. So, you know, if it, if we are, if we do now have townhomes here close to single family homes, I do think that that, you know, is a mix of type, housing types. It, it, it may not be the, the ideal, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And I, I, I don't know, I, I think that on the whole, this, this development has more benefits than, than, um, than costs, and I, I, I urge us to vote for it. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairwoman. I know you're hanging in there with us tonight. We are. So I just want to make one comment based on the difference of housing types within so with, within a site or, like you said, zooming out. I, so when I talk to developers about, you know, the feedback I've gotten, it may not be germane to all developers. You know, one comment I get is, you know, it's more costly, right? Because yeah. if you're doing townhomes and now you do single family, you can't get the density. I think that in Durham, this may actually be an experiment that we can get some good insight on. I think that to prove what actually occurs when you approach this, I think that we should start trying to see this because I think one of the trade-offs offs is that these areas or communities are not gonna be as, if this is the case that my development project costs will increase relative, relative to say a single product, that affordability may be one of the trade-offs. I think we need to see it so it won't be anecdotal. So it's like when we look at you know, both sides of the arguments and some may be willing to accept that this is prob probably not something that will be a reality or come to market for us because, oh, it may be more costly and affordable. Well, when we start doing it and we see it, maybe someone will be like, 
someone who, who started out pro may be like, well, I see that one of the intended outcomes is not going to be a reality. And so we'd be more mindful of that. But I think at this point right now, we're still, it's in our heads because we haven't seen it and we don't get proposals where we're seeing this and it actually becomes a product here in Durham where we can go to a community and experience what, what Commissioner Baker highlights, but then see, oh, a townhouse is more expensive because now you're building single family because I, they, I had the price at a certain point to get people and, I, and here in Durham, people will come. So I, I had a conversation with two developers recently. I was like, the thing about Durham is if you build a particular upper end product, I think that we'll get them because we have people coming into the city. Yeah. And so we have to be more mindful of like the people who are already here, are we providing for them? But I think we're in a situation where we may be a case study to get some actual, actual like real time information and beyond the anecdotal. So I just want to raise that point. Thank you. Commissioner Santiago. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. <coughs> so one thing, excuse me, sorry. Give him some water. So one thing that we have to worry about being the commission, I believe, is setting precedent. But I think in this case, it's a little bit of an exception when it comes to precedent for the area. And I agree with Commissioner, thank you. Commissioner Johnson, that this could be a good opportunity for a case study or something. Because if you look at the um, future land use map as it is, if you zoom out, which seems to be the phrase of the night, if you zoom out in the area, current industrial, industrially zoned areas become recreational open space. Past that, some becomes industrial, but there's not much residential out there in terms of the current the future land use map. So this might be the one opportunity or the one case that comes before us in that general area. So this might be a good opportunity to let the developer who's done a great job of trying to compromise with us and the community to see what it could look like. Just one small thing, Chair. Thank uh, you. I just wanted to- Commissioner Baker. Thank you. I just wanted to add one, one uh, additional um, uh, thought there is that in addition to sort of single family and townhome and ADU that you could also incorporate small scale multiplexes and multifamily. I think that that in, is included in the variety of housing types. And I also think we're only gonna get any of this stuff and all this stuff if we code it, if we put it into the requirements, if we put it in the UDO and it's not very difficult to do that. And um, so we're obviously not gonna get a lot of volunteers out there to do this. And quite frankly, it's not, it's not a risky thing. It's, it's not risky to do. It's just a lot easier if you go around from community to community just stamping down your typical single family or whatever type of uh, development. So um, we need to be thinking about that as coding this stuff into the, into the UDL. Thank you. Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Madam Chair. I I've been really quiet on this particular case because I was thinking really hard and listening to everyone. I was, I was on the fence. I would have voted against this last month. I appreciate that the proponents took the time to, I believe, improve the plan even coming in tonight, I think my main concern is still, is this orderly development pattern? It still strikes me that it's a jump. And as Commissioner Miller has said, it would be, I would be more comfortable with a stair step. At the same time, I've been on this commission a number of years, I've never seen this many commitments. And many of these are quite good. Uh, I believe this is just enough to exceed the bar. So I am gonna plan to vote for this. Uh, but I still do have some level of concerns about the location. If you, if this was further south and you were talking about this number of townhomes with these commitments and it was closer to transportation, this would be an easy vote in my opinion. And I, I agree with the neighbors who have legitimate concerns, uh, but I do feel like we've put in enough commitments and safeguards. I hope that will continue to be the case as this moves forward to city council. Uh, but again, I think these are good steps in the right direction that give the existing neighbors some level of uh, certainty about what will be coming. And I think it does begin to help with the transition that was my biggest concern, but I do plan to vote for this. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have other commissioners who would like to speak? If not, I think we're ready for a motion. Madam Chair, 
If it's appropriate, this time I move case Z19-00018 concerning the Glen Road Townhomes Project uh, that we send it forward to the city council. And this is this an annexation case too? Okay, send it forward to the city council uh, with a favorable, favorable recommendation. Second. Motion by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Al Turk, that we send item Z19000018 Glen Road Townhomes forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor of this well, motion, may we have. Should we mention in the motion the additional commitments that were made? Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Which, which were? <laughs> Well, there's no. a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Let's go back to Jamie's and see if they were recorded. Yeah, they're in the report. But Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. Month. They were the list of the proffers that I stated in my presentation oh. that were put on the record. Okay. Yeah. Those are in the plan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We don't. So. Okay. okay. So then we can move forward. Uh, motion by Commissioner Miller and second by Commissioner Al Turk that we send this item forward to the city council with a. Uh, favorable recommendation. Uh, may we have a roll call vote for this item, please? Commissioner Morgan? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Chair, uh, Vice Chair Busby? Yes. Chair Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. Commissioner McIver? Yes. Um, motion passes seven to five. Thank you. We're ready for the staff report for the next item. South Mineral Springs and Pleasant. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. I will be presenting case number Z190018. I'm sorry, 19 South Mineral Springs and Pleasant Road. Um, the applicant is Jared Edens from Edens Land. The property is located uh, primarily, generally speaking, at the intersections of South Mineral Springs, Holder Road, and Pleasant Drive. It is currently located within the county jurisdiction and they're seeking an annexation. The site is uh, just over 52 acres. The request is rural residential and residential suburban 20 to plan development residential 4.001. The property is currently located within the low medium density residential future land use designation and there is no change to that. The proposal on the development plan is up to 191 single family lots. Um, I did wanna mention before I get into too much detail, there were two um, corrections that needed to be made to the staff report. Um, one dealing with uh, um, top of the first page, first line requested, correcting the requested zoning district. Um, there was a reference to RSMD, which was not correct. And then um, I believe it was on page five, there was also a reference to um, 100, uh, uh, 19 units and it should be 191 units. Thank you. Well, not sure why the aerial map is missing here, but in your staff report, there is the aerial map um, that shows the property in red. Um, these are some of the site photos. Um, the property is located uh, within the suburban development tier and the Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay District. Um, as you can see, and if you've visited the, uh, the area, 
the property is mainly undeveloped and heavily wooded. Um, there are two existing dwellings located along South Merrill Springs Road frontage, which will be removed um, as noted on the development plan. There are also areas of wetlands, floodplains, um, streams, and associated buffers. Um, it's getting late, so I'm not gonna go through all of the names of the various developments that surround this site. Um, the staff report goes into a lot of detail in terms of the number of units uh, and what surrounds the area in terms of this um, subdivision names. Um, I would note, however, that um, as shown on the development plan, there is an existing roadway stub at the end of Red Robin Road um, which would connect this site to additional 41 single family lots as part of the Hanover Point residential uh, development. Um, this is the, my apologies, this is um, the wrong uh, context map. Um, the property is located within, um, as mentioned before, the rural residential and the residential suburban 20 um, zoning district and the applicant is proposing to change the designation to uh, the plan development, um, plan residential development 4.001. The correct map is in your staff report. Again, um, the property is located uh, within the low medium density residential um, future land use dis um, designation, which is consistent with the zoning request. A portion of the site is um, within the recreation open space um, at future land use designation and there's no change to either that designation. The um, development plan provided in the staff report okay. provides site access points, project boundary buffers, riparian buffers, the 10 foot no builds, um, the building and um, building envelope um, and parking envelope, as well as the tree coverage areas and the maximum impervious coverage. In terms of the, I'm just gonna keep going. It seems this, I must have a duplication of the previous application for this PowerPoint. Okay. And I'm not gonna go back through the other one that's on here. I'll just keep going. Right. Um, in terms of the key commitments on the development plan, the development plan is limited to single family um, units up to 191. There were other uh, key commitments included additional asphalt for the construction of a future bicycle lane and dedicated right of way for roadway improvements. In terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan and its policies, um, this proposal, if approved, will increase the density and commit to residential units while still remaining consistent with the future land use designation of low medium density residential. Um, as stated before, the proposed residential development is contiguous with adjacent single family um, development. Uh, it serves as, um, in my opinion, it serves as an infill site to the built environment and the area's residential character, um, which includes uh, Fletcher's Hills residential neighborhood, the Grove Park residential neighborhood, Hanover Point residential subdivision, Ashton Hall residential subdivision, um, Ox uh, Orchard Ridge townhouse development, um, and several, several others, as well as the roadway stubs that were put in to accommodate interconnection uh, to the Red Robin Road um, development to provide for um, interconnectivity to the site. Um, there is existing infrastructure, including roads, water, and sewer capacity to um, serve the site, and the proposed development is consistent um, with policy 1111A, uh, uh, relative to the school system capacity. Um, so staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, I have two individuals who have signed up to speak. 
uh, the applicant, Jarrett Edens, and then one other individual who has signed up against. So Jarrett, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for your help on this project. Um, summarize a couple of things. 191 units total, single families, what we're proposing. Uh, barely conforms with the land use plan of four to eight. We're at 4.001 on a four to eight land use plan. But it's very consistent with stuff immediately south of us. We have PDR 4.0 immediately south and PDR 4.76 uh, just southwest of the site. So it sort of conforms to that. Um, I do want to point out a couple of public improvements being made. Uh, and this is rare. I've had a lot of single family zonings. This is the first one. It's been all single family that's proffered to a traffic signal. Uh, that it's fairly rare that just a single family only project will, will generate enough traffic to cause that. But we are gonna add a signal at Mineral and Holder, which I think will help quite a bit in that area. Uh, we're also improving, there's some sewer improvements we're doing just downstream of the site um, required by, uh, by the City Utilities Department, some sewer improvements. Um, really, again, that's all I have. I'd be glad to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I do have uh, one individual who has signed up to speak, uh, Sukania Noor. We outlasted her. Did we outlast um, Mr. Mr. Noor or was it Miss? Okay, well, are there any individuals here who would like to speak during the comment period to this issue? Um, South Mineral Springs in Pleasant. If not, I will close the public hearing, the comment period, and open um, the, give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Am I right? They're yawning. Okay. <laughs> to, my, to my left. Are there any commissioners who would like to speak? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Oh, there. Okay. Yes. Uh, she hit me. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, I move that uh, we send case Z19-00019 concerning the property at South Mineral Springs and Pleasant forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second it. Um, motion by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Morgan, that we send item Z19-00019, South Mineral Springs and Pleasant, forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. May we have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? No. I'm sorry? No. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Vice Chair Busby? Yes. Chair Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Ketchen? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? Yes. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. Motion passes 10 to 2. Thank you, and we have one final item. Text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance signs. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, myself and Don O'Toole with the City Manager's Office um, will want to go through this with you in a brief PowerPoint presentation. We'll, pri we'll try to be as expedient as possible at the late hour um, and understanding um, the topic at hand. Um, just as an overview, we'll do a project background. Um, Don specifically will get into legal issues. I'll run through a quick summary uh, overview and then um, the next steps. Um, the 
A lot of, most of this is based upon uh, the Supreme Court decision of Reed versus Town of Gilbert that Don will get into uh, momentarily. In short, it focused on non-commercial temporary signs um, uh, and it focused it on very much on time, place, and manner aspects. Um, we consulted with a, a consultant um, back in uh, 2017. Um, and we, uh, uh, staff took over in the late fall of 2017. We had the JCCPC review in April of 2018, public review in May of 2018, and then we did present an informational item in August 2018. Um, and then, uh, and now we are here. Um, I will now turn it over to Don to go over more of the legal background. Thanks, Mike. Hey everyone, I'm Don O'Toole from the Durham City Attorney's Office. I hope you all are not as exhausted as I am at this point. More so. Um, yeah. But I did, I, I, we previously came before the Planning Commission and gave a brief summary of the Reed v. Gilbert case. I'm basically just gonna summarize that very quickly again without uh, belaboring the point. As Mike said, um, I guess the first thing about this case is I think this is a situation in which bad facts unfortunately upset the way most municipalities in the country regulate signs, but we're now forced to deal with that. Um, the town of Gilbert, Arizona regulated um, what they call temporary directional signs and their ordinance defined those signs as signs directing the public to a church or other qualifying event. So question why you would need a sign category that specifically dealt with churches, but the town of Gilbert felt that that was necessary. Uh, the um, town's ordinance also defined other qualifying events as any assembly, gathering, activity, or meeting sponsored, arranged, or promoted by a religious, charitable, community service, educational, or other similar nonprofit organization. So as you can see, it was a very narrow category of signs that the town of Gilbert wanted to regulate in a specific way. And I think it's unfortunate for the town and the rest of the cities in the country that they further regulated those signs by saying that there could be no more than four of those signs limited to six square feet on any single property at any time, and they could only be up for 12 hours. And that, that ultimately was the real problem. Um, the plaintiff in this case was a church, a small church, they didn't have a building, and so every weekend they had to put up temporary signs so that the parishioners could figure out where the service was gonna be held. They did the heinous act of putting up 15 to 20 signs every weekend, and the church members would post the signs early in the day on Saturday, and then remove them midday on Sunday. And the town of Gilbert saw fit to cite them for violation of the sign ordinance because it exceeded the length of time that the this, this signs should be in place. Um, so the court looked at this regulation and um, it basically said that it would apply what's called strict scrutiny, which is the most onerous kind of First Amendment constitutional uh, scrutiny that the court could have applied. And because of that, it said that the, the rules of the town were not, that there was no compelling governmental interest and that the rules were not narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Essentially, um, it, uh, another kind of ordinance, if, it only, if a sign ordinance only regulates time, place, and manner without going into the specifics of naming different categories of sign, that would just be subject to what's called rational review. And typically, um, when something's subject to rational view, it, it will uh, pass First Amendment muster. So uh, Justice Thomas wrote the majority opinion, although there were, there were many different opinions that were written by the court. And um, one of the, Justice Thomas basically said that this ordinance didn't pass strict scrutiny. And um, Justice Thomas indicated that if, this, if the sign ordinance 
regulated size, materials, lighting, moving parts, or portability, then that sign would be acceptable. Um, he also went on to say that governments are free to regulate signs that are on government property and um, that signs that are narrowly tailored to protect public servant uh, safety, sort of like street road signs, speed limit signs, that those would likely pass strict scrutiny. Um, there was another consenting opinion and uh, or concurring opinion, and it was written by Justice Alito, and his opinion is very helpful. It's been cited by most lawyers around the country because he gave a list of um, sign ordinance provisions that likely would be acceptable. So he went on to say that local governments can regulate the size of signs, the location of signs, whether they're lit or not, fixed message versus electronic signs, and that um, there could be public versus private property dis distinctions for sign ordinances. Um, he also recognized that uh, commercial and residential property distinctions could be recognized, um, that it, a city might be able to regulate the number of signs allowed in the right-of-way per mile, um, on-premise versus off-premise distinctions could be recognized, and that there could be time restrictions placed on signs. Generally, everything that Justice Alito listed would fall into the category of time, place, and manner restrictions. So as Mike and I um, and the other planners have looked at our sign UDO provisions, that's been the focus of what we've done with the ordinance, is try to only have time, place, and manner restrictions. And Mike? Question? So thank you. So. One of the big things that was that in your thick list of changes is that a lot of um, the changes are more organizational than anything else. Um, a lot of our ordinance actually already fell into a lot of time, place, and manner uh, uh, standards, and thus didn't really require many changes. Um, so, uh, al although you see a lot of strike throughs and cross outs, a lot of it is just replacing and restructuring how that section works. Um, as is noted uh, in the report and on the screen, um, uh, we didn't really change or made very limited changes to the stand general standards themselves, uh, prohibited signs and off-premise signs, um, and the sign types that require sign permits, uh, wall signs, freestanding signs, and such. We didn't make uh, wholesale changes to those. Um, so, but what is changing? Um, we did revise the purpose statements to make them more meaningful and relevant um, to um, the regulations themselves and to um, in consideration of Reed v. Gilbert. Um, we took a look at the definition of signs and compared them to other jurisdictions, uh, signage uh, definitions. Uh, we did create an exempt category that took into consider government and safety signs and then other signs that were already regulated by other uh, statute or organism or um, ordinances. Um, we did add some real-time uh, signed changeable copy allowance for parking structures based, um, based on uh, safety justification for that. Um, we did create new temporary and permanent sign sections. Um, and as we as noted in there, the temp, um, it replaced a lot of other sections such as signs allowed with permits, signs allowed without permits, and signs within right-of-way. Right-of-way distinctions were built into the temporary and permanent sign categories. Um, specifically with time, the, probably the biggest changes that you would see are with temporary signage. Um, we did uh, assign a, a specific uh, sign budget to properties focused on time, place, and manner. We did limit um, uh, one of the biggest concerns was temporary signs in right of way. Um, we took into account um, the ghost bike or other memorial policies, uh, signage policies that the city um, has already uh, followed. Um, we tried to stick to um, signage allowed in right of ways following election periods as a window of opportunity for any kind of sign um, following time, place, and manner procedures. And we relocated sidewalk signs that are allowed per certain zoning districts. Um, permanent signs, 
Uh, we added a new minimum signage allowance for any property for permanent signs that didn't require a sign permit. Um, again, we maintained most of the current sign types um, and most of those standards, again, are, were already time, place, and manner, TPM. Um, we did do a little clarification of the definition between monument and pylon signs. We did pull out um, from previous drafts further changes to monument and pylon signs because there were, we felt that it was getting a little bit beyond, it was more mission creep and, and um, if we really felt that we needed to change those standards, that can be handled in a separate uh, amendment. Um, we did modify a little bit of residential identification signs. We did get an email, I just wanna mention this, um, about reconsidering how we allotted the, the square footage for that. Um, we didn't really change any of the square footage, we just changed how that square footage was assigned to single family and two family developments versus PDR districts. And we said that we would take another look at that, um, not commit to anything, but I just want to make sure we got that out there. Um, we did remove wayfinding standards um, and off-premise non-residential signs. Uh, the wayfinding standards are found through exempt sign, uh, uh, handled through exemptions. And we relocated the landmark sign section into the, actually the landmark designation section under the historic preservation section, so it's all in one place. Um, and then we did make some, as you see, some modifications and additions to the definitions uh, related to signage. Um, other notable changes, um, we did delete um, some larger allowances for changeable copy that were associated specifically just with theaters. Um, and we clarified how the change in displays are, uh, the timing for that was calculated. And then we got rid of a section that took into consider consideration of aggregate sign area. It conflicted with individual sign type allowances and, and um, uh, we felt that that, that that was a necessary removal. Um, but other than that, those are the changes. And I'm sorry, and I'll be uh, happy to, and Don and I will be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I do have uh, five individuals who have signed up to speak against, um, and I'm going to just go ahead and uh, open the public hearing so we can allow these individuals to comment during this period. Jared Edens, Tammy Brooks. Thank you. Uh, Jared Edens again with Edens Land. Uh, I'll be very brief, uh, and again, like, most cases, I've signed up against, but that just means I have a couple of questions. Doesn't mean I'm completely against the code, uh, obviously. Uh, no doubt staff was forced into this by, by the Supreme Court. And, and from my reading, it's a very well-written code and we're very capable people working on it. Uh, my main issue is just with the, the real estate signs, directional real estate signs and things like that. Uh, the report says the part, decision was partially made uh, to avoid clutter along our streets uh, was one of the reasons, but I, I was thinking, do we have a problem with clutter now? Because if, if we don't have a problem with clutter now, I don't know that we have a problem with clutter later with the new code, because I think it's a little bit more restrictive. I understand there's a concern of, of opening up a can of worms and things like that, but uh, my understanding is most of the objections and concerns are coming from the real estate industry. There aren't other industries who are rushing to put signs in the right of way, it's just us mainly. Uh, so really, I, I just look at, you have public roads and public right of ways built and maintained with public dollars. I think you could argue that real estate signs are for the public good. Um, and in those situations, I would just hope we would err on the side of allowing more than restricting more. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Tammy Brooks. Esteemed commission members, thank you uh, for this hearing this evening. Thanks for sticking it out. <laughs> it's way past my bedtime. My name is Tammy Brooks, uh, and I am here on behalf of Durham Regional Association of Realtors, which I served as president in 2018. The revisions to this signed ordinance before you today first came to our attention in April 2018. And our local, state, and national association have been analyzing these revisions and offered our feedback to the planning department. We emailed all, uh, all of you copies of this um, yesterday, and I hope you received that. Yeah. I hate speaking in public, so I'm in my nervous mode right now, so forgive me. <laughs> Temporary commercial and non-commercial signs are a vital and affordable form of speech. I am here before you representing the 1,600 plus members 
of the Durham Regional Association of Realtors who work in this community. But I am also here representing the nearly 300,000 citizens of this community, our clients, who work for nonprofits, who attend churches and run small businesses. And we all use this form of speech, temporary signage, to communicate. Small businesses need temporary signs as the community gets to know their businesses and their locations. Schools advertise summer camps and their much needed revenue. Volunteer firefighters point the way to their fish fries, churches host bazaars, and nonprofits point the way to their calls to action. These are all amazing pluses that require our community tolerance of the mattresses for sales and we buy home signs that clutter some of our intersections. Way signs, another form of temporary signage, aid the public in finding unmapped streets and new subdivisions, hard to access one-way streets, which we have plenty of here in Durham, and rural locations that are sometimes hard to navigate. We cannot, when we cannot direct consumers to businesses or products, citizens or citizens to events they wish to attend, we underserve them your citizens and our community as a whole. On page one of the draft amendment, two of the stated goals of the amendment are, one, enabling the effective use of signs as a mean of, means of communication and free speech. But you're taking away a huge section of that in the, in the restrictions on temporary signage. And two, ensuring standards do not favor commercial speech over non-commercial speech. Commission members, respectfully, the pendulum in this proposed ordinance has swung too far. This complete elimination of some forms of non-commercial speech and most commercial speech is out of compliance with Reed and ultimately erodes the rights of local businesses and citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Guillen Hasbrock. Hi, good evening. I'm Jan Hasbrook. This is my 27th year in new home sales in Durham, and I live at uh, 13 Piney Park Lane, Durham 27713. I was the president of the Home Builders Association of Durham, Orange, and Chatham Counties in 2018, and I speak for the home builders, and I speak against the total restriction of temporary signage, particularly when it comes to new homes communities. I just started a new neighborhood. You cannot find it in Google Maps. You just can't, it's not there yet. Signage is an essential way for uh, people to uh, find us. And I would submit to you, quite frankly, that um, Gilbert made a big mistake and Durham shouldn't make a similar mistake. And um, we, there is a compelling governmental interest for us to uh, respect and promote what <coughs> real estate sales, particularly new homes and communities, which is what you guys are in the business of overseeing, how important that is to our tax base, uh, to the general welfare of our citizens, and overall improvement of our quality of life. And I would say to you that um, uh, Reed versus Gilbert was a volcano in municipal uh, rules. And uh, I don't wanna see us get uh, run over by a lava stream that we don't need to. Uh, real estate signage in particular for those for new home neighborhoods are a commercial speech that presents a compelling governmental interest in not being limited. And um, I appreciate your consideration on this important issue. Durham is too good to limit free speech. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Milan. Marlon, my best. This is me, I'm Marlon. Before the clock starts, am I allowed to hand to each of you handouts? Why don't you hand it to one of us and we'll pass it down. I didn't know if there were gonna be 15 people here tonight, so about 15 of those and hopefully we'll, that's more than enough. We'll give you your extras back. <laughs> okay, and can, and can I also ask, um, Madam Chair, can I ask just a point of clarification? Two of the earlier speakers, Jared and I, Jan, did not use their full three minutes. Would I be allowed to use their excess, please? Just At this hour, I will try to keep to three minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And more importantly, 
Um, all I can say is for y'all to make it this long with no bathroom break and to at least appear interested is most <laughs> impressive at this hour. I just wanna mention several things. I'm part of an ad hoc group involving the realtors, other community people, which has attempted to work with the planning commission to come up with some reasonable solutions. The one thing that Mr. Stocks failed to mention, his um, timeline went up through May 2018 and then it abruptly stopped. Nothing said about what happened since then. Well, what happened since then was our group got together with them, uh, came up with some reasonable content neutral time, manner and place suggestions. And initially, initially their suggestion for temporary signs was ghost bikes will be allowed and that is not content neutral. It allowed sidewalk vendor signs, the downtown area where you can put signs out, once again, not content neutral, and it allowed political speech to be allowed, political signs from 45 days before the open voting to 10 days after. Okay, in response, starting in May, we hit carried on reasonable dialogues and um, we got a response back in the latter part of, of um, 2000, let's see, what was it, it was, it was in, spring of 2019, and we got a response that basically said, we're gonna reject everything you suggested, but we're gonna let that 45 days before elections through 10 days after be open to any signs. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me why that, so the, um, we buy homes, that's open season for them. And those are not realtor signs, by the way. Um, the signs, junk signs out there, anything is allowed during that 55 day period. That has, that has nothing to do with this Supreme Court case. Totally contrary. What I handed you is what should be being followed. If you look at the very top, 10 miles away from us, UNC School of Government in October 19, uh, 2018, they've got somebody who's actually devoted a ton of time to this issue, has published on the web this uh, document. And if you'll turn to page four of five, Page four or five, I've tried to highlight in the middle of the area and I realize it's 1030 and it's hard to focus, but let me just mention, it said a city, a municipality may prohibit temporary signs, which is what they've chosen to do, or permit them subject to certain even-handed content neutral restrictions. As to other restrictions, this can include limits on size, location, time frame, and other content neutral aspects. All we ask, we ask, I will, thank you, ma'am. Um, all I ask is that I'm against this proceeding at this time. I ask that this be deferred back to the planning um, committee, uh, uh, that they, or the planning department, that they, uh, with the recommendation, that they communicate with the Depart School of Government and interact with my body to come up with reasonable size of signs, location, and short duration. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Jacob Anderson. Uh, Jacob Anderson, uh, local stakeholder, landowner, um, and just uh, I think most of the interest has come from uh, realtors and folks uh, that are looking to put out temporary signs. Um, I think our main focus and just quickly wanted to speak tonight about uh, something Michael mentioned and I think he'll address it and I just wanna make sure some maybe local builders, stakeholders, developers are involved in those conversations but um, primarily interest is in the, um, the commercial versus non-residential um, signage uh, monumentation. I think the apartments and commercial monumentation were, were um, fairly untouched in this uh, adoption or ordinance proposed. And I think the residential monumentation was um, drastically reduced and um, from about 32 square feet to about 12. Um, and I think it, it's a little bit more of a complicated issue that I would like to have time to meet with staff and um, express those concerns to you guys um, as it relates to, you know, larger communities, master plans versus smaller communities and just the size of monumentation, the different monumentations at maybe different intersections, you know, monumentation at thoroughfares and things like that. Um, so we would just ask that those items be further considered. So, thank you. 
Thank you. I do not have any other individuals who have signed up to speak. I do see a hand in the back if you would like to come forward and state your name and address. And we will. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Thank you for staying, staying so late. I'm Shane Kirk. I reside at 510 Oak Bluffs in Pittsburgh. While I live in Pittsburgh, I do a lot of business here. I'm a realtor and I currently am a board of directors member for the Durham Realtor Association. Um, I'm here on behalf of my business and I think for potentially your businesses. Um, as uh, Dan Milam so uh, forth put it about the 55 day period for election signs. If you can imagine, I don't, and I apologize, I don't know if you're elected officials or have ambitions to be, but imagine not being able to advertise your business. And that's essentially what this does. It effectively removes an ability for certain professions or certain businesses to advertise and earn an income and pay taxes and contribute to this uh, fine city that we have here. So I would like to see something that's put in here that is very reasonable, which could be a, a time span for these temporary signs, whether that's two, three days, a week, something that makes sense, that allows people to take part in the community, to advertise for certain things, help people find those communities. Of course, a very short period wouldn't help people like Jan with new home communities, so I think things need to be really taken into consideration there. Uh, when we have things like this, when we're trying to find and bring residents to this city to get them homes and be able to move in here and take part and, like I said, become those tax-paying citizens that, of course, any city needs. So that's uh, my thought, my concerns. Obviously, uh, I hope that you'll kind of put that context into place in your consideration. Thank I'm you. against this uh, change as it sits. Thank you. Thank you. Shane, could you say your address again for me, please? Yes, my address is 510 Oak Bluffs in Pittsburgh. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I do not have any. Okay, I see another hand. Please come forward. My name is Lamar Willis. I live at 403 Swift Creek Crossing, Durham, 27713. I'm here to speak against this uh, sign ordinance. And I'm going to take you on a little bit different perspective. I have been a member of the Durham Lions Club for over 20 some years. So I see some of the, one or two of you have spoken to the Lions Club. So one of the things that the Durham Lions Club does is supports and raises money to aid people that have sight impairment and blindness. For the last several years, we have had a project here at the Civic Center on Election Day, the Durham Pancake Jamboree. And if you take this sign ordinance to the extent that what you, these people are proposing, we have yard signs and signs that we put out advertising the Durham Lions Club Pancake Jamboree. And you will be, as I guess, hurting our efforts and raising money to aid people that need help. So I would ask you to consider this not only as a commercial side of it, but also a civic side and people that volunteer to give their time to help raise money for people that do not have the opportunities that are that, but that do need help. Just one little aspect of the sign ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there other individuals who would like to speak to this issue during the public comment period? If not, 
I'm going to close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to start to my right. Are there any commissioners who would like to speak? Uh, Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Madam Chair. The hour is late and the fact that we have a room still pretty full tells me we need a little more time to work on this issue, just my, my personal perspective. But the, the um, cause I'd rather not actually vote tonight. And I hear, I hear individuals asking for more time. The, the question for staff that I had, uh, I recall one of the presentations to the Joint City County Planning Committee, which you mentioned, how many communities in North Carolina have adopted new sign ordinances that you know of at this point due to this Supreme Court decision? So Greensboro updated their sign ordinance. Charlotte just updated their sign ordinance. Raleigh has an updated sign ordinance. I don't know if it's to read specific or not. The issue is that whether um, it is truly read compliant or not is up to their legal determination, not ours. Right. Did any of them in your understanding take the same approach that, that this draft is taking or, or did they take a different approach similar to the, the other option that was raised by one of the speakers, the permitting subject to certain even handed content neutral restrictions? Some ordinances even before read didn't allow anything in the right away. Um, carry is one example. Um, some, and then other ordinances carved out specific exceptions um, that would either allow it in the right of way or allow them on, but specify it was on private property, such as the directional, if we're talking about the directional signs, would specify allowance on a private property, what that would do or not, I don't know. But it was some sort of, I guess, compromise without understanding the politics or the justifications for any of those ordinances. Okay, thank you. I, first of all, I just should have said, I appreciate the time and effort that Mr. Stock, Mr. O'Toole, I mean, the other staff, you've spent an enormous amount of time grappling with a really challenging situation. I, I, I don't think there is a great path forward here, so I just wanted to say all of that. And um, I guess my final question is, so it sounds like there were conversations, there were stakeholder meetings or conver uh, opportunities for input, but it didn't necessarily sound like that has changed in this draft. In your estimation, would a 60 or 90 day, two to three cycle delay provide for additional time or input, or do you believe this is what you have come up with and this is what you're recommending? Um, I'll speak and then if Don wants to jump in also, um, We've had internal discussions. We met specifically with the Realtors Association throughout the fall of um, uh, 2018, responding to their specific uh, suggestions. Um, we pointed out the issues with them, whether they're just uh, enforceability issues um, or just not read compliant issues. Um, we pointed out that um, except for the directional sign issue that they're bringing up, all the other sign issues that they're bringing up are not currently allowed in right away anyway except for political signs and what is currently being proposed is allowance of, a more generous allowance of any sign in the right of way um, within a certain time period. Um, but um, I don't see at this point, unless there's some new direction given to staff, mm -hmm. that there would be any significant changes um, with that delay. Um, could there be some changes, um, as I mentioned, reconsideration of the uh, taking a look at the square footage allotment to the residential identification signs that we made changes to. I'm sure we can take a look at that. Um, we already promised that we would um, without promising a, a firm action one way or the other. But in terms of um, our review of how we came down on the temporary signage and right away, um, I don't see any particular change unless we got specific direction otherwise. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chair. So, so Mike, um, so currently you can put a directional sign in the, in the right of way, right? And can you put, okay, and so now you're proposing to not be able to put anything in the right of way except for 55 days around the election. Is that right or am I misreading that? So currently what is being proposed, and I'll go to, let me get to that page for a second, if I may. Thank 
actually had it, and I apologize that I lost it. So, what is specifically would be allowed in the right of way? Uh, temporary signs in the right of way. Um, we're taking a look at object or marker. What page is that? Sorry. Um, I'm sorry, page 34. Okay, thank you. So, um, an object or marker at a traffic related fatality, and it gives specific, so it's oh, right. placement, time, um, and yeah, size. Um, B, any sign uh, within that uh, right of way, and it gives time, placement, size. Um, temporary signs on sidewalk, it was movable signs. It was more of a relocation of what was currently in the ordinance, and that is zoning district specific. It doesn't specify what is being said on the sign. So it is time, place, and manner also. Okay. So what is the, I guess what, because I'm looking at page number six, the justification, I think, for the, what you say is the, kind of the compromise position. And so what is the negative, I guess, implication or effect of just keeping the directional signs allowed in the right of way? That wouldn't be read compliant because we'd be focusing on a okay. content-based, speaker-based sign. Okay. That's just clearly wouldn't be read. It, that would not be compliant with the, the No, because we're favoring one type of speech over another, what it's saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a clear point Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Miller. So I have a lot of problems with this, and they're the same problems I've had all along. We currently have a sign ordinance, as, as staff has pointed out, that doesn't allow temporary signs in the right-of-way, except for some exceptions carved out for certain users for certain types of signs. Uh, and that's not read compliant. I mean, a, a total ban probably would be read compliant, but I don't think it's what <laughs> I think is right for Durham. We can be read compliant. Uh, I think it is important to be read compliant and right for Durham. And I believe that the speakers have demonstrated, even today, the sign ordinance is honored in the breach, especially when it comes to temporary signs in the right of way. Pancake suppers and uh, stop gun violence and all these things that Durham people do and, it, and house for sale with an arrow, all of these things are important part of the life of the community. Mr. Eden said uh, before he went home uh, that do we have a clutter prol proliferation problem now? I don't think we do, but I'm a guy who likes to use the public property to facilitate public speech. What Reed wants us to do is to not pick and choose among speakers or what people say. I'm willing to do that and not take the risk. In other words, what we've done there is, is we've now, we've got this period of time around elections when we're gonna allow all kinds of signs because practically people really wanna speak politically uh, at that time. And I think that that's read compliant. But I would like to open it up and say year round, we're going to allow temporary signs in the right of way. We're going to control where they can go, not all the right of way, not all the time. It's time, place, and manner. Manner is how big the sign is. Is it lighted? Is it movable? We can regulate that. We can say there can be intervals between signs. If there's one up here, then you can't put another one up and for, for a certain distance. We can do all of those things so that the things that even today under the current ordinance are not lawful, like the pancake jamboree, why can't the pancake jamboree be lawful? And I realize that if we let the pancake jamboree be lawful, then some crazy could put up a sign that says something that the community doesn't like. I'm not afraid of that. Our democracy is not that fragile. It is not that fragile. Time, place, and manner. So this is what I would like to do in, in with regard to temporary signs in the right of way, is have no distinction between commercial and non-commercial speech, although that actually is allowed under Reed. Uh, but Reed doesn't go into it. They just said, we're not disturbing the distinction that the Supreme Court has previously recognized between commercial and non-commercial speech. And that distinction actually is, is saying you can regulate commercial speech to a greater degree than non-commercial speech. But I don't see any point in going there when we're talking about temporary signs in the public right-of-way. 
I want a self-permitting process. We actually have a permitting process for certain types of signs, but I want a self-permitting process. I want one where we let people put up a sign, but the condition is, is you know, we're gonna regulate its size. It can't be bigger than a certain size. And of course we, we can set that, uh, that there'll be a, a duration. It can only be up for a certain amount of time. Um, I think there should be uh, that there's a risk that a single user uh, on a certain subject can't keep putting up the same thing over up, you know, take it down a day and then put it up a day later. You can't let, I think it is a legitimate government interest saying that we're not gonna let somebody hog the public resource. Um, just like we do with parking meters. Uh, you can't keep, it's actually against the rules to keep feeding the meter. Um, you gotta leave and then come back, give somebody else a shot. Um, I think that it's permissible under a self permitting process, and this is what I mean, is to say that on every sign that we allow in the public right of way, we require the poster to put their name and their address, their contact information, and the date the sign goes up so that we can regulate it. I think Reed allows that, that's not content. That's the same thing that we do with a, perm with a permitted sign, except for that we require them to submit a piece of paper that we keep in a file folder somewhere. Um, so here we're gonna put it on the sign so that the inspector can go look at the sign and say, oops, that one's up too long. If you do a permit process, then you can build into the ordinance that the poster says, okay, the city can take it down. Um, because permits are, are a little bit different than, than say on, on my own property where the, the city can't come and take it down. They can, they can start proceedings to make me take it down. Um, we can regulate like I said, which part of the right-of-way? We can distinguish between signs that are in the right-of-way in front of residential properties as opposed to the commercial right-of-way. The court dis clearly makes a distinction and recognizes that signs that are in proximity to residences are, can be interpreted as being associated with the owner of the residence. So I think that we can create an interval that says, if you're gonna put up your pancake jamboree or your stop gun violence sign in front of somebody's house, that it's, you can't do that, that it's gotta be a certain ways away so that the message won't necessarily be associated with the owner of that residence. We can do that. Um, and we can build into these things uh, about violations and what have you. We can finally have an ordinance that lets the community of Durham do what it wants to do without being in violation and that we can regulate it because we can regulate it sign by sign. And inspector, if we get, if we get a proliferation of signs in a certain location and it's, it gets to be a problem, somebody can go out and say, oops, this one's too old. Oops, this one is, is too big. We can do those things. But it, they can also say, oh, this, one, this one's complied with everything we required and it's got three more days. You can leave that one. We can finally actually have reasonable regulation realizing that it, I suppose it could be possible that you could get a perfect storm of a lot of people putting up a lot of messages and cluttering a location. And if that happens, then I suppose that we can get tougher. But I think like Mr. Eden said, if we're going to err in this, let's err in favor of public speech and let the people do what they do. Um, I mean, my own neighborhood association collects money at this time of year uh, for the Durham Urban Ministries. And we do that by posting signs because it's effective. We remind people this is the time to give. And we put the signs in the right of way and we're in violation. I've put up a whole bunch of them myself, I confess. <laughs> I violated the ordinance. But it shouldn't be a violation of the ordinance. Let's have, instead of having an ordinance that we honor by winking at the signs that we don't care of, I mean, we, we are now, we, we have for years, winked at the signs that we consider to be harmless. And I love a community that does that, but we don't have to, we don't have, to have selective enforcement system. We can have an ordinance that's real and that apportions out the, the right to put up signs reasonably and controls it, and we can see how it goes. I want to send this back like Mr. Busby does. I want the staff to consider this more open approach 
one that fixes not only the Reed problem, but the problem that existed before Reed, which is over-regulation of signs. Um, it doesn't make content distinctions, and if, it, and if it doesn't work, then I'll take the blame, but I do think that the Supreme Court in the time, place, manner restrictions that are allowed gives us a huge amount of leeway to address the problems incrementally as we experience them, not as we anticipate them. I need to recognize um, Sarah Young and then the uh, city's legal advisor. So I wanted to share a little bit of uh, a tidbit, a fun fact, if you will, about our zoning enforcement and the work they do in the realm of signs. Because I've heard it repeatedly said tonight that we don't have a sign clutter problem. And I will tell you that on average, zoning enforcement in one subdistrict, one of the three subdistricts alone, on average picks up 200 signs a week, sometimes upwards of 350 signs a week. That is somewhere between 10 and 12,000 signs a year that are picked up. That is why we don't have a sign clutter problem. But if I can well, respond to that, sure. well, let me respond to that is, if we had a system that allowed signs, we wouldn't have to pick them all up. Right now, we pick them all up because they're all in violation. Thank you. Don O'Toole, the city attorney's office. I just wanted to let the planning commission members know that when re the Reed decision was handed down in 2015, uh, we had immediately started discussions with the manager's office obviously the planning department and at city council work sessions. Um, so the manager's office and the council is fully aware of the direction that the um, proposed UDO changes are taking. I'll add, however, though, that um, pretty much everything that um, you said, Mr. Miller, is completely policy. So if city council decided to change the direction that this draft is moving in, that could certainly be done. Those are all policy issues. Um, as Sarah pointed out, we already do have a huge problem with illegal signs in the right of way in the city of Durham currently. And um, Mr. Miller, to the self-permitting idea, um, the planners and I discussed that back in 2015, develop a little sticker, have them readily available at DSC, fill out your name, phone number, date it's posted. Um, and that was discussed, um, but that would lead to pretty significant enforcement because planners would need to walk up to every sign, look at the sticker, um, figure out which signs were illegal. And that has been discussed with the, both the manager's office and council members. But obviously, again, that's a policy question. And if people want to uh, present that again, uh, that can be brought forward. Um, another point that I just want to raise that I don't think has been emphasized tonight, um, we are not shutting down non-commercial speech in the city of Durham. I think if you read the temporary sign provisions on private property, we there's no limitation. City of Durham residents can have as many non-commercial signs on their private property as they choose. And Durham residents like to do that. And um, so there's no limitation on those signs. So I don't think we're really silencing anyone. And while I'm sympathetic to charities who wanna put up signs in the right of way, um, even an organization like the Lions Club, the Rotary, whatever, if they put, that, that's commercial activity. They're saying, come buy our pancakes. And so if the city were to choose to allow those signs, that's commercial speech. We also would need to open up the right of way to all non-commercial speech at the same time. So those are, the, those are the issues that we've been trying to balance and weigh, and nothing's been said here tonight that hasn't been discussed internally. And I think the manager's office and the city council is well aware of these issues. And um, not to speak for staff, but I'm not sure how referring this back to staff at, at this point would be of any value. I think the real, um, the case needs to be made to council, and then if council wanted to direct staff to um, modify this draft, the planners would be happy to do that, consistent with their direction. Thank you. Yeah. 
one other comment because it's uh, not I wanted a motion. I was I was going to say that, that input is helpful. I don't see any need for us to move to postpone this vote That's and to right. continue this. I think it's time for us to just have a motion and vote this evening and send it forward. I will entertain a motion at oh, this time. Uh, comment. Comment. Quick yes. one. I I, I want to. I appreciate Commissioner Miller's comments, and I, I second those, and I'll be voting against this and sending a message to council that I'd like to go in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I would move that we send case uh, TC170002 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Does it go to does the does does it go to both governing bodies? Yes, it does. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Did I get a second? Yes, yes second. Okay. Then motion by Commissioner um, Busby and second by Commissioner Al Turk that we send item TC one seven zero 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 two signs forward to the city council and the board of county commissioners with a favorable recommendation. May we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Morgan? No. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Alturk? No. Commissioner Busby? No. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. Commissioner McIver? Yes. And motion fell 7 5. Pardon me? Fell 7 5. What was, I'm sorry? 7 5. 5 7. Five, seven. Sorry about seven. that. 7 5, yes. Uh, no. No. It seven, passed. Seven. Hmm? It, failed. it failed. It failed 7 that's right. 5. That's 5 7. I mean 5 7, excuse me. Five, you're right. It's late. 5 7. Thank <laughs> you, Mr. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Well, I just, don't hear very well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can I bring us the rest of the <sighs> That's a good one. Do we have any steps? Any comments from staff? Are there any additional comments from staff before we wrap up? If not. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone that came, was able to attend the retreat, and uh, we'll it was we are good, looking at scheduling a follow up soon, so be on the lookout for that. Thank Very you. good. Thank, thank you so much. What's January like? Heavy or light? Um, pretty light right now. Two good. zonings and maybe one text amendment. Keep it light when we come back. Motion to adjourn. To. <laughs> thank you all. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you for your note. Yeah.